Pakistan, a hard country by Anatole Levin. Presented by the Learner's Library. Contents. Part 3, The Provinces. Chapter 7, Punjab. Chapter 8, Sindh. Chapter 9, Balakistan. Chapter 10, The Patans. Part 3. The Provinces 7. Punjab. Lahore, the ancient whore, the handmaiden of dimly remembered Hindu kings, the courtesan of Mughal emperors, bedecked and bejeweled, savaged by marauding hordes. Healed by the caressing hands of successive lovers. A little shoddy, as Kasim saw her, like an attractive but aging concubine, ready to bestow surprising delights on those who cared to court her, proudly displaying royal gifts. Bapsi Sidwa Pakistan's Provincial Balance Unlike India, Pakistan has one province, Punjab, which with almost 56% of the population can to a certain extent dominate the country. No Indian province comes anywhere near this in terms of relative weight, though if all the Hindi-speaking states worked together as a bloc they would approach Punjab's weight in Pakistan. Punjab also provides most of the army, and without Punjabi support no military government of Pakistan would be possible. Yet at the same time, whatever the other ethnicities may sometimes allege, Punjab is not nearly strong or united enough to create a real, Punjabi Raj over the whole country, an effective, permanent national regime based on Punjabi identity. Pakistan is in this, as in other ways, more like India than immediately appears. India is held together as a democracy, or at least a constitutional system since Indian administration often does not work in ways that the West thinks of as e-democratic, in large part precisely because it is so big and varied. Many years ago, I asked an Indian general if he and his colleagues ever thought of creating a military dictatorship, as in Pakistan. We're not that stupid, he replied. Democracy in India is a damned mess but it gives the system the flexibility it needs to survive. It means that rebels who can't be killed can always be bought. Off by being elected to government, and given jobs and favors for their relatives. This country is so big and so varied and so naturally chaotic, if you tried to introduce an efficient dictatorship in India it would actually destroy India within a year. If you emphasize the word efficient, and add the word Punjabi, then the same is true of Pakistan. No national government can simply crush the warlike, heavily armed Patans. All have preferred instead to co-opt them through service in the army and bureaucracy, and into government through elections. The Patan territories of the Northwest Frontier Province, NWFP, and the federally administered tribal areas, FATA, have always been administered overwhelmingly by ethnic Patan officials. Nor can any Punjab-based regime dream of ruling over the megalopolis of Karachi, with all its rival ethnicities, by simple dictatorial means. There too, co-option and compromise are essential. So while Pakistan's Punjabi core makes it different from India, and more susceptible to dictatorship. It is like enough to India to make sure that its dictatorships can't work in an effectively dictatorial manner. So the balance between the provinces also forms part of what I have called Pakistan's negotiated state. There is a real element of Punjabi dominance, but fear of breaking up the country on which Punjab itself depends means that this dominance always has to be veiled and qualified by compromises with the other provinces. Thus in 2009, 10, in a considerable achievement for Pakistani democracy and the PPP government, the center and the provinces agreed on a new national finance award rebalancing revenue allocation in favor of the poorer and more thinly populated provinces. Punjab, 
with some 56% of the population and around 65% of the revenue generation, was allocated 51.74% of revenue. Sometimes, however, these compromises are damaging not only to Punjab's interests but to those of Pakistan as a whole. For example, it is absolutely essential for Pakistan to develop greater, more reliable and more ecologically responsible sources of electricity. It is now more than 50 years since the idea of a great hydroelectric dam at Kalabag on the Indus was first mooted. The site is eminently suitable as far as hydroelectricity is concerned, yet for that entire half-century the project has been stymied by opposition from the NWFP and Sindh, which fear that they would lose water to Punjabi industry. And that has continued to be the case through no fewer than three periods of military rule, the project decried by provincial nationalists as expressions of Punjabi dominance. More than 10 years after immense coal reserves were discovered beneath the Thar Desert in Sindh, as of 2009 plans to develop them were still in limbo because of disagreements between the Sindh and federal governments, and because the federal government was both unwilling and constitutionally unable to impose its will on Sindh, for fear of splitting the Pakistan People's Party and creating a new surge of Sindhi nationalism. But this was not only a problem of civilian rule. Musharraf in his nine years in government also failed to push through this project. In this way, Pakistan's delicate ethnic balance, and the endless negotiations it entails, contribute to the sluggish pace of Pakistan's development. On the other hand, the maintenance of this balance has helped ensure that with the exception of some of the Baloch, who think that they would do well on the strength of their gas and mineral reserves. Very few political or intellectual groups in Pakistan and Pakistan's provinces actually want to break the country up, whether because they are genuinely attached to it, in the army, the bureaucracy and much of the Punjab, because they hope to take it over and use it as a base for a wider program, the Islamists, because they are afraid of Indian domination, Punjabis, because they are afraid that Pakistan's breakup would lead to a dreadful civil war with other ethnicities, the Sindhis and Mohajars, and even the Patans, since the Hindko speaking minority in the NWFP is strongly opposed to Patan nationalism, or simply because the alternative looks so much worse, the Patans, when they look across the border into Afghanistan. So one of the biggest factors holding Pakistan together is fear. However, it isn't the only factor by any manner of means. The different ethnic groups of Pakistan are often very intermingled, to the point where the standard definitions of ethnicities or nationalities within Pakistan sometimes seem almost as artificial as Pakistan itself. Thus Sindhis, Patans and Baloch complain frequently of Punjabi domination, especially under military rule, yet the army, or at least the other ranks, have until recently not represented Punjab at all, but rather the Potwar Plateau, half a dozen districts in the northwest of Punjab, bordering on the northwest frontier province, the same area from where the British recruited their soldiers. Some other parts of Punjab have been almost as poorly represented in the military as Sindh. For that matter, Punjab, Sindh and Balakistan are in their way also artificial. It is a mistake to see them as Czechs, Hungarians or Poles under Habsburg rule, increasingly self-conscious nations with an earlier history of nationhood, which with the collapse of the empire easily formed national states. Linguists dispute how many different dialects of Punjabi there are, but certainly Saraiki, in the southern third of Punjab, could just as well be a language in its own right. The Baloch for their part, while having some kind of ethnic unity with a common tribal code, are divided into two completely different languages, one of them descended from the Dravidian of southern India presumed to be the language of the Indus Valley civilization 4,000 years ago. 
and linguistic divisions are not the most important ones. Particular religious allegiance counts for as much, still more do endless combinations of family, clan, and lineage. Like the Sayyids, these often trace their ancestry back to somewhere else, whether in legend or fact. Even where the Rajputs came from originally is not known. As the 18th century Indian Muslim reformist theologian Shah Waliullah stated proudly of his Sayyid ancestry, I hail from a foreign country. My forebears came to India as immigrants. I am proud of my Arab origin and my knowledge of Arabic, for both of these bring a person close to the master of the ancients and moderns, the most excellent of the prophets sent by God, and the pride of all creation. In gratitude for this great favor I ought to conform to the habits and customs of the early Arabs and the Prophet as much as I can, and abstain from the customs of the Turks and the habits of the Indians. As far as personal pride and identity are concerned, to be a Sayyid usually comprehensively trumps being a Punjabi or a Sindhi. Many of the great landowning families of Sindh and southern Punjab are the descendants of Baloch tribesmen who conquered the local peasantry centuries ago, still speak Baloch at home, and owe allegiance to saints whose following is as widely spread as the Baloch tribal migrations which shaped these local societies. As for the Patans, as will be described in Chapter 10, though they have a very strong ethnic identity, their deep and rivalrous tribal allegiances and their division between Pakistan and Afghanistan mean that they have never been able to turn this into a strong modern nationalism, something in which they resemble certain other tribal ethnicities such as the Somalis. Finally, Karachi, the country's greatest city, is itself a major source of unity, since it includes not only indigenous Sindhis and Mohajars from India, but also huge populations of Punjabis and Patans. In fact, Karachi is the third largest Patan city after Kabul and Peshawar, and probably the fourth or fifth largest Punjabi city. More Baloch may live in Karachi than live in Balakistan. These different populations in Karachi often loathe each other, but they also depend on the city for their livelihoods, and they're more responsible, or self-interested. Leaders and the businessmen who fund them do not want to destroy those livelihoods for the sake of nationalist dreams. In Europe, the USA and Japan during the 19th century it was above all the modern state education system that deliberately created a sense of nationhood among the ordinary people of these countries, most of whom had previously had little sense of belonging to any identity beyond their village, region local religious allegiance and kinship group. In Pakistan, state education barely reaches most of the population. And education in the religious schools or madrasas obviously influences people more to a sense of being part of the universal Muslim world community or Uma, than to a sense of being Pakistanis, just as the church schools of medieval Europe were designed to turn boys into Catholics not into Germans or French. But then none of the different bits of Pakistan's education system is designed to make children into Sindhis or Punjabis either. So it would probably be wrong to see Pakistan as necessarily following a classical Western course in this matter, or to assume that because Pakistan's national identity is weak, other, inherently stronger identities are waiting in the wings to break the country up. Rather, therefore, than an early disintegration, the greatest threat would once again seem to be that long-term ecological degradation, especially in the area of water resources, will over time so increase tensions between different regions, and so reduce the ability of the regional elites to contain these tensions, that national government becomes unworkable. By this stage the situation may have become so bad that effective provincial government will also be unworkable. Different Punjabs In the case of Punjab, 
not only the great majority of the Punjabi establishment, but a great many ordinary Punjabis identify their provincial identity with that of Pakistan as a whole. And this identification is one of the things which makes writing about Punjabi identity and Punjabi attitudes to Pakistan so difficult. Apart from the fact that there are simply so many more Punjabis than others, and of more varied kinds, the identities of most of Pakistan's other nationalities are to a considerable extent shaped by their differences with the Punjabis, except for the Mohajars, and their ambiguous relationship with the Pakistani state. Many Punjabis, by contrast, believe that they are the state, and if they define themselves against anybody else, it is against India. An advisor to Chief Minister Shabazz Sharif with whom I spoke in January 2009 was unabashed in his declaration that, if anything is ever to get done in Pakistan, Punjab has to take the lead. We determine the direction of Pakistan. As a senior official, of Mohajar origin, remarked sourly, the difficulty about writing on Punjab as a province is that they think and behave as if they are the whole damn country. This Punjabi commitment to Pakistani nationalism has profoundly shaped Pakistan, and is indeed responsible for Pakistan's survival as a state. And the overthrow of that state can never happen in peripheral areas such as Waziristan, Balakistan, or even Karachi. It would have to happen in Punjab. One sign of Punjabi commitment to Pakistan, to the point in some cases almost of submersion in Pakistan, is that, in sharp contrast both to the other Pakistani provinces and to Indian Punjab, Pakistani Punjab has not been committed to the development of Punjabi as a provincial language. Instead, successive state governments have promoted the national language, Urdu, as the language of education and administration throughout Punjab. Urdu is also far more prevalent in society. Whereas Sindhis and Patans almost always speak Sindhi and Pashto among themselves, educated Punjabis usually speak Urdu with each other, when they are not speaking English. Sir Muhammad Iqbal, the great Urdu poet, philosopher and prophet of Indian Muslim nationhood, came from Sialkot in western Punjab. Pakistan's two greatest writers, Fuiz Ahmed Fuiz and Sadat Hassan Manto, were both Punjabis, albeit in Manto's case from a Kashmiri family, but both wrote mainly in Urdu. Punjab's finest writer of the present day, Denial Muanuddin, writes in English. So while Punjabi dialects continue to be spoken at home and there is a rich and living folklore in Punjabi, almost all public life is conducted in Urdu or English. The spread of Urdu is also encouraged by Pakistani television, by the Pakistani cinema, Lollywood, because based in Lahore, and indeed by the passionately beloved Indian cinema from Bollywood, which uses Hindi. And despite assiduous nationalist efforts in both India and Pakistan to change the languages, spoken Hindi and Urdu remain basically the same language. Much older influences than Pakistani nationalism are also at work here. Although quite distant from the Urdu-speaking heartland of the old Mughal Empire, Punjab was still far more culturally affected by it than were Sindh or the Pathan areas. Equally importantly, Punjabi is not in fact the language of large parts of Punjab, or even of most of it, depending on how you define Punjabi. According to a traditional Punjabi statement, language changes every 15 miles, just as it did in Europe until the rise of modern mass education and entertainment in the 19th century. So, Punjabi is itself broken up into numerous dialects. Meanwhile, people in most of the southern third of Punjab, from Multan down to the Sindh border, speak a completely different language, Saraiki which while related to Punjabi is closer in some respects to Sindhi. A movement for a separate Saraiki-speaking province has existed for many years, but has never got anywhere much. 
One reason for this is the entrenched opposition of the Punjab establishment, backed by the fear of national governments in Islamabad of the appalling can of worms which such a move might open. A new Mohajir demand for a separate province of Karachi leading to fresh Mohajir, Sindhi violence, for starters. Probably even more important is the fact that the Saraiki speaking area also contains numerous other dialects, or languages, like Haryani, which might be part of Punjabi, Saraiki, Urdu, Sindhi, all or none of them. Until 1955, much of southern Punjab was covered by the former autonomous princely state of Bawalwalpur, many of whose inhabitants continue proudly to claim their own special identity, and even that they speak their own language separate from Saraiki. Other identities also cut across the Punjabi, Saraiki divide, these include religious affiliation, whether of the different Sunni sects, Shurism or the following of a particular saint, and wider kinship group, Jat, Rajput, etc. Many Saraiki speakers are in fact by origin from Baloch tribes. How for example is one to define former President Sardar Farooq Khan Lagari in terms of identity? Is he a Punjabi, the province where his clan holds its land, a Saraiki, by language, a Baloch, by ethnic descent and tribal identification? a Punjabi-speaking Pathan, by marriage, a Pakistani. Having worked as a Pakistani official, spent most of his life in national politics and ended as President of Pakistan. Or, at bottom and perhaps most importantly of all, hereditary chieftain of his branch of the Ligari tribe? So, Punjab, contains numerous overlapping identities, in a way that helps heavily to qualify Punjabi dominance over Pakistan as a whole. Lahore, the historic capital. For a land which cradled one of the very first human urban civilizations, Pakistan is remarkably lacking in historic cities, and even those that do exist often have few historic monuments. What war has spared, the rivers have often destroyed either by washing away cities or by changing course and leaving them isolated and waterless. The great exception is Lahore, ancient capital of Punjab. The old city of Lahore contains one of the greatest Mughal mosques, and one of their greatest forts, as well as a host of lesser monuments, including the tombs of both Sultan Qutbuddin Din Ibak, died 1210 CE, founder of the Muslim, slave dynasty, which ruled from Delhi, and of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Lahore also contains some of the greatest monuments of British rule in the former Indian Empire. In fact, Lahore looks and feels much more like the capital of a major state than does Islamabad, and in the view of Pakistan's non-Punjabi ethnicities Lahore also often behaves that way. It is some ten times the size of Islamabad, and Pakistan's largest city by far after Karachi. Just as the province of Punjab is home to almost 56% of Pakistan's population, more than 100 million people, and forms its industrial, agricultural and military core. Punjabis on average are considerably richer than the inhabitants of the other provinces, though, as will be seen, with huge regional variations within Punjab. In Sindh, Balakistan, and the NWFP, more than half the population is listed as being below the poverty line. In Punjab, the figure is around one quarter. If Pakistan is to be broken from within by Islamist revolt, then it is in Punjab that this would have to happen, not among the Pathans of the frontier, for Pakistan is the heart, stomach, and backbone of Pakistan. Indeed, in the view of many of its inhabitants, it is Pakistan. As described in Chapter 6, the old Punjab elites, themselves often not so old, having been in many cases the product of British land grants, have been greatly changed in recent decades by the entry of very large numbers of new men into their ranks. However, these new families have frequently intermarried with old families from the same castes 
and some of those old families also retain considerable wealth and, more importantly, great local power through the leadership of their clans and kinship networks, or the inheritance of shrines and religious prestige. This can give Punjabi politics a united and clannish air, and covering Punjabi elections in the company of well-born and well-connected Punjabi journalists can be a bit like attending a family party, albeit a pretty quarrelsome one. Will Booby or Janu get the family seat this time, do you think? Will Buntai get a ministry at last? And isn't it so sad about Pufi auntie's marriage? The participants and household members do not even necessarily have to be human. During my last visit, I listened as a great Punjabi aristocratic and political lady conducted an impassioned phone conversation about Punjab politics. I was increasingly bewildered by the fact that not only did the conversation keep switching between English and Urdu, but an increasing number of horses seemed to be wandering into it along with the name of the chief minister and other leading Punjabi politicians. When my hostess got off the phone, I asked her if she was planning to make one of her horses chief minister. That would be an excellent idea, she laughed, but no, the conversation had been about something much more important, the composition of the board of the Lahore race course. At its worst, which is admittedly much of the time, Lahore High Society is all too close to the diary of a social butterfly. The weekly satirical column by Moni Mosin in the Friday Times, which she has put together in a book of the same name. Though brilliantly funny, this column is in a way quite unnecessary, because the picture of this society which appears on the society pages of the Friday Times and its sister publications is in fact, beyond parody. For the absolute epitome, the non plus ultra of this set, in Karachi as well as Lahore, readers might want to buy a book of portraits of society figures by the society and fashion photographer Tapu Javari, entitled, in pretentiously lower case, I Voyeur, going places with haute noblesse, and decorated with captions to portraits like, on the sperm of the moment. This is the hard-partying world portrayed in Mohsin Ali's brilliant, grim novel Moth Smoke. However, at its best, there is also in Lahore a mixture of elegance and intelligence which could make it one of the great cities of the world, if they could only fix the roads, the drains, the public transport, the pollution, the housing of most of the population, the electricity supply, the police. The Lahore Museum, with its magnificent Buddhist and Mughal works of art, is the only museum in Pakistan of international stature and casts the rather sad Pakistani National Museum in Karachi into the shade. This was the Wonder House of Kipling's Kim, which famously begins with Kim perched on the great cannon, Zam Zama, in the road outside the museum, of which Kipling's father was the curator. Kipling worked for a Lahore newspaper, and some of his finest stories are set in Lahore, as are those of many of Pakistan's greatest writers and poets. Lahore is a city of the imagination, in a way that bureaucratic Islamabad and Daur, impoverished Peshwar cannot be, and Karachi has not yet had the time to become, though writers like Camilla Shamsi are working on it. The Lahore University of Management Sciences, LUMS, is in parts at least the best university not only in Pakistan, but in South Asia. Most unusually for Pakistan, which as a society exemplifies the principle of private affluence and public squalor. Lahore, although it contains some fairly awful slums, also has some fine public gardens, though admittedly ones bequeathed by the Mughals in the case of the Shalimar Gardens, and the British in the case of the Lawrence Gardens, now Jinnabog. Strolling through the Jinnabog in September 2008 on my way from breakfast with friends in a stylish and charming cafe called Coffee Tea and Company, to visit a modern art gallery, past uniformed schoolchildren, girls in brightly colored shellwear camises like parrots tossing balls to each other, and neatly dressed middle-class couples, 
I reflected on the idiocy of portraying Pakistan as a failed state. It was hardly a scene reminiscent of Grozny or Mogadishu. The contrast was all the greater with Peshwar, which I had just left, and where the sense of threat from the Pakistani tailban was palpable. Indeed, it was sometimes difficult to remember that Peshwar and Lahore were in the same country. I remember my shock, and then amusement at my shock, on seeing what I first took to be a faddish Patan boy in a Patan cap and jeans on the back of a motorcycle in Lahore, only to realize that it was in fact a girl, which in Peshwar would be a truly dangerous combination, and in other Patan areas a potentially fatal one. Then again, you could say that my reflections on the success and stability of Lahore were only the result of my becoming Lahorized, or perhaps Lahorified, to rhyme with glorified, because this is very much the way that the Lahore elites feel, and for many years it led them into a very dangerous complacency vis-a-vis -vis the militant threat. With the exception of some journalists, most of my Lahore elite friends did indeed treat developments in the Patan areas as if they were happening in a different country a eh? long way off. This was still apparent even in January 2009, despite serious terrorist attacks in Islamabad and Rawalpindi. By July 2009, however, this complacency had been shattered by major attacks in Lahore itself on the Sri Lankan cricket team and the police academy. Many more have followed. However, as this book has been at pains to point out, terrorism and insurgency are two very different things. Terrorist attacks can do great damage to Pakistan, but to overthrow the state would require an immense spread of the rebellions which broke out in some of the Patan areas, between 2001 and 2009. Above all, to seize power in Pakistan, Islamist militancy would have to seize Lahore. During my visits to Lahore in 2007, 2009, I was deeply worried by the lack of support among the mass of the population for tough action against the Pakistani tail ban. Even in July 2009, by which time opinion in the elites had shifted very significantly. On the other hand, I could not find much significant support on the streets for the Taliban's actual program of Islamist revolution. Even among the poor and the lower middle classes, the social heartland of Islamist radicalism in Punjab. In January 2009, during the holiday which marks the festival of Moharram, I strolled across the park surrounding the Minari Pakistan, the monument to Pakistan's independence next to the old city mingling with the crowds and talking to people of different classes, from rickshaw drivers to members of the middle classes, but excluding the elite, about their views of their government, the economic situation, the Pakistani tail ban, the war in Afghanistan and anything else that they wanted to talk to me about. This was a time when anti-Western feeling in Pakistan was running even higher than usual, owing to the Israeli attack on Gaza, and, as I have remarked elsewhere in this book, while it is difficult enough to argue with anti-Western Pakistanis when they are in the wrong, it is even more difficult to do so when they are in the right. So as might have been expected, I came in for a great deal of impassioned and radical-sounding rhetoric. Support for a military offensive against the Pakistani Taliban was extremely weak and sympathy for the Afghan Taliban's fight against the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan was universal. Habib, an old scooter driver, declared to murmurs of approval from the other drivers that the military should stop fighting against the Taliban in Swat and Bajur. We are all Muslims after all. The Taliban are just trying to spread real Islam and bring peace and justice and I don't know why the army is trying to stop them. All over the world Muslims are under attack from the Jews and Americans, in Palestine, Afghanistan, everywhere. The Taliban are right to fight them. Every single person I spoke with opposed Pakistani help to America in Afghanistan. 
Isker, an educated, English-speaking youth in a baseball cap, declared, to the applause of his friends. We have two opinions in our society, the government, which is for America, and the people, who are against America. How can any Muslim support U.S. policies when they are helping Israel kill innocent Muslims? That is why the Taliban are carrying out terrorism in Pakistan, because of this gap between the government and the people. So we all think that the government should negotiate with the Taliban to end this conflict. That said, a couple of serious qualifications need to be entered. The first is that in the great majority of cases people only started talking about the tail ban, and the fight against them when I mentioned these themes, this was one thing which had changed by July, when Lahore had already come in for terrorist attacks. If I only asked what they were most concerned about, the overwhelming majority started talking about inflation and jobs. The other thing worth pointing out is that at no stage in the course of that morning did I feel the slightest concern for my own safety, except from the cricket balls, which were whizzing in all directions from the dozens of informal and anarchical cricket matches that were going on, and that clearly interested most of the young men present far more than my questions. Even when one group of kids started chanting tailband slogans, there was an air of clowning for the camera about the proceedings, and the chanting was accompanied by an offer of a soft drink, because you are our guest and it is so dusty here. By contrast, in a crowd like that in some of the Patan areas, I would have had real reason to worry that I might have been beheaded and my head used as the ball. If there is no revolutionary mood among the masses in the heartland of Punjab, Revolution also seems highly unlikely in the face of the power of Punjab's entwined landowning, business, military and bureaucratic elites, and the deep traditionalism of most of the population. Nevertheless, Punjab has also long been home to very strong strains of Islamic revivalism. The headquarters of the Tablighi Jamat, the world's greatest Muslim preaching organization, is in Rai Wind. 20 miles to the southwest of Lahore. The Tablai have always stressed their peaceful and apolitical nature, but 10 miles to the northwest of Lahore is Murig, the headquarters of the Jamat Ud Dawa, mother organization to the Lushkari Taiba, which played a leading role in the jihad against India in Kashmir, and carried out the November 2008 terrorist attacks on Mumbai. For reasons that have deep roots in history, militant groups, and especially let slash Judd, do have widespread support in Punjab, at least when they attack the Indians in Kashmir or the West in Afghanistan. Their popularity has been one factor in discouraging the Pakistani state from attacking them in turn, lest they join with the Pakistani tail ban. From 2008 on, some of these groups did just that, and started to launch terrorist attacks in the very heart of Pakistan. These attacks are unlikely to destroy the Pakistani state, but they can do terrible damage, and perhaps force the state either to compromise with the militants, or to adopt ferocious measures of repression in order to crush them. Punjabi History and the Impact of Migration Punjab is Panjab, the land of the five rivers, the Indus, and its four great tributaries, the Chenab, Ravi, Sutlej and Bias. As its name suggests, the northern parts of the province at least have a degree of geographic and historical unity, reflected in the Punjabi language. The southern parts of Punjab were converted to Islam, beginning more than 1,000 years ago, largely by Sufi preachers. Thereafter the region was usually ruled by Muslim rulers based elsewhere, mostly in Delhi, but sometimes in Afghanistan or even Persia. The only Punjabi state to rule over the whole of Punjab was that of the Sikhs, a radical movement within Hinduism that, although heavily influenced by both Islamic monotheism and local Muslim Sufi traditions, arose in reaction against Muslim rule in the late 16th century. 
In the course of the 18th century, the Sikhs conquered more and more of Punjab from the decaying Mughal Empire, and under their greatest ruler, Ranjit Singh, ruled 1801-1839, united the whole of Punjab, including Multan to the south, in one state. However, some 60% of Ranjit Singh's subjects were Muslims. After Ranjit Singh's death, the British conquered Punjab in two wars in the 1840s. These saw some of the hardest-fought battles the British ever had to undertake in India, yet, by a curious paradox, the Punjab was to become the heartland of British military recruitment in the Indian Empire, with results for the state and society that have profoundly shaped the whole of Pakistan to this day and provide some of the foundations for military power in Pakistan. As related in Chapter 5 on the military, the British created a powerful synthesis of modern Western military organization with local traditions, and underpinned this with a system of land grants to reward loyal soldiers and recruiters. The British military system was entwined with the vast irrigation projects started in central Punjab by the British, the new canal colonies, in what had formerly been wasteland, were intended not only greatly to increase food production, which they did, but to provide both men and horses to the British Indian Army. The development of electoral politics from the 1880s led to political mobilization along religious lines. There were periodic explosions of communal violence such as the riots in Rawalpindi in 1926 over the building of a cinema next to a mosque. However, British patronage, common agrarian interests and fear of communal violence meant that until the very last years of British rule, Punjab politics was dominated by the Unionist Party, which brought together Muslim, Hindu and Sikh landowners and their rural followers. As independence approached in 1945-7, the Unionists collapsed under the triple blows of Muslim League agitation for Pakistan, Sikh agitation for a Sikh-dominated province or even independent state, something that was to resurface in the Sikh extremist rebellion against India in the 1980s and the refusal of Jawaharlal Nehru and the Indian National Congress to accept a confederal India with a semi-independent position for Punjab. Exacerbated by the haste of the British withdrawal, and some perverse decisions by the Radcliffe Boundary Commission, the result was the appalling bloodletting that gripped the province after March 1947, and resulted in a crescendo of violence in the weeks following independence and partition in August. In the resulting massacres on both sides, between 200,000 and 1 million people lost their lives in Punjab and Bengal. Modern scholarship tends to support the lower figure, and more than 7.5 million Punjabis became refugees. The human cost is commemorated in innumerable memoirs and writings, including the greatest piece of fiction yet to come from Pakistan, Toba Tek Singh by Sadat Hassan Manto. Lahore which had been in the middle of the northern belt of Sikh and British Punjab, was left almost on the Indian frontier, something which has contributed to its inhabitants' obsession with the Indian threat. In the 1965 war the Indians came close to capturing the city. The ethnic impact of the migration from India on Pakistani Punjab was far less than on Sindh where the migrants came from completely different parts of the British Indian Empire, in Punjab, refugees were settled among fellow Punjabis. The scale of the movement however was immense. Out of the more than 7.25 million people who moved from India to Pakistan, 5.28 million moved from East, Indian, to West, Pakistani, Punjab. After 1947, these refugees made up just over 25% of the population of Pakistani Punjab, one of the highest proportions of refugees in an area in recorded history. This forced migration built on already existing Punjabi traditions of peaceful economic migration to develop new land and new businesses, 
which already under the British had taken hundreds of thousands of Punjabis to settle in the new canal colonies of Sindh, which were created in the 1930s, two generations after those of Punjab, and to work as shopkeepers and artisans in Balakistan. From the 1950s on, these traditions took hundreds of thousands more to the terraced houses of Leeds, Leicester and Oxford. The East Punjabi refugees of 1947 brought two things with them to their new homes in West Punjab, mostly homes and lands abandoned by fleeing Hindus and Sikhs. The first was relative economic and social dynamism created by the shock to their old settled ways. Because they moved to another part of the same province, and en masse as whole village communities, the element of disruption was less than in the case of the Mohajers in Sindh. Nonetheless, the experience of being uprooted, and the consequent undermining of the old landowning elites, meant that the Punjabi migrants also were to some extent shaken out of their old patterns. Those who were unable to find land in the countryside settled in the cities, entering new trades and professions. This strengthened the element of independence and egalitarianism already present in some of the northern Punjabi castes. Especially the Jats, who like to say of themselves, the Jats bow the knee only to themselves and God. The other thing that the refugees naturally contributed was a particularly intense hatred and fear of India, which remains far stronger in Punjab than in Sindh or the NWFP, just as on the other side of the new border, Hindu refugees from West Punjab came to play an especially important role in anti-Muslim politics. This fear has helped strengthen the refugees' identification with Pakistan, and therefore that of Punjab as a whole. Of the educated Punjabi migrants, a high proportion joined the officer corps. They played a particularly prominent role under General Zia ul Haq, himself from Jullander in East Punjab, like his ISI commander, General Akhtar Rayman. A majority of the leadership of the violently anti Shia Saipa e Sahaba Islamist militant group now allied in revolt with the Pakistani Taliban, have also been from East Punjab. The refugees therefore played a vital role in creating what Abida Hussein has called, with some exaggeration, Pakistan's Prussian Bible Belt, that is to say, the combination of tendencies towards economic dynamism, social mobility, militarist nationalism and Islamist chauvinism to be found in northern and central Punjab. These tendencies, and the overall impact of the refugees, have been qualified however by much older traditions in Punjab, a mixture exemplified by the city of Lahore. As noted, the headquarters of Islamist radical groups are close to the city. The main headquarters of the Jamat Islami party, Mansura, is in one of Lahore's suburbs. Yet Lahore also contains numerous shrines of saints, including one of the greatest not only in Pakistan but in South Asia, Data Ganj Baksh, the object of a Taliban terrorist attack on July 1, 2010. Data Ganj Baksh, original name Abul Hassan Ali Hajari, was an 11th-century Sufi preacher from Ghazni in Afghanistan who played a key part in converting people in northern Punjab to Islam. His shrine became famous for miracles, and for many centuries he has been the most beloved of Lahore's many saints. He is our very own link with God, I was told by Mukhtar, a worshipper at the shrine from Mayanwali in western Punjab near the border with the NWFP. However, the shrine now looks much less like an ancient inner-city shrine than it did when I first visited it in the 1980s. Then, like most old shrines, it was surrounded by houses, and you approached its gate through a narrow crowded lane. The buildings of the mosque dated back to Mughal times and were far too small for all the worshippers. From Lahore's immensely expanded population. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, therefore, when Nawaz Sharif was chief minister of Punjab, he rebuilt the shrine at immense cost, 
including the creation of a strikingly modernist mosque by a Turkish architect, an underground parking lot, and a huge forecourt on the edge of a main road, to create which several streets of houses had to be bought up and demolished. This says something very interesting about overlapping Punjabi identities and the relationship between religion and politics. Like many traditional Punjabi commercial families, the Sharifs are by origin Kashmiris who moved to Punjab centuries ago. In 1947, they migrated from East Punjab to Lahore, where Nawaz Sharif was born in 1949. Partly from older family tradition, and partly perhaps because of the impact of migration, Nawaz Sharif's father joined the Ali Hadith, a religious tradition with strong Wahhabi leanings. This is an affiliation which later strengthened, and was strengthened by, Sharif ties to Saudi Arabia, where Nawaz Sharif's father went into business after Z. A. Butto nationalized his industries in the 1970s, and where Nawaz took refuge after being overthrown by Musharraf. Nawaz Sharif therefore has been widely suspected of sympathies with radical Islamist theology. However, presumably in order to consolidate their position in their new home, Lahore. Nawaz Sharif's family married him to a girl from a leading Kashmiri family of Lahore's old city. In a reflection of this old city culture, Kulsum Sharif is the niece of Bolu Palewan, an Indian wrestling champion before partition. Like most of the old Kashmiri families of Lahore, her family are by tradition Barelvi Sunnis, and followers of Lahore's saints and especially of Data Ganj Baksh. In a sign of the way that allegiance to the saints often cuts across sectarian divides, she named their two sons Hassan and Hussein, the two greatest names of the Shia tradition. It may be assumed, therefore, that Mrs. Sharif and her family had some impact on Nawaz Sharif's decision to spend a fortune, admittedly of state money, rebuilding the shrine of Data Ganj Baksh. A political calculation was also no doubt involved, the desire to increase Muslim League support among the saints' followers in Lahore and elsewhere. In an amusing example of jumping on the bandwagon, or possibly Mr. Sharif trying to kill two birds with one stone, followers of another, modern Lahori Sufi saint, mentioned in Chapter 4, Hafiz Iqbal claimed that their saint was actually responsible because he appeared to Mr. Sharif in a dream, and told him to help his brother Data Ganj Baksh. Whether this story was initiated by Hafiz Iqbal's followers in order to appeal to the Sharifs, or the Sharifs in order to appeal to Hafiz Iqbal's followers, I cannot say, nor of course would I wish for one moment to discount the idea that saints could in principle appear to Mr. Sharif. The point however is that religion and politics are deeply intertwined in Lahore, but in ways that often cut clean across what at first sight are people's formal religious affiliations. Another famous example of a Punjabi, and especially Lahori, tradition that spans religious divides is that of the Basant festival, from the Sanskrit word for spring, which takes place in February. This Hindu festival is supposed to have been incorporated into popular Muslim practice by medieval Sufi saints. It is celebrated in Lahore and elsewhere in Punjab by the flying of a multitude of brightly colored kites. In consequence, Basant is naturally hated by the Puritan reformers of the Deobundi and Wahhabi traditions. However, Official moves in recent years to restrict the celebration of Basant have been mainly due to a different, rather depressing cause, namely, the tradition of coating the strings of kites with ground glass, so as to cut the strings of rival kites. Every year, a number of people, especially children, are killed or injured when cut strings fall back to earth, or when they bring down electricity wires. Punjab's Regions Geographically and economically, one can divide Punjab into three main regions, though blurring together at the edges and with numerous subdivisions within them. The first, north-central Punjab, contains Lahore, 
the old agricultural areas along the rivers, and most of the new canal colonies created by the British. It has Punjabs, and Pakistan's, most productive agriculture, which also benefited more than any other area of Pakistan from the Green Revolution. In the first half of the 1960s, agricultural growth in the main canal colony districts of Faisalabad, Multan and Montgomery, Sahawal, increased by 8.9% a year, and these three districts alone came to account for almost half of Punjab's entire agricultural production. Although water shortages today pose a growing and possibly even existential threat to Pakistan, it should be remembered that, as the canal colonies demonstrate, water is also something in connection with which men in the past have achieved great triumphs in this region. This was true not only of the original construction of the canals by the British, but also of their tremendous extension by the new Pakistani state in the 1950s. This included, among other things, the construction of the Tarbella Reservoir and Dam, the largest earth-filled dam in the world. Finally, when in the 1960s the canals began to produce a crisis of waterlogging and salination in the canal colony areas, the state took quite effective action to drain the land, improve the efficiency of the canals and limit overuse of water. Salination is still a problem in parts of Punjab and Sindh, but it is a limited one, unlike the overuse of aquifers, which if it continues unchecked will render parts of Pakistan uninhabitable. These past achievements are another sign that Pakistan is not the hopeless case that it is. So often made out to be. What it achieved once it can achieve again, given leadership, a recognition of the problem, and a little help from its friends. Whereas in the past Pakistan and especially Punjab were well ahead among developing countries in terms of water storage, in recent decades both have fallen behind badly as a result of under-investment and political wrangling over dam construction. As of 2004, Pakistan had only 150 cubic meters of water storage capacity per inhabitant, compared to 2,200 cubic meters in China. The construction of small earthen dams to trap rainwater has improved the situation somewhat in the years since then, but Pakistan is still far behind India in water storage, let alone China and the developed world. The farmers of the canal colonies have for more than a hundred years demonstrated their versatility and commercial drive. This was shown again by the speed with which they adopted many of the techniques of the Green Revolution. It should in principle, therefore, be possible to get them to adopt more water-efficient ways of growing crops. The problem is that this would almost certainly require them to be pushed towards water efficiency by water pricing, and this is such a politically explosive subject that no government, civilian or military, has so far been willing to touch it. Nonetheless, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility. At least once people begin to see real agricultural disasters starting to develop elsewhere as a result of water shortages. Alongside Lahore, the central region contains Punjab's greatest industries, centered on the textile center of Faisalabad, founded by the British as Lyalpur, and other cities. The importance of the great, feudal landowning families in this region has been greatly reduced in recent decades and its politics are dominated by smaller landowners and new families risen through commercial success or, corrupt, government service. This region is closely linked to Kashmir, from where the families of many urban Punjabis, including the Sharif family, originally migrated. This has helped cement the commitment of many people in this region to the struggle against India in Kashmir. Punjabi speakers from Pakistani Kashmir also dominate the Pakistani diaspora in Britain. The second region is the Potwar, or Potohar, plateau of northwest Punjab, extending from the salt range of hills to the Indus River and the Pathan lands, 
which have exerted a strong cultural influence here. A good many of the Patuari-speaking inhabitants of this region are in fact from originally Patan tribes, like the ancestors of the cricketer, politician Imran Khan Niazi, but consider themselves to be Punjabis. This is an area of poor, arid soil which the canal colonies did not reach. As in Balakistan and parts of Sindh and the NWFP, in much of the Potwar region the water table is dropping rapidly because of both excessive and inefficient use by agriculture, and the booming needs of the mushrooming twin cities of Islamabad, Rawalpindi. Water shortages in turn are driving farmers off the land to swell these urban populations still further. This is at present a low-level, undramatic movement but its importance in worsening living standards should not be underestimated, as anyone who has seen Pakistani rural women carrying containers of water for long distances in the heat of summer, can easily appreciate. The Potwar region has few great landowners but numerous landowning clans, with bigger farmers exercising leadership, a development encouraged by past land reforms, which led landowners to split their lands between different members of their families. This marks a difference from central and southern Punjab, where, as in Britain, landowners tried to keep their estates in the hands of one son, and put other sons into the army, the civil service or business. Politics here is no longer feudal, but it is still critically dependent on kinship and leadership within kinship groups. Owing to the poverty of its soil, the Potwar region has long exported its labor in one way or another. The British recruited most of their Muslim soldiers from the Potwar area, and until recently a large majority of the Pakistani army was also recruited from these few districts. The strong Patan influence in this region has created concerns that Taliban influence could spread here from the NWFP. This could undermine the willingness to fight of the ordinary Jawan, young man, or even in the worst case lead to mutiny. A great many people from this region are working in the Gulf, and the remittances that they send home help support the region economically and increase their family's independence from local landowners. The biggest city of the region is Rawalpindi which now has more than 3 million people but was a tiny village until the British developed it as their military headquarters, to cover the Afghan frontier, though it is close to the site of another city erased by war, the great Gontaran Buddhist center of Taxila. The choice of this region by Ayub Khan for his new capital, Islamabad, reflected its better climate but also no doubt a desire to base the capital in an area with solid military ties. The third great Punjabi region is the south. This area overlaps but is not identical with the Saraiki-speaking belt, and in certain ways includes parts of central Punjab such as Jang. It is defined more by cultural and economic patterns than by language. With a much smaller share of the canal colonies, the South was less affected by the greater social mobility and economic dynamism they brought in their train, and also received relatively fewer refugees from East Punjab. It also contains fewer egalitarian jots than the northern and central parts of Punjab, and more Baloch, with their traditional deference to their autocratic chieftains. In consequence, Southern Punjab is far more feudal than the North, in ways that connect it culturally to Sindh. Also linking this region to Sindh is the very strong tradition of worshipping saints and shrines, in many cases the base for great, feudal families of hereditary saints, or peers. The shrines bind together many local Sunnis with the Shia, who have a major presence in this region. However, this presence, and especially the high proportion of the local feudals who are Shia, has also helped stir up some bitter sectarian chauvinism against the local Shia. Given all these divisions within Punjab itself, can one really speak of Punjabi domination of Pakistan, or of a Punjabi identity as such? 
The answer is less than the other provinces like to claim, but more than the Punjabis themselves like to pretend. To a great extent, of course, there is no establishment conspiracy about Punjab's domination of Pakistan, with some 56% of the population and some 75% of the industry. It naturally outweighs the other provinces, just as England naturally dominates the United Kingdom. This industry is no longer only limited to textiles and food processing. Sialkot is a major international center of sports goods and somewhat weirdly, but presumably by extension through bladders, of bagpipes. Gujarat produces high-quality shoes and medium-quality electrical goods. No industries of this scale and sophistication exist in any of Pakistan's other provinces, with the obvious exception of the city of Karachi. When representatives of other provinces denounce Punjab for its 55% quota of official jobs, they conveniently forget that this is actually slightly less than Punjab's share of the population, just as, following the 7th National Finance Commission Award of 2010, Punjab's share of state revenues is considerably below its share both of population and of revenue generation. The great majority of Pakistan's national leaders, including three out of four of its military rulers, have not been Punjabis. A widespread opinion exists among the Punjabi elites that the province is in fact, leaning over backwards to accommodate the other provinces, even at the cost of both Punjabi and national development. This feeling in Punjab contributes to support in the province for the Sharifs and the Muslim League. As one of the Muslim League's leaders told me in November 1988, after the elections in which the PPP had won power in Islamabad and the IJI alliance, led by the Muslim League, in Lahore, there has been a tremendous growth in provincial awareness in Punjab. The province is looking for its own leader. This is necessary to balance the other provinces, which in the past have blackmailed Punjab, if you do not give us more water we will break up Pakistan, and so on. We are 62% of the population of Pakistan, but have only a 45% share of jobs in the state services. We have taken the role of a generous uncle to the other provinces. On the other hand, the leader in question was Chaudhary Shujat Hussain of Gujarat, and, after Musharraf's coup against Nawaz Sharif's government in 1999, Chaudhary Shujat and his brother, Chaudhary Pervez Elahi, abandoned the Sharifs to join Musharraf's administration and take over the government of Punjab themselves. So, as always in Pakistan, collective identities, whether provincial, ethnic, religious or whatever, are constantly being trumped by personal and family loyalties and ambitions. If the Punjabi elites functioned as a united whole with a common agenda, then they certainly could dominate Pakistan absolutely for a while, but as the sensible ones realize, in the long run they would also destroy Pakistan, because of the furious resentment this would cause in the other provinces. There is little likelihood of this happening, because, as the previous account of Punjab's divisions should suggest, the Punjabi elites are themselves very divided, and have very different agendas. There does seem to be a sort of loose community of sentiment favoring Punjab among many senior Punjabi army officers and bureaucrats, though one which is endlessly cut across by personal and political ties and ambitions, and by considerations of calm, community, and religious affiliation. As a senior official in Islamabad told me, you have to argue twice as hard to push through any project in one of the other provinces, and if I want to push through a project to help a city in one of the other provinces, I always have to be careful to balance it with one helping a Punjabi city, but it doesn't work the other way round. Any Sindhi-based national government has to lean over backwards to show that it is not disadvantaging the Punjab in any way. Concerning official jobs, 
according to the quota Punjabis have less than their proportion of the population, but they are overrepresented in the senior jobs. That is partly because they are better educated on average, and that also means that they dominate the merit-based entry and the quota for women. He also said that I should be aware that he is a Mohajar, and therefore possibly biased himself. The closest Pakistan came to a united Punjabi establishment was under Zia ul Haq, when a Punjabi military ruler created a Punjab based national political party under a Punjabi industrialist, Nawaz Sharif. However, the alliance between the military and the PML, N, frayed in the 1990s and collapsed completely when General Musharraf overthrew Nawaz Sharif's government in 1999. Since then, relations have been at best extremely distrustful. In turn, there are deep differences between northern Punjabi industrialists, who tend to support either the PML, N, or military regimes, and southern Punjabi feudals, who tend towards the PPP. Punjabi industrialists, however, cannot dominate military regimes as witness their failure to achieve their infrastructure and energy needs under both Zia and Musharraf. Finally, the Muslim religious leaders in Punjab are so fractured along theological, political, personal and regional lines that it does not make sense to speak of them as an establishment at all. Punjabis from north-central Punjab certainly feel superior to the other nationalities in Pakistan, and this feeling of which the others are well aware, helps to keep ethnic relations in a permanent state of mild tension. The Punjabis from these regions are quite convinced, and it must be said, with good reason, that they are harder working, better organized and more dynamic than anyone else in Pakistan except the Mohajars, and while Punjabis respect Mohajars, since the latter are not farmers they cannot really be fully fitted into the traditional Punjabi view of the world. As a very unkind saying about the Punjabi Jats has it, other peoples have culture. The Jats have agriculture. For the Sindhis, Punjabis tend to feel a rather amused and tolerant contempt, as for pleasant and easygoing but lazy younger relatives. For the Baloch there is contempt without the tolerance, as primitive tribesmen sponging off Punjabi charity. For the Patans, however, Punjabi sentiments are very different, in ways that may have an effect on their attitudes to the Taliban and the war in Afghanistan. Punjabis believe, once again with good reason, that they are more modern and economically dynamic than the Patans. Yet in Punjabi Muslim culture there is also an ingrained cultural and historical respect for the Muslim pastoral warriors, who repeatedly swept across Punjab from Afghanistan, and from whom many Punjabis, especially in the upper classes, are or claim to be descended, and the Patans, however savage, are widely seen as Muslim warriors par excellence whose prowess has been celebrated in Pakistani literature and propaganda in all the modern wars from Kashmir to Afghanistan. This identification with the pastoral tradition gives rise to the public and formal, as opposed to private and familial, eating habits of the Punjabis, including in hotels and restaurants, a tradition whereby the green vegetable is almost a publicly persecuted species part of a heroic effort by a people of mainly bean-eating sedentary farmers to portray themselves to visitors, each other and most of all themselves as meat-eating nomadic herdsmen. However, the fact that Patan armies also repeatedly raped, looted and burned their way across Punjab, contributing to the province's lack of historic cities, makes this Punjabi respect for Patans a somewhat wary one. As a Punjabi lady acquaintance said to me of the Afghan Mujahideen back in 1988, I know they are very brave people, fighting for their country against the great Russian army and so on, but I must say I'm glad they are based in Peshwar, not Lahore. Or as an old southern Punjabi proverb used to have it, the son of a Patan is sometimes a devil, sometimes a demon. Industrialists 
Driving in Punjab can be a slightly surreal experience. Magnificent, but usually almost empty, new motorways coexist with the same old potholed two-lane highways, where the SUVs of the wealthy jostle perilously with the bullock carts and camels of the poor. The motorways are patrolled by the astonishingly honest and efficient National Motorway Police. The other roads are patrolled, or rather not, by the same old Punjab police. The same element of surrealism goes for the contrasting sights along the road. Driving to Faisalabad from Multan in the evening, we passed mile after mile of primeval-looking mud villages, with the occasional electric light illuminating some home or roadside stall. My need to stop and retire behind a tree became increasingly urgent, but my driver would not permit it. No stop here sir, here very bad people. Baloch, decoits. Just as I was preparing to throw myself from the car and into the arms of any bandits who might happen to be passing, a mirage came into sight, blazing with lights like a solitary fairground in a desert, welcome to Paris CNG station, it said, and offered not merely gas, but a business center with fax and email and a lavatory with flush toilets. Business and administration in Faisalabad are rather the same. Faisalabad is the Punjabi industrial and migrant city par excellence, at the heart of the canal colonies and by many indices is Pakistan's most modern and successful city. With a GDP in 2005 of $27 billion, according to PricewaterhouseCooper, Faisalabad has the third highest GDP in the country after Karachi and Lahore, and the second in terms of per capita production and income. It vies with Karachi for the reputation of having Pakistan's most efficient municipal administration. Without Karachi's feral ethnic politics, and it is the heart of Pakistan's biggest export industry, that of textiles. However, every time you begin to think that you really are visiting the Manchester of the East, you are apt to be brought back with a thump to the realities of kinship based politics, dysfunctional administration, ineffective law, irrational economic policies, mass illiteracy, obscurantist mass culture and media and academia addled with lunatic conspiracy theories, and, in the case of the English medium institutions, often barely understanding the language in which they operate. If Faisalabad is clear evidence of Pakistan not failing as a state, it is certainly not evidence that Pakistan is ever going to succeed as one. Faisalabad earned its proud title of Manchester of the East, when Manchester, England, was still the textile capital of the West, and its self-image has a certain 19th-century utilitarianism about it. In talking with me, Faisalabadis used the word, practical, so often to describe themselves and their city that it was easy to think oneself in the world of industrial England in the age of Dickens, especially, it must be said, given the living conditions of the working class. Literacy in Faisalabad is still between 40 and 50 percent according to the city government. This is a grotesque figure for a city and region that hopes to become an industrial giant of Asia, and one that reflects both the historic failings of repeated Pakistani and Punjabi governments and the cultural attitudes of the local population, above all when it comes to education for women. Faisalabad was founded in 1880 as Lyalpur, and named after the then British governor of the Punjab. It was renamed Faisalabad in 1977 after the late King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, who had displayed considerable generosity to Pakistan. Like the town of Montgomery, now Sahawal, to the south, it was created by the British as the commercial and administrative centre of one of their new canal colonies, on what had previously been an almost uninhabited area of arid jungle and semi-desert. Patches of this still remain, where either the canals never reached or salination has destroyed the land's fertility again. The original town was laid out in the shape of a Union Jack, 
with streets radiating from a central clock tower, in a sort of Victorian Gothic Saracenic style. In 1902 it still only had 9,000 people, but thereafter the growth of commercial farming and cotton cultivation, South Asia's great tradition of textile production, and the settlement of East Punjabi refugees after 1947 led to explosive growth. Today, the city has almost 3 million people and the district more than 5 million, and, being Faisalabad, these statistics may even be accurate. A large proportion of the population, some say a majority are East Punjabis who replaced local Hindus and Sikhs who fled in 1947. Faisalabad is therefore, partly at least, another example of the economic dynamism of these migrants, even while it also reflects their cultural conservatism. Faisalabad's municipal government is home to a strategic policy unit, the only effective city institution of its kind, so far as I know, outside Karachi, the leaders of which seemed models of efficiency and dedication. With the help of GHK, a British-based public policy consultancy, and assistance, now alas ended, from the British Department for International Development, DIFID, the unit has developed a number of new projects to revolutionize the city's administration and provision of services. Its work is based largely on a mixture of satellite imaging of the district backed by an intensive program of local inspection. As a result, for the first time the government is developing an accurate picture of the city, the spread of population, the provision of services, and so on. Perhaps most importantly, as Ghul Hafiz Kokar of GHK told me, it is now possible at the click of a mouse to see whether a planned road or school has actually been built or not. This is a check on corruption, because the city government can now check immediately whether a planned road has been built, or the money stolen. And on the other hand, if it has been built, then it doesn't need to be commissioned all over again something that happens all the time in Pakistan. The digital map will allow more efficient provision of services, and hopefully prevent disasters like that of 2007 in a Faisalabad slum when local community pressure on the politicians led to the city government increasing the flow through water pipes to the area. Because it had no idea how many pipes were actually there, it increased the pressure too much and burst the pipes. The result was an outbreak of gastroenteritis in which several dozen people died. Until the digital mapping project started, the government could not even properly tax gas stations in the city, because it did not know how many there were. It is possible to see all this when the computers are working, but, when I was there, they were not, because the electricity had failed, and, Although the local government has its own generators, the money had run out to provide them with fuel. According to Mr. Kokar, things are improving. Not as fast as we would like, but still they are on track. One key reason for this is that in 2008 the new PML, N, government in Punjab did not withdraw its support from the project, even though it had been initiated under Musharraf and the PML. Q, Government of Punjab. This marks a change from the usual, and disastrous, Pakistani practice, which the PML, N, government has followed in other areas. Some of Faisalabad's cotton industry is also truly impressive. The Chenab Mill at Nishadabad is the biggest of eight mills in the Chenab group, with 4,000 workers, out of 14,000 in the group as a whole and an output in 2008 worth $130 million. The mill is capable of turning out 12,000 individual garments a day. The group owns the stylish, and extremely expensive, Chin One chain of clothes shops and shopping malls in Pakistan, and supplies Macy's, J. C. Penny, Debenhams, Ikea and Laura Ashley, among other international outlets. I am no expert on textile production, but the mill gave a completely modern impression, 
with apparently well-fed women working on huge, smoothly running machines in giant air-conditioned workshops. One that I visited was producing frilly women's underwear, and I have never seen so much pink in such a large space at the same time. The headquarters building could have been an unusually stylish office in Singapore or Frankfurt. None of this is the kind of thing one sees in a failed state. When I visited Faisalabad last in January 2009, however, boasts of the city's success were interspersed with bitter complaints about its present economic state, admittedly. A local journalist also warned me that Faisalabad is known as the city of opposition because our industrialists are not happy whatever happens. Local anger and worry focused above all on the electricity shortages which at that time were crippling the city's industrial production and exports. Just as even very moderately well-off families in Pakistan pay a fortune for private generators to avoid the constant load shedding, so the bigger mills and factories have had to develop their own power plants and import the fuel for them privately. The problem is that not only is this extremely expensive, but in Pakistan's, and even Faisalabad's, semi-modern economy, the big mills rely for supplies of many of their semi-finished goods on small local mills and even peaceworkers, who are completely dependent on the state electricity grid. Chinab's managing director, and son of its founder, Mian Mohammad Kashif Ashfuk, told me that this is true even of his group. Above all, though, the problem when I last visited the city was electricity, and the lack of it seemed likely for a while to provoke mass riots that could even have toppled the national government, a conflict in which the industrialists and their workers might have found themselves on the same side. The head of Faisalabad District Council, Rana Zahid Tazif, himself a textile industrialist, complained bitterly. My customers in the US, UK, Australia need guaranteed commitments that I will keep my contract to supply them. Yes, my firm has a good reputation so they may wait one week or even six but finally they will say, you are not reliable, you live in a shit country, I can't order from you anymore. How can we possibly compete with other countries if we can't rely on our own electricity grid? Quite apart from the issue of electricity supply, the working conditions in the smaller workshops, or rather sweatshops, bear no resemblance to those at Chenab Mills. The contrast is absolutely jarring, as if, while visiting a factory in Lancashire today, you were to be transported by a wicked witch with a taste for education back to a factory in Lancashire in 1849. And for all the modernity of parts of Faisalabad, the old center around the clock tower is a typical Pakistani inner city slum, in which the roads are not even paved. Concerning the clock tower, I experienced a small example of how constant mass migration from the countryside continually undermines the development of a civic identity and urban culture in most of Pakistan's cities. My driver, a recent migrant to Faisalabad from a village, but a village only 10 miles away, could not find the tower in the dead center of town, even when I showed him a postcard of it. The industrialists heaped curses on the administration of President Zardari for incompetent purchasing decisions, and favoring agriculture over industry, but they also had harsh words for the previous Musharraf administration and especially his prime minister, previously finance minister, from 1999 to 2004, Kakit Aziz. In the words of Azam Kurshid, a mill owner. In terms of our recent leaders, Musharraf was the best of the worst. He appointed some good people and got us out of debt. But he and Kakit Aziz were obsessed with empty growth figures and with how many cell phones and fridges people were buying. Beyond Gwadar and the motorway, they did nothing for the infrastructure of the country, including electricity generation, on which industry depends, and we are paying the price for it today. 
We are suffering from all those years of the Washington Consensus which our leaders followed blindly. Now the West is revising its approaches but it will probably take years to filter through here, and we have already lost years which we should have spent building up our real economy. And then Musharraf made his compromise with the feudal politicians, and that of course meant favoring agriculture at the expense of industry, and the PPP government is dominated by feudal landowners. Even the Sharifs, though they are industrialists themselves, have to favor the feudals because they have the seats in the countryside and you can't win a majority without them. So throughout Pakistani history, state resources have gone to buying feudals and their families and followers, and not on turning Pakistan into a modern economy. The obvious question is why, with their wealth, intelligence and economic dynamism, the industrialists and businessmen themselves have not been able to gain greater influence over state policies. After all, even the PPP is no longer explicitly hostile to private industry, as it was in the days of Z. A. Butto, and the other major forces are strongly in favor of industry, the PML, N. Because the Sharifs are industrialists themselves, the MQM because industry is part of their vision of a modern, successful Karachi, and the military not only because it too believes strongly in modernizing Pakistan, but also because indirectly, thanks to the Faji Foundation and Army Welfare Trust, it is itself a major industrial force. The answer seems to lie partly in a combination of sheer lack of weight within society, and an absence of kinship networks. For all that the textile industry dominates Pakistan's exports and is absolutely crucial to its balance of payments, and ability to import essential goods, its share of the economy is relatively small, and its workers form a small part of the population as a whole, and this is especially true of modern industries like Chenab mills. For every semi-modern city like Faisalabad, there are dozens of medium-sized towns, which in Pakistan means towns with populations of hundreds of thousands of people, where the entire local economy is based on small shops and stalls, small family-owned workshops, and mostly fairly primitive food processing. In these towns, kinship remains of central political importance and the political scene is dominated not by modern businessmen but by interlinked clans of urban and rural notables, living mainly off rents. The constant swamping of settled urban populations by new waves of migrants also plays a key role in preventing the growth of truly urban politics. The business community is also fractured along lines of kinship and by the rivalries and bitterness caused by past political alignments, and the victimization by governments of businessmen who have backed the other side. This has made many industrialists wary of becoming involved in politics at all. Businessmen are afraid to get involved with politics because they are afraid that their businesses will be targeted with tax raids, land claims, court cases, deliberate electricity cuts and so on, Mr. Kershid told me. Most importantly, perhaps, unlike most of the feudals, the industrialists and businessmen in politics have no mass kinship groups to fall back on, and their workers are hardly likely to behave like a clan and guarantee them a permanent vote bank. Because so many city dwellers have only recently arrived from the country. Even in the city's kinship networks often remain vital to power and influence. Money and property are of course very important, but not all important. Even in Faisalabad city and district, a majority, though a small one, of members of the national and provincial assemblies are from landed families. These are not huge feudals, and they usually draw most of their wealth from urban land but they are still primarily landed notables rather than urban businessmen or professionals. All of this might have been set aside if the military and the industrial elites had formed a solid alliance to develop the country, as has been the case in a number of developing economies in the past, 
Germany and Japan are the most famous, if not the happiest examples. This looked as if it might be happening when Zia al Haq recreated the Muslim League and put Nawaz Sharif in charge of it. But in the ten years after Zia's death, first the army refused to back the Muslim League against the PPP, then the Muslim League tried to gain dominance over the military, and then the military under Musharraf shattered the alliance for good by overthrowing Nawaz Sharif. Musharraf, to stay in power, compromised with the same old feudal elements in Punjab, and all chance of a military, political, industrial alliance for development was lost. That leaves the Islamists. In Turkey, the moderate Islamist party, in its various incarnations, rose to power with mass support, but also very much on the shoulders of provincial business and industrial elites. If anywhere in Pakistan, Faisalabad would seem to be the place where the beginnings of such a development might be found. But, as mentioned earlier, the Jamat Islami there seems hopelessly tied to its lower middle class constituency, which is barred from seeking working class support by class and cultural factors, but is also too poor and uneducated, compared to its Turkish, Egyptian, or Iranian equivalents to generate any kind of coherent modern social and economic policies. In the words of a local administrator, it would be very difficult for the Islamists to make much headway in Faisalabad, because they have no answer to practical problems like gas and electricity, and this is a very practical place. We are Punjabi businessmen here, not Patans, warriors, dreamers, fanatics. Despite the intense anger of many Faisalabad workers at electricity cuts and growing unemployment, during my stay in the city I found no one who seemed to think that there was any serious chance of the Pakistani tail ban, successfully appealing for their support and setting off a mass revolt in Faisalabad. Sectarians and Terrorists It is quite otherwise in different parts of central and southern Punjab. If Punjab, and Pakistan, were to be broken from within by Islamist extremism, then the process would start here, in the belt between Jang and Bawalwalpur, with the ancient city of Multan at its heart. Here, Islamist militancy may be able to make serious inroads with the help of local sectarian forces which since the 1980s, have been attacking the local Shia community. The Pakistani Taliban have formed an alliance with these sectarian groups which in 2009, 10 led to increasing terrorism in Punjab. Because of poverty, madrasas in southern Punjab are more important than in the north, where the state education system has a bigger presence. In rural areas, the literacy rate is less than 25%. And these madrasas have long been a key recruiting ground for militant groups. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, madrasas sent many fighters first to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and then to the Jihad in Kashmir, so groups like Lashkar e Taiba and Jayashi Muhammad, formerly backed by the Pakistani military to fight in Kashmir, have a strong presence in southern Punjab. Hundreds of recruits from this region were killed in Kashmir, and as in the frontier their graves have become local places of pilgrimage. As elsewhere, association with the Kashmiri and Afghan jihads has been absolutely critical to increasing the prestige of local militants. However, the main jihadi groups in Punjab are not yet in revolt against the Pakistani state, and, precisely because the most important extremist forces in southern Punjab are sectarian forces, it seems to me extremely unlikely that they will be able to start a rebellion that could conquer the region, as the Taliban were able for a number of years to take over large parts of the Fata and Swat. Their ideological program is bitterly resisted not only by the Shia but by all the local Sunni who are deeply attached to their local shrines and traditions, like Data Ganj Baksh, and their social radicalism will be equally savagely resisted by most of the local elites. 
This picture would change only if Lushkari Taiba slash Jamit Udidawa were to ally with the TTP, and failing a really determined crackdown on them by the Pakistani authorities, they seem unlikely to do so. I have been told by officials that precisely because their core agenda is anti-India, this gives Let's leaders an especially acute sense of the Indian threat and discourages them from taking actions that would weaken or even destroy Pakistan. What the extremists in this region can do, however, is carry out bloody terrorist attacks, which they have been doing for many years against the Shia. By mid-2010, this extremist alliance had also repeatedly shown its ability to carry out serious terrorist attacks in Punjab against the state and the general public. Though it is important to remember once again the crucial difference between terrorism and successful rebellion. A certain latent tension has existed between Sunni and Shia in this region for a long time, owing to the tendency of successive regimes, ending with the British, to reward Shia nobles, some, like the Turkic Kizilbash, from far away, with great land grants in areas populated by a mainly Sunni peasantry. However, despite occasional denunciations of the Shia as heretics by Sunni preachers, until the 1980s this tension remained very limited. As the Multan Gazetteer of 1923 stated, generally speaking there is very little bitterness between the Sunni and Shia sects, and in the ordinary intercourse of life there is little to distinguish the two, something that could certainly not have been said of Shia. Sunni relations in other South Asian Muslim cities like Lahore, Quetta, and Lucknow. But as Sunni peasants moved into local towns in the mid-20th century, a new Sunni lower middle class emerged which saw its access to jobs and patronage blocked by the Shia elites and their clients. A degree of resentment at Shia dominance is therefore widespread. As a, personally enlightened, head teacher in Multan told me, there is a feeling among many people here that the Shia stick together, protect each other and give each other the best jobs, like the Freemasons in England. Anti-Shia groups also built on the successful campaigns from the 1950s to the 1960s to have the Amidi sect, declared non-Muslim. In the early 1980s several factors came together to create a wholly new level of sectarian violence, starting in the Jang district of central Punjab. The Iranian Revolution gave new confidence and prominence to the Shia minority in Pakistan, and raised fears in the establishment that they might become a revolutionary force. Many Shia firmly believe, though without any actual evidence, that Washington encouraged the administration to attack the Shia, out of fear that they could spread Iranian-style revolution. President Zia ul haq had already become bitterly unpopular with many Shia for the execution of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, a Shia, and for his promulgation of Islamic laws for Pakistan based purely on the teachings of the Hanafi Sunni section. This move led to massive Shia protests orchestrated by the radical Shia organization the Tarakinifas Nifas e Fika Jafiriya, which forced the government to back down and concede to the Shia their own separate code in certain respects. These developments in turn stoked the anger of certain Sunni groups, and may have led Pakistani intelligence services to favor the creation of Sunni sectarian forces in response. There is, however, no actual evidence of this, and it is entirely possible that these forces simply bought some of the arms which flooded into Pakistan to arm the Afghan Mujahideen, especially as these were being funded by state and private money from Saudi Arabia, with its strong traditional hostility to Iran and Shiaism. Later, the sectarians also forged links with groups participating in the Kashmir Jihad, and probably received guns from them. Another case of the Frankenstein syndrome or, rather, of Frankenstein's monster wandering off, making friends with other monsters, and starting whole families of little monsters. The result was the creation in Jang in 1985 of the Saipa-e-Sahaba Pakistan 
SSP, as a breakaway group of the Jamiat Ulama Islam, JUI. The SSP began a program of attacks on local Shia targets, in the name of declaring the Shia non Muslims and making Pakistan an officially Sunni state like Saudi Arabia. Local police told me that, in a few cases, local Sunni businessmen owing debts to Shia creditors or with business disputes with Shia rivals paid the SSP or Lujay, Lushkari Jangvi, to kill them. Over the years the SSP's activities spread beyond Jang to take in southern Punjab and other areas of the country where old Sunni, Shia tensions had been latent, including Quetta, Peshwar and the Kuram Agency of Fata where tribal conflict between the Sunni Bangash and Shia Tori tribes dates back some 300 years. In recent years, the SSP and their even more radical offshoot the Lujay have also extended their anti-Shia campaign to take in Amidis and Christians. Radical Shia fought back through the Taraki Jafiriya and other groups, and in the 25 years to 2010 more than 6,000 people have been killed in sectarian clashes and terrorism, with the dead in a rough proportion of three Shia to two Sunni. Individual leaders and activists on both sides have been killed, mosques have been bombed, and on occasions bazaars frequented by people of the rival community have also been attacked. It should be noted that, Unlike with the jihadi groups fighting in Kashmir and Afghanistan, since General Zia's time at least there has been no evidence of Pakistani governments backing the anti-Shia militants. The PPP is naturally extremely hostile to them, if only because the Budos and Zardaris are Shia, and so are, in private at least, many of the PPP's chief supporters among the landowners of central and southern Punjab. Despite the apparent sympathy of some leading members of the PML, N, for the anti-Shia militants, when Nawaz Sharif was prime minister in the late 1990s, his government launched a crackdown against them during which many were killed. The response was an attempt by the Lujay to kill Mr. Sharif. The Musharraf administration continued this assault on the Sunni sectarians and banned the SSP and Lujay in January 2002. These repeated attacks by the state are a key reason why the SSP and Lujay, unlike the militants fighting in Kashmir such as the Lushkari Taiba, have themselves increasingly attacked the state as well as the Shia and Christians, and as of 2009 have formed an alliance with the Pakistani Taliban. The wave of terrorism they have launched in Punjab also gives one more sympathy for the Pakistani state's deep unwillingness to add to the number of their terrorist enemies, by attacking the even more formidable Lushkari Taiba. As a senior official in Faisalabad told me in January 2009, I am seriously worried about the spread of militancy from Jang to the rest of Punjab. It is true that so far Lujay and SSP have been only sectarian, but they can switch. The same is even true of Lushkari Taiba and Jamit Udidawa, even though we have backed them all these years. We have to worry that if we do what you say and crack down on them that some of them at least will turn to terrorism against Pakistan, in alliance with the tail ban. After all, they have the ideology and the training. The last thing we need now is yet another extremist threat. The fact that despite crackdowns by successive Pakistani regimes the sectarian extremists have been able to survive, is another reflection of the weakness of the Pakistani state, and especially of the police and judiciary. In the words of a police officer in Jang district in 2002, There are hundreds of thousands of SSP and Lushkari Jangvi sympathizers in this region and we aren't America. We can't arrest them all and send them to Cuba. We have to stay more or less within the law. It's different for the hardcore terrorists who we know have killed people, them, we can sometimes just kill. But there are so many more people who may have given them shelter, or who may be going to become terrorists, but who haven't actually done anything yet. Under the anti-terrorism laws, 
We can hold people for three months, but after that we have to go to the high court, and the court will demand evidence that we usually don't have, because witnesses just will not come forward, you can understand why. Only very rarely do the courts allow us to hold people permanently in preventive detention. And of course the judges are also frightened. That is why they let out Azam Tariq, though everyone knows he has ordered God knows how many murders. Everyone says that it is because the police sympathize with the militants, but I can tell you that is definitely not true at the senior level, junior policemen, yes, in some cases. But you know 22 policemen have been killed by these bastards in Jiang alone in the past 10 years. The superintendent of a jail where SSP prisoners were being held was even kidnapped in front of his own jail and killed. That kind of thing scared the police, and for a time we became quite inactive in this part of Punjab. That was especially true in the early 90s, but in recent years we have become much tougher. As he freely admitted, the difficulty of getting convictions means that if the police get an order to deal firmly with some sectarian leader, their response often is to kill him. Several leaders of the SSP have indeed been killed, either with or without official complicity. In 1990, one of the group's founders, Maulana Haq Nawaz Jangvi, was killed by Shia terrorists, as was his successor Maulana Ziaur Raymond Faruqi. In October 2003, after attempts to convict him for terrorism had failed, SSP leader Maulana Azam Tariq was shot dead by unidentified gunmen a hundred yards, or so from a police checkpoint in Islamabad where he had been stopped for half an hour. Officially, the killing was blamed on Shia militants, but both the private accounts of my official friends and the circumstances of the killing make it clear that the Pakistani state was involved. This was also almost certainly true of Azam Tariq's successor, Alama Ali Shur Haidari, who was killed in an ambush in Kherpur, Sindh, in August 2009, once again ostensibly by Shia militants. The killing came two weeks after an anti-Christian pogrom orchestrated by the SSP in the Punjabi town of Gojra, which killed eight local Christians and severely embarrassed both the national and provincial governments. Private claims by intelligence officials that this was official retaliation for Gojra therefore seem credible. When covering the 2002 parliamentary elections in Pakistan, I traveled for a while with a Shia politician in central Punjab. According to both official and unofficial sources, speaking off the record, the SSP had made a plot to ambush and kill her, possibly emboldened by the fact that Azam Tariq had been released from jail shortly before and was standing in the elections. The local police received categorical orders that sectarian attacks on politicians during the elections were to be prevented. The police response? They took three Lushkari Ujangvi activists, whom they suspected but were not able to prove had been responsible for several previous murders of Shia, into a field at night and shot them. While resisting arrest, and let SSP and Lujay know that if they launched attacks during the elections there would be many more such encounter killings of their members. I asked an official acquaintance whether a strong warning wouldn't have been enough. This was a strong warning, the only warning these people understand, he replied. In consequence, for many years the sectarians have also been launching attacks on state targets which in turn has increased state hostility to them. Terrorism by SSP and Lujay increased enormously after the storming of the Red Mosque in 2007, in which fighters linked to SSP were killed, radicalized Islamists across Pakistan, while U.S. drone attacks killed Punjabis from the sectarian parties fighting for the Taliban in the Fatah and Afghanistan. In July 2009, a huge explosion destroyed part of a village in Multan district and killed 17 people when an arms cache, 
in the home of a local madrasa teacher with links to the SSP and the Pakistani Taliban blew up accidentally. In the following months, the growth of terrorism in Punjab seems largely to have been the work of SSP and Lujay militants linked to the Pakistani Taliban, rather than of the Taliban as such. According to credible reports, Pakistani intelligence responded in typical fashion with a mixture of arrests, extrajudicial executions, and attempts to split the militants and draw more moderate saipa e sahaba members into allegiance to the state. This also appears to be the strategy of the PML, N, government of Punjab. Whether it will have any success is at the time of writing wholly unclear. Multan. A famous Persian couplet about Multan sums up some of the reasons for Sunni militant support there, and the immense obstacles to it, in four rare things Multan abounds. Heat, dust, beggars, and burial grounds. The notorious heat and dust of summer have no great impact one way or the other, but while the beggars reflect the area's poverty, the burial grounds are those of local Sufi saints and their followers. Multan was the first part of present-day Punjab to be converted to Islam, starting in the 10th century, and the conversion was largely carried out by these saints. It is impossible to miss the saints in Multan. Their tombs literally tower over the old city on its hill, and give Multan its fame. Several are faced with the equally famous Blue Multani tile work. The shrine of Shah Rukhni Alam is a particularly striking combination of grim fortress and soaring fantasy. The lower parts consist of walls and towers of massive unadorned brickwork, which act as the base for a beautiful tiled dome. Despite horribly destructive sieges by the Sikhs and British, and the whims of the Chenab River, which now flows several miles away. A combination of the strategic hill and pilgrimages to the saints' tombs has meant that Multan has always been rebuilt in the same place. It is indeed the oldest continuously inhabited city in Pakistan, and visitors are shown the spot on the old walls where Alexander the Great was wounded during his attack on the city. This might conceivably be true though the attraction of the spot for tourists is sadly diminished by the fact that it now faces yet another concrete semi-slum, which over the years has swamped what used to be a Mughal garden. Worship of the saints is the greatest local obstacle to the spread of Sunni radical ideology in southern Punjab, just as the political power of the great landowning families. Jalani, Qureshi, Kakwani and Gardizi who are the saints' descendants and custodians of their shrines, peers, means that a radical takeover would require a massive social revolution. At the time of writing, both the Pakistani Prime Minister, Syed Yusuf Raza Jalani, and the Foreign Minister, Syed Shah Mahmood Qureshi, are from Multani peer families. They are both from the PPP, but began in the PML, N, and other branches of their family are still in that party. The shrines and the peer families illustrate a key obstacle to the propagation of sectarian hatred in Punjab, which is that no one knows how many Shia there actually are, because in a great many cases no one can ascertain, including quite often the people concerned themselves, who is Shia and who is Sunni. The Sufi shrines, their custodians and their followers play an important part in this by constantly preaching against the Sunni, Shia divide and stressing that, our saint preached that there should be neither Sunni nor Shia, but only worshippers of God, as I was told at many shrines. Apart from the stricter followers of the saints, masses of ordinary local people worship at the shrines and are influenced by this feeling. As for the peer families themselves, some of the Gardizis are openly Shia, as is their shrine. The Qureshis and Jalanis are generally thought to be Shia, but practice Sunni worship in public. Then there is a variety of traditional local arrangements, either based on status, or intended to dampen sectarian conflict and extend the alliance networks of particular clans. 
Thus I was told that the local Kosar tribe, like the Ligaris, of Baloch origin but now Saraki speaking, worship the local saints and take their wives from Shia families, while the men of the tribe remain Sunni. Sayyids, descendants of the Prophet, including all the peer families, by definition only marry other Sayyids, and this rule is far more important than sectarian divides. I visited the shrine of Shah Yusuf Gardizi in Multan together with a member of the Syed Gardizi family, a student at the local Broomfield Hall School where I had given a talk. The shrine is home not only to the tomb of the original saint but to those of members of his family and leading followers, including the lion and snake which accompanied him to Multan, and come in for their own share of respect. Presumably when paying respects to a lion the question of whether the creature was a Shia or Sunni lion, is not uppermost in the mind of the worshipper. Though openly Shia, the shrine is therefore also worshipped at by local Sunni. The stories of miracles I heard about the shrine were told to me by local Shia and local Sunni. A senior official in Multan told me that during the Shia festival of Ashura, 10th Moharram, in Multan, when the administration issues licenses to carry taziyas, imitation mausoleums of the martyred imams made of wood and paper, like small towers, in procession, 90% of the licenses went to people calling themselves Barelvi Sunnis. Less encouraging was what my Gardizi guide told me in January 2009 about his school. Broomfield Hall is very much the school of the local elite not the very top elite, who would go to the famous schools of Lahore, but their close relatives. He said that three, quarters of the boys in his class sympathize with the Pakistani Taliban. They say that they are good Muslims oppressed by America and the Pakistani army. He said that one 17-year-old son of a local businessman is trying to grow a big beard to look what he calls proper Muslim. He says he is a Wahhabi. I don't think he really knows what that means but he certainly hates us Shia. He says that he would like to go to America and blow himself up together with Americans. He makes me laugh, though it isn't really very funny. Most of this is doubtless adolescent posturing, but as far as anti-American sentiment among the students goes, there can be no doubt. When I spoke to the senior classes, they were full of the same crazed conspiracy theories as the rest of society. In their view, it has been proved that the Jews were responsible for 9-11, that a Jewish conspiracy exists to dominate the world, that the U.S. has occupied Afghanistan in order to invade Pakistan, Iran and Central Asia, and so on, and on. The vast majority of Broomfield students of course have far too much to lose ever to join an extremist group, but sentiments among poor people on the street were just as extreme, and they have far less to lose. As in the rest of Punjab, in January 2009 in Multan I found some sympathy for the Pakistani Taliban among most of those people I asked, who declared themselves to be Sunni. I made a point of asking my interviewee's sectarian affiliation, though many refused to answer, in some cases giving adherence to a saint as the reason. Concerning the idea of military action against the Taliban, Pakistani or Afghan, a majority of Sunni and even some Shia were opposed. This may have changed since then, but I doubt it has changed completely. However, the Shia, together with smaller minority Muslim groups like the Bora, who also fear persecution by Sunni radicals, were the only section of the population with many members willing to support military action. Shia and Bora were also the only former PPP voters on the streets in Multan, many of whom still said that they would vote for Zardari and the PPP at the next election. As of that date at least, the local Sunni seem to have deserted the party in mass. Then again, one should not make too much of this. Several of the Shia and Bora also said that they were sick of the PPP and Zardari and would vote PML, N. At the next election, 
and a good many Sunni, if not a majority, denounced the Pakistani Taliban and said it was right to fight against them. All my interviewees, Sunni, Shia and Bora alike, denounced the U.S. and its presence in Afghanistan. But then that is true even in the most anti-militant circles in Pakistan. Furthermore, this was among the lower, middle-class shopkeepers in the bazaars of Multan City, where one would expect Sunni militant feeling to be stronger, and where people, including the Shia middle classes, for economic reasons, are more likely to vote PML, N. After the 2008 elections, of Multan District's six National Assembly seats, three were held by the PPP, two by the PML, N, and one by the PML, Q. Two of the PPP's members of the National Assembly, MNAs, and the PML, Q, MNA were from peer families. The PLM, N, MNAs were a small landowner and a local businessman. In the countryside of Punjab south of Multan, peers and their shrines are still very widely revered, and kinship groups and their hereditary landowning chieftains remain politically dominant. This, the Saraiki language, and the presence of large numbers of Baloch tribes bind southern Punjab closely to Sindh, the subject of the next chapter, more closely in many respects than to northern Punjab. Rural Sindh contains very little support for Islamist militancy of either the jihadi or the sectarian variety, but like southern Punjab and Balakistan, and unlike northern and central Punjab, most of Sindh also contains few signs of economic and social change and dynamism. 8. Sindh We all knew it would start up again, the shootings on a massive scale, the unnatural silence in the evenings, the siege mentality. But for the moment, for today, Karachi was getting back on its feet, as it had always been able to do. And that didn't just mean getting back to work, but getting back to play, friendship, chai, cricket on the street, conversation. In the midst of everything that was happening, Karachi had decided to turn round and wink at me. And in that wink was serious intent, yes, the city said, I am a breeding ground for monsters, but don't think that is the full measure of what I am. Camilla Shamsi On the late afternoon of April 29, 2009 in Karachi, I visited the local headquarters of the Jamat Islami Party and spent a couple of hours talking with the head of their social welfare organization then went on to Zainab Market in the old downtown area to buy some presents, and spent another hour or so haggling over tablecloths and shawls, then to another shop to buy a new suitcase, and back to my hotel for a shower and a meal, and to call my family. That done, I turned on the television to see if anything important had happened during the day, and discovered that yes, it had. 34 people had been killed in gun battles and targeted shootings over the previous few hours in outlying parts of Karachi, and no one whom I'd met in the center of town had thought it worth mentioning, or had changed their behavior in any way as a result. What was even more striking was that this experience echoed one of almost 20 years before, when I was visiting Karachi as a journalist in August 1989. Then, Two, a gun battle erupted in another part of town, of which I and everyone I met were unaware until I was tipped off by a local journalist. On that occasion, if I remember rightly, there were only six dead. The fighting then was between fighters from the Mohajer majority in Karachi and others from the Sindhi minority in the city, but majority in the province as a whole. In 2009, the fighting was between Mohajers and Patans. Otherwise, at first sight, plus CA change. Nothing about the Rangers, a paramilitary corps under the army, acting as a reserve force of order in the city, trying to separate the two sides had changed, nor the alert, tense, rather contemptuous glances they cast over the local population from behind the light machine guns mounted on their jeeps nor had anything at all changed in the 
handful of mostly ill-equipped and dirty hospitals to which the wounded were ferried. There have been several more such battles in 2009 and 2010. All this is a long way of saying that Karachi is a deeply divided city, but also a very big city, with a remarkable capacity to tolerate episodes of great violence. In 1989 the population was already 8 million, bigger than London's. By 2009, it had swelled to a megalopolis of around 18 million, or at least that was the estimate Karachi's mayor gave me and uses as a basis. Other opinions from officials ranged from 15 to 20 million. Obviously, a city which is not sure of the existence of several million people isn't going to miss 34 very badly, and indeed, visiting the affected areas in the following days, it was not easy to spot the occasional burnt-out shop and minibus amid the thousands of shops and minibuses, still plying their trade on the endless streets. Nor is Karachi a particularly violent city by world standards. Even if political and ethnic violence are included, the murder rate in Karachi at the last count put it 25th among the great cities of the world. Remove these elements, and the rate goes down to well below that of several large cities in the U.S. Despite the killings of April 2009, Karachi is still, God willing, much more peaceful than it was when I knew it in the late 1980s. As of 2010, killings are chiefly targeted, aimed at the activists and hard men on either side. The killings are part of the political game, of the negotiated state. Then, there were mass killings, with bomb attacks and pillion riders on motorbikes firing Kalashnikovs into crowds, leaving dozens dead at a time, and pointing towards outright ethnic civil war. This improvement in the country's greatest city has to be set against the growing violence of the Pathan areas of northern Pakistan. As usual, Pakistan is stumbling along, worse in some ways, better in others. For that matter, even in its worst years Karachi was very far from the anarchy of West Africa, let alone Somalia or the Congo. Indeed, anyone who has done no more than visit Karachi Airport can tell the difference. Since 2000, under two generally honest, efficient and dynamic city governments, the city's infrastructure has considerably improved. All the same, there have been moments in Karachi when I was tempted to kiss the rangers, a temptation strongly to be resisted. Finally, it is worth noting that none of the major outbreaks of conflict in Karachi over the past generation has involved the Taliban, or Islamist extremism in general. There have been isolated terrorist attacks by Sunni Islamist extremists in the city, including serious terrorism against local Shia, the murder of Daniel Pearl and the bomb attack on the U.S. consulate, and Jamit Islami students have been involved in armed clashes with other student groups in the university. But Karachi's tensions are overwhelmingly ethnic, not sectarian. In fact, the Taliban stand about as much chance of taking over Karachi as I do, given the makeup and culture of most of its inhabitants. Rather, the dangers to Karachi from. The Taliban are twofold. The first is that Taliban terrorist attacks attributed to members of the Pathan minority in the city may exacerbate ethnic tensions, to the point where they are beyond the power of the army and rangers to contain, and the economic life of the city, and of Pakistan, is severely damaged. The second, more remote possibility is that developments elsewhere will split the army and weaken the state to the point where their control over Sindh and Karachi will collapse altogether, and this region will be delivered over to its own inner demons. On the basis of my own researches, I can state with melancholy confidence that the ability of Sindh's populations to regulate their differences peacefully in the absence of the Pakistani state would be low to non-existent. Looming behind the short to medium-term threat of ethnic violence is an even greater long-term danger, 
that of water, not enough of one kind, and too much of another. For the past five thousand years and more, human civilization in this region has been a gift only of the river Indus, which flows through what would otherwise be desert and semi-desert. After the British conquered Sindh in the 1830s, their first census recorded a population of barely 1.3 million people. 170 years later, the population has soared to around 50 million people, and 50 million people cannot live in a desert. This growth was thanks above all to massive British irrigation projects, which turned large areas of semi-desert into some of the most fertile land on earth. But almost all the water that flows down these canals still comes from the same old source, the Indus, that capricious and incalculable river, and through a mixture of overuse and appalling wastefulness, in the decade leading up to 2010 the Indus no longer flowed into its delta for much of the year, and the sea crept in to replace it. The great floods of 2010 have replenished the delta and promised Sin's farmers a bumper crop in 2011, but this is likely to be a purely temporary effect, unless, on the one hand, Sindh can develop an infrastructure to conserve and use its water properly, or, on the other hand, such floods become a frequent occurrence, in which case much of Sindhi agriculture will be reduced to a subsistence level. By driving hundreds of thousands of Sindhi and Pathan peasants from their swamp lands, and wrecked villages into Mohajar-dominated Karachi, the 2010 floods have also threatened Sindh's precarious ethnic peace a tendency that can only get much worse if ecological disasters become a regular pattern. As to the consequences of a really serious rise in sea levels as a result of climate change, you only have to stand on the low sea wall at Karachi and look at the city with its millions of inhabitants. Stretching back across miles of low-lying land, Karachi's average height above sea level is 26 feet, to imagine what would happen caught between the hungry sea and the thirsty land, and with both pressures in danger of drastically intensifying as a result of climate change, Sindh needs nothing less than a revolution in its system of land use and water management over the next decades, if human civilization in this region is not to be seriously threatened. Given the centrality of land ownership to Sindhi political society, and the centrality of water to usable land. Such a revolution would probably need to be not only technological and economic but also social and political, and whether one of the most stagnant societies in Asia is capable of such change seems highly doubtful. The History of Sindh The Indus, in Sanskrit, Sindhu, gives its name to Sindh, to India and also to the oldest civilization in Sindh and one of the oldest on earth, the Indus Valley Civilization, which existed in various forms between around 3300 and 1300 BCE. That civilization was destroyed, presumably by Aryan invaders from Central Asia, around 3000 years ago, and no visible link exists between it and the Sindh of today. However, it is rather depressing, when visiting the excavated ruins of the city of Mohenjo-daro in Upper Sindh, to note that its clay bricks were better made and better laid than those of most Sindhi towns and villages of the present, though both are made from the same mud. Samina Altaf remarks that Mohenjo-daro's water supply also seems to have been better than those of many Pakistani cities today. Equally depressing is the fact that waterlogging because of rice cultivation in the surrounding fields and neglect by the Pakistani government means that by far the greater part of Mohenjo-daro, and all its earliest levels, are now lost forever, melted back into the mud from which they came. In fact, Mohenjo-daro is apt to arouse bitter musings on cycles of historical decline in anyone with a reverence for the past and its exploration. A traveler of 1842 described the homes of ordinary rural Sindhis. All the houses here are built of clay, they are scarcely twenty feet high, have flat roofs, from which a kind of ventilator sometimes rises, 
and air holes supply the place of windows. Long continued rain would destroy these huts and sweep away whole villages. Just as nothing much about the dwellings of ordinary people had changed in the thousands of years of human habitation, in Sindh prior to this description, so nothing much seems to have changed in the 168 years since. This is one reason why the floods of 2010 were not as destructive as appeared at first sight. To put it bluntly, mud huts are easy to rebuild. The ruins of Mohenjo-daro are topped by the much later stupa of a Buddhist monastery, representing the religion which for 1,000 years or so partially displaced the Hindu system created by the Aryans. Muslim rule began in the region with the conquests of Muhammad bin Qasim, an Arab general, after 710 CE, though it was not until some 500 years later that the bulk of the Hindu population was converted to Islam. Though the original conquest was extremely violent, the subsequent conversion was largely peaceful, and was above all the work of the Isufi saints described in Chapter 4 whose worship still predominates in interior Sindh. Around 20% remained Hindu until the partition of India in 1947, and Sindh still contains by far the largest number of Hindus in Pakistan. Sindh was the original gateway of Islam into the Indian subcontinent, spreading by sea from Arabia. In subsequent centuries, however, the importance of the sea links to Arabia faded, and the main Muslim route of invasion, migration and trade came to be from Iran and Central Asia through Afghanistan to Punjab and on to the plains of the Ganges. Cut off by the deserts of Balakistan to the west and the Dhar to the east, and by the swamps of the Ran of Kutch to the southeast, Sindh developed in partial isolation from the main currents of Muslim life in the subcontinent. This isolation has strongly marked Sindhi culture down to the present. From the early 16th century to the early 18th, Sindh was incorporated in the Mughal Empire, though actual control by the central government was very loose. With the decline of the Mughals in the early 18th century, power was progressively seized by their local governors, the Kalhoras. In the later 18th century, the Kalhoras transferred their allegiance first to Nadir Shah of Iran, then to the Durrani dynasty of Afghanistan. Towards the end of the 18th century, the Kalhoras were themselves displaced by a new dynasty, that of the Talpars, who ruled until the British conquest of 1843. The glory of the Talpars is still recalled by the magnificent tiled and painted palaces of their secondary capital of Kot Diji a place that cries out for conservation and tourism development but which, like Mohenjo-daro, has been quite shamefully neglected by the government. The Kalhoras and Talpars represented traditions which remain of central importance in much of Sin today. The Kalhoras represented the hereditary descendants of the saints and of the prophet, highly improbably in this as in most cases, since they are generally thought to have been descended from converted Hindus. The Talpars represented the tribes of Baloch origin, which had always been present in Sindh but which increased their numbers greatly in the disorders which followed the end of Mughal rule. These two groups provide many of the great landowner politicians who continue to dominate the politics of interior Sindh. Both the Kalhoras and the Talpars also illustrate the vagueness of religious distinctions among the Sindhis, since the Kalhora saints were worshipped by both Sunnis and Shia, while the Talpars include both Shia and Sunni branches. The shrines of the saints, large and small, extend across the Sindhi countryside. As Sarah Ansari writes, by the end of the 18th century, it had become virtually impossible to travel more than a few miles in Sindh without coming across the shrine of one saint or another. Like the Saraiki belt of southern Punjab described in the last chapter, Sindh is the area of Muslim South Asia most dominated by the worship of peers. As to the Baloch tribes, 
Their migration from the deserts and semi-deserts to the West has contributed to the extreme conservatism of Sindhi rural society, its violent obsession with honor, and its tendency to cattle lifting, banditry, and tribal feuds. In previous centuries, these Baloch tribes of Sindh, like the Mazaris, could field hundreds or even thousands of armed men each. The fort-like appearance of Sindhi villages, with their thorn fences and blank exterior walls with holes that do duty both for ventilation and as loopholes, attest to the traditional insecurity of Sindhi rural life, and the long lineage of Sindhi dacoity, banditry. In previous centuries, all the settled populations and traders were at risk from tribal raiders, but especially at risk were the Hindu merchants, bankers and moneylenders who dominated Sindh's commercial economy. Under British rule, the Sindhi Hindu commercial classes profited greatly from increased law and order, an end to tribal raids, the development of a modern civil code governing commercial transactions, and the overcoming of Sindh's traditional isolation through the construction of railways and the great port of Karachi, which, when the British arrived, had been a small town of 14,000 people, dependent chiefly on fishing. Especially in Karachi, the Hindus were joined by Muslim immigrants from Gujarat and elsewhere in India, chiefly from ethnic and religious groups with strong commercial traditions such as the Maimans, Kojas and Boras, as well as Parsis. By the later British period, these came to make up the bulk of the middle classes in Sindh. This movement was facilitated by the fact that until 1936 Sindh was not a separate province, but was part of the Bombay Presidency, ruled from the great commercial metropolis of that name. The father of Pakistani independence, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, came from a Koja family of Gujarat, which settled in Karachi, and which contained Ismaili and Orthodox, Twelver, Shia branches. As a result of this influx, Karachi emerged as a city which even before independence had a very different culture and ethnic character, from that of the rest of Sindh, of which it, and not the Talpers Hyderabad, became the capital. In 1947, a majority of Karachi's inhabitants were Hindu. Karachi grew partly as a result of the enormously increased agricultural exports first of Punjab, from the 1890s, and then Sindh, from the 1930s, as a result of British irrigation projects. Its greatest single boost under the Raj, however, came from the First World War, when it became one of the greatest points of transit for troops and supplies from British India to the British campaigns, against the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. By independence Karachi had a population of some 350,000. By the census of 1961 this had risen to more than 2 million, by 1981 to 5 million, and today to some 18 million. Independence and Mohajar, Sindhi Relations The moment that conclusively wrenched Karachi into a separate path of development from interior Sindh came with independence and partition. The very phrase, interior Sindh, is suggestive, especially in the mouths of Urdu-speaking Karakites, when it takes on some of the overtones of mid-Victorian references to the interior of Africa. Millions of Urdu-speaking Muslim, Mohajars, a Muslim term meaning refugees for the sake of religious belief, after those who followed the Prophet from Mecca to Medina, left India for Pakistan, and by far the greater number settled in Karachi, and to a lesser extent in Sindh's second city of Hyderabad, both of which they came to dominate. The resulting growth in Karachi's population was explosive even by the standards of the developing world, and it often seems a miracle that this growth did not overwhelm it completely and that it manages to function better than most cities in Africa and many in Asia and South America. As of 2010, Karachi generates around a quarter of Pakistan's state revenues and GDP, 
and contains more than half of Pakistan's banking assets and almost a third of Pakistan's industry. This economic dynamism was above all a result of the influx of non-Sindhis. As a result of this migration, in 1998, according to the census, Urdu speakers made up 21% of the population of Sindh, compared to 59% Sindhi speakers. In Karachi, they were 48%, with around another 8% made up of Gujarati, who also left India after 1947 and so come under the same heading of Mohajar. The balance was made up mainly of other migrants to Karachi, almost 14% Punjabis, including a number whose ancestors were settled in the countryside under British rule, and 11% Pashto speakers in Karachi in 1998, certainly higher today. Only 7.22% of the population of Karachi in 1998 was Sindhi speaking. The balance was largely made up of Muslim emigrants from Gujarat in India, who speak their own languages but as Mohajars tend to identify with the Urdu speakers and the MQM. In Sindh as a whole, although so many Sindhis are of Baloch origin, most speak the Sindhi language, meaning that Balochi speakers account for only 2% of the population. The Sindhis helped the process by which Urdu speakers came to dominate the main cities by their attacks on the Hindu minority, which, though not nearly as savage as in Punjab, nevertheless led to the flight of most of them by 1950, and of all their wealthy and influential elements. Sindhi Hindu refugees went to swell the commercial prosperity of Gujarat and Bombay, but also to increase anti-Muslim chauvinism in India. The leader of the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, Lal Krishna Advani, was born in Karachi in 1927. Like Punjab, Muslim Sindh came round to supporting the partition of India very late, and might indeed easily have wrecked the entire idea. The strongest support for the Muslim League in Sindh before independence came from ethnic non-Sindhis the urban middle classes and dynamic Punjabi farmers who had settled in Sindh to exploit the new lands made fertile, by British irrigation projects. Opposition to the League came from the Sindh United Party, which, like the Unionist Party in Punjab, tried to bridge the gap between Muslims and Hindus and preserve a united India with increased provincial autonomy. The United Party's Muslim membership was dominated by big, feudal landowners including Sir Shah Nawaz Bhutto, father of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and grandfather of Benazir Bhutto. The Muslim League encouraged and exploited a wave of anti-Hindu feeling in the 1940s to defeat the United Party, but then itself split into two factions. The former president of the League in Sindh, G. M. Syed clashed bitterly with Jinnah over Syed's demands for Sindh to be fully autonomous within a loose Pakistani confederation. He left the party to found a Sindhi nationalist party, which still exists under the leadership of his son. The nationalism of Syed and his followers was greatly increased by the influx of Mohajars to Karachi and Hyderabad. After 1947, taking over homes and property abandoned by the Hindus. The Sindhis dubbed the Mohajars Makhar, after the locusts which still sometimes devastate parts of the Sindhi countryside. The Mohajars hit back with Paindu, villager, with a connotation of country bumpkin, or even Chopaya, domestic animal, beast of burden. The Mohajars were and remain far better educated than the mainly rural Sindhis and came mostly from middle-class urban backgrounds in India. According to the 1951 census, only 15% of Mohajars were unskilled laborers, with almost 40% classified as clerical or sales workers, and 21% as skilled workers. More than 5% were from professional and managerial backgrounds. Karachi in consequence has the highest literacy rate of any city in Pakistan, 
which at 65% is admittedly not saying very much. These origins continue to mark the Mohajers out not merely from Sindhis but from the vast majority of Pakistanis, and the self-identification as a modern urban middle class is at the heart of Mohajer cultural and, later, political identity. The middle class faction of Mohajers has defined the core characteristics of Mohajer cultural identity, education, Urdu, resistance, urbanism. These characteristics are the privileges and qualities that were taken for granted for decades but were threatened in the 1960s and 1970s. These privileges and qualities are of central importance in the reading of history and have become part of Mohajer culture. Therefore, all Mohajers are considered middle class, even the slum dwellers in Ismania Mohajer colony and the men who take their lunch in five star hotels. The Mohajers spoke Pakistan's new national language, Urdu, at home. This gave them a colossal advantage in competition for government jobs, which was increased still further by their residence in Karachi, which until 1958 was Pakistan's capital and a separate federally administered district. Mohajers naturally also dominated the Urdu and English language educational establishments in Karachi relegating Sindhis to a severely underfunded Sindhi University in Hyderabad. Sindh itself was dissolved as a province from 1955 to 1970, and incorporated in the one unit of West Pakistan, intended to create a balance against the other unit of East Pakistan, with its somewhat larger population. Under one unit, Mohajers and to a lesser extent Punjabis dominated the bureaucracy and police in Sindh at the expense of Sindhis. Rise of the MQM, Mohajer Kami Mahaz or Mohajer People's Movement By the early 1970s, however, the advantage had swung back heavily in favor of the Sindhis. The shift of the national capital to Islamabad in the 1960s had reincorporated Karachi in the province of Sindh, and reduced the Mohajers' access to government positions, and the rise of the Sindhi Z. A. Budo's Pakistan People's Party, PPP, for the first time gave the Sindhis a grip both on a national political party and, from 1971 to 1977, on national government. Budo established quotas in education and government service for people from the rural areas of Sindh, in other words, ethnic Sindhis, that drastically reduced Mohajer opportunities in these fields. Budo's anti-capitalist rhetoric was particularly directed at the non-Sindhi commercial elites of Karachi, and his establishment of Sindhi as the official provincial language hurt Mohajer prospects in Sindh. In the words of Faraz Ahmed, this confronted the Mohajers with a sudden need to face the reality of Sindh. For 23 years the Mohajers of Karachi had never even thought of being in Sindh. A majority of them had never seen a Sindhi nor heard their language being spoken. Their youth had grown up thinking that Karachi was a Mohajer enclave or a world unto itself. In everyday speech, as in the press, the expression, Karachi and Sindh, was in vogue, it still is, A.L. For many Mohajers, the return of Karachi to Sindh was nothing less than surrendering a homeland for the second time. This reinforced a sense among Mohajers that they were losing the country, Pakistan, that they had founded, as the Punjabi elites had increasingly taken over from Mohajers in the central bureaucracy. A shift symbolized and reinforced by the move of the capital to the new Punjabi city of Islamabad. By the 1980s, the Mohajers also found their ethnic dominance of Karachi under pressure from growing numbers of Punjabi and especially Pathan migrants. This decline has continued since. In 1981, Mohajers made up 24.1% of the population of Sindh compared to 55.7 Sindhis, 10.6% Punjabis and 3.6% Patans. By 1998, 
the Mohajer proportion had fallen to 21% and the Sindhi proportion had risen to 59%. The next census is going to be an explosive issue, because it will almost certainly show that the Mohajer proportion has dropped still further. In addition, there is a well-founded suspicion that a desire to evade registration for taxes means that a large part of the Patan population of Karachi does not even appear in the census. The Mohajers lack the inward migration of the Patans, and their higher level of education has also meant a lower birth rate than that of both the Patans and the Sindhis. Part of the explanation of the ruthlessness of the MQM can be explained by the perceived need to compensate for inexorable demographic decline by rigid political control, and by the fact that, in the words of one MQM activist, we cannot afford to give an inch, because we have our backs to the sea. The Sindhis have sinned, and the Patans can go back to their mountains, but we have nowhere but Karachi. The new influx of Sindhis and Patans displaced by the 2010 floods has increased this Mohajer fear still further. The break-off of East Pakistan in 1971 seemed to destroy the premise of Muslim nationalism on which Pakistan had been founded, in which most Mohajers had passionately believed, and for the sake of which they had sacrificed so much. Most had genuinely thought that the different ethnicities of Pakistan would merge themselves in one Urdu-speaking Muslim nation, though one in which those who had left their homes for Pakistan would have an especially distinguished place. The symbolic moment when Mohajers began to think of themselves as a separate nationality within Pakistan, rather than simply as the best Pakistanis, came in August 1979, when a young student activist, Altaf Hussein, burned a Pakistani flag at Jinnah's tomb in Karachi, after making a speech on Mohajer rights for which he was imprisoned and flogged by Ziaul Haq's military regime. He went on to found the Mohajer Kami Mahaz, Mohajer People's Movement, the political party that still dominates Karachi. The result was a growth in ethnic violence between Sindhis and Mohajers in Karachi and Hyderabad, language riots that split Karachi University, and the beginning of Mohajer organization along ethnic lines. Previously, the dominant party among the middle and lower middle class Mohajers had been the Jamat Islami, with its mixture of Islamist politics, anti feudalism, and Pakistani nationalism. The Jamat remains to this day strongly marked by its Mohajer middle class and urban origins. Strong Mohajer support for the protest movement against Bhutto's government, and for the military regime of Zia ul Haq that followed contributed further to Sindhi, Mohajer tension. Sindhi loyalty to the PPP, and dislike of the Punjabi-dominated army, made Sindh the center of opposition to Zia's rule. Extensive protests in interior Sindh in the early 1980s led to a military crackdown, in which some 1,500 people were killed. This is still described by Sindhi nationalist intellectuals, with gross exaggeration, as, a genocide of the Sindhi people. The movement was crushed, but left an enduring legacy of violent crime in interior Sindh, as fugitives from military law fled into the jungles to swell the bandit gangs of the region. Meanwhile, thousands of Sindhi PPP supporters were purged by Zia from the bureaucracy, and from the staffs of the state companies as these were reprivatized. Meanwhile Mohajer radical groups came together in the MQM, allegedly with covert support from Zia's regime and the ISI, which wished to strengthen opposition to the Sindhi PPP in the province. The first major ethnic violence in Karachi under Zia, however, was not Mohajer against Sindhi, but Mohajer against Patan. The start of a history of intermittent violence between these two communities which surfaced again during my stay in Karachi, in April 2009. As today, Mohajer resentment and fear of the Patans was fueled by cultural differences, 
by the Patan's grip on passenger and freight transport in the city, an ethnic monopoly often enforced by violence, and, above all, by a growth in Patan numbers and claims on public land. As today, this was due to a mixture of economic factors and war. The Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and the struggle against it sent some three million mainly Patan refugees into Pakistan, a proportion of whom made their way to join the Patan community of Karachi. With them came a great increase in the heroin trade, and in the number of automatic weapons in the city. In the 1970s, ethnic clashes in Karachi had been fought with knives, clubs, and the occasional pistol. By the late 1980s the combatants were equipped with Kalashnikovs and, sometimes, rocket, propelled grenades and light machine guns. The effect on the casualty figures can be imagined. The first major outbreak of violence came in April 1985, when a Mohajer schoolgirl, Bushra Zaidi, was killed by a speeding Patan driven minibus. This sparked murderous attacks by Mohajers and Punjabis on Patans, leaving at least 53 dead in all. Much of the violence was orchestrated by young activists of the student wing of the Jamat Islami, the Islami Jamat Aliba, though apparently without the approval of the party leadership. In the succeeding years, many of these activists, including the MQM's founder, Altaf Hussein himself, left the Jamati student groups to join the MQM. That party's origins lay among students of lower middle class origin. In this, it resembles the Jamat but is radically different from all the other major Pakistani parties, which were formed by rural or urban magnates. Altaf Hussein founded the MQM in 1984, and in August 1986 the party held its first mass rally, in Nishtar Park, at which he declared the Mohajers a separate nation within Pakistan. Already, the party's influence had spread so far that the rally was attended by hundreds of thousands of Mohajers. Pictures of Altaf Hussein addressing this crowd are central parts of MQM iconography. In the following years, hundreds more people were killed on all sides in ethnic violence. In 1987, the MQM defeated the Jamat, in what you could call a kind of matricide, given the Jamati origins of the MQM leadership, and swept to victory in local elections in both Karachi and Hyderabad, reigniting Sindhi fears of the Mohajers. By 1988, this Sindhi, Mohajer violence was also occurring on a large scale, with Sindhi extremist groups allegedly receiving covert help from RA, the research and analysis wing of the Indian Intelligence Service. Hyderabad was even worse affected than Karachi, and its neighborhoods became completely distinct ethnically as a result of what almost amounted to ethnic cleansing. Mohajers fled from the rest of the towns of Sindh, deepening the ethnic divide in the province still further. The MQM built up a powerful armed wing, which targeted not only Sindhi and Patan militants but journalists and others who dared to criticize the MQM in public. Torture chambers were established for the interrogation of captured enemies. Every morning would see its harvest dumped by the roadside, murdered activists from the various sides, or unlucky passers-by. By 1992, violence had grown so severe and was having such a bad effect on the economy of Pakistan's greatest city that, whatever its previous links to the MQM may have been, the army decided that basic order must be restored. First under Nawaz Sharif and then under the second administration of Benazir Bhutto, a tough crackdown was carried out. The operation proceeded in typical Pakistani fashion, through a mixture of ruthless force and diplomacy. On the one hand, the military, police, rangers and intelligence agencies made widespread use of torture and, in counter, killings against the militants. On the other hand, great effort was devoted to splitting the MQM. Radical elements, 
which thought the leadership was making too many compromises with other parties and ethnicities, were covertly encouraged to split off into the real MQM, which then launched ferocious attacks against its former comrades. The military, or rather the paramilitary rangers, which are under the command of the army, were then able to crush the extremists, while eventually making peace with the chastened MQM leadership, which was released from prison in return for promises to keep their men under control. Murders have continued, but at a greatly reduced rate, though the MQM Paton strife of 2009 to 2010 has led to fears that Karachi may return to the dark days of the early 1990s. The latest round of fighting began in May 2007, when the MQM, who had become close allies of President Musharraf, used their armed men to attack a rally to welcome Musharraf's arch-nemesis Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhry, triggering violence in which dozens were killed. Altaf Hussein had left Pakistan after an assassination attempt at the end of 1991, and ever since has lived in London. Like Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif during their periods of exile, but much more effectively, he maintains control over his party from a distance. Altaf Hussein is officially wanted by the Pakistani courts on charges including conspiracy to murder but he is also regularly visited by Pakistani politicians and officials, including in April 2009 by President Asif Ali Zardari. Despite its partial suppression by the state in the mid-1990s, the MQM has re-established an overwhelming grip on the government and politics of Karachi. However, its ability to use its dominance to develop the city is restricted by the very limited powers accorded to municipal government in Pakistan. Given that Karachi's demographic and economic structures are so different from those of the rest of Sindh, it would in fact make much more sense for Karachi to be a province of Pakistan, as in effect it was from 1947 to 1958 when it was Pakistan's capital and a separate federal district. This would, however, lead to extremely violent protests by Sindhis, which would worsen still further Pakistan's security problems and probably make civilian rule. Impossible, these protests would be both by the nationalists, who would see this as theft of Sindhi land, and by the landowner politicians and their followers, who would stand to lose a very large proportion of their powers of patronage, since Karachi accounts for less than half Sindh's population but around two-thirds of Sindh's GDP. Sindh and Karachi are therefore trapped in an unhappy but relatively stable marriage, held in place by a mixture of patronage and fear. The MQM dominates Karachi electorally and therefore usually has to be included in any coalition government of the province of Sindh, while Sindhi landowners and tribal chieftains dominate the rest of the province and milk Karachi's economy for their own benefit. These landowners are mostly PPP, but include a very large number of opportunists who switch sides depending on who is in power in Islamabad, which is why the military administrations of both Zia and Musharraf were able to attract enough Sindhi support to form coalition governments in Sindh. Karachi's Ethnic Frontlines The MQM's headquarters is known, with a kind of urban hipness, as 90, after the last two digits of the telephone number of Altaf Hussein's house where the party had its beginnings, and which is now preserved as a kind of shrine. It is in Azizabad, a typical middle-class Mohajar neighborhood and by both nature and design it breathes the particular MQM spirit. Like most of Karachi, the neighborhood itself is urban, in a way that most other Pakistani cities are not. In most cities, outside the downtown areas, the houses of ordinary people are one-story buildings of mud brick or concrete, not essentially different from those of villages, and often built around gated compounds while the houses of the rich are villas set in gardens. The general impression is of the country come to town, 
which given that most of the families moved from the countryside fairly recently, and keep close contacts with their relatives in the country, is literally true. Azizabad by contrast features taller, narrower but much more solid individual houses set next to each other, and small apartment blocks of four or five stories. Elsewhere in the city, though there are few tower blocks and no skyscrapers, big blocks of flats line the main roads. For blocks around the HQ are sealed off by security barriers, but, thanks to some PR person, the barrier through which I entered is brightly painted with fruit and flowers and a sign proclaiming, Street of Love and Peace. This was thanks to a concept by Husseini Electrics. Beside it, a large poster proclaimed that, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the founding of the MQM, the people of this area salute the great leader Altaf Hussein. Beyond it was a second security barrier, with electronically operated bollards embedded in the roadway. Getting in required a telephone call and an escort, all very far from the disastrously sloppy Pakistani norm. Opposite is a small, well-kept park, the Bagi Afsa, with a children's playground decorated with statues of giraffes and horses. The houses around were fairly shabby too, and three-story buildings, but in reasonably good shape, and there was very little rubbish on the streets. The MQM tries to keep its neighborhoods clean, that is very sacred for them, my assistant told me. White, green and red MQM flags were everywhere, interspersed with the black flags of the Shia, because a large Shia prayer hall is just down the road. The youth minister of Sindh, Faisal Sabzwari, took me to see Altaf Hussein's two rooms up, two down house, with its tiny sitting room, where Benazir Bhutto, Nawaz Sharif and any of the other leaders came to meet him and sat on this sofa. Behind is a small courtyard, with no garden, a million miles from the mansions of PPP, PML, N, and ANP leaders, but also, it must be said, from those of some contemporary MQM leaders I visited. The house now forms part of a headquarters complex including a media center where young volunteers monitored a bank of 30 television screens and manned a telephone switchboard. Mr. Sabzwari told me that they have a 24 terabyte computer storage facility, which we are going to double soon, an email server with 50,000 addresses, and a desktop TV editing machine for making films. From here, we try to monitor whatever is published or broadcast in Karachi and the world about us. Once again, the contrast with the amateurish and sometimes comical efforts of the other parties in this regard could hardly be more striking. In a nearby building, I interviewed the mayor of Karachi, Syed Mustafa Kamal, only 38 years old in 2009, but still older than the MQM's first mayor, Abdul Sattar, who was only 24 when he took office, and dressed for his age, in blue jeans and a checked shirt, with a closely cropped beard around his mouth and chin, in fact, he could have been a software manager in London. He sat with Mr. Sabzwari in a small plain office with peeling blue walls and the inevitable pictures of Altaf Hussein, rather remarkably modest for the mayor of the seventh largest city on earth. In fact, the only unprofessional thing about the mayor is that he talks so fast it is difficult to take everything in. Together with his deep melodious voice, and pounding delivery, the impression is rather of being addressed by a bass drum. He denounced the feudal leadership and character of the other parties, and spoke of the MQM as a progressive middle-class alternative for all Pakistanis. For the past 60 years, 40 families have ruled Pakistan. They have been re-elected seven times in one form or another, but in all that time they have never done anything for the people even on their own estates. They send their children to school in London, but they have never built a single school in their own villages. The MQM is the hope for the people of Pakistan, in which ordinary people will rule, 
and not these forty families. Concerning Karachi, his main refrains were his administration's commitment to building infrastructure, the hopelessness of the other parties in this regard, and the dysfunctionality of Pakistan's federal system, which left responsibility for the city's development and services in many different institutional hands, only some of them his. All our efforts are being undermined by the law and order situation, but I have no control over the police, not even the traffic police. So we build roads, and then we film the police holding up traffic and taking bribes along them. Much of this is true, by the way, even if not the whole truth. He continued. Karachi generates 68% of all the revenues of Pakistan, yet until we came to power, the city never had a master plan, even as its population grew to 18 million. So you can imagine the job facing me. 45% of neighborhoods never even had a service plan. Four out of five industrial zones had no water or sewage provision. Our aim has been not to develop Karachi so as to compete with the rest of Pakistan, but to make it internationally competitive, a far harder job. To achieve this, the first thing we need is world-class infrastructure. We have done more in four years than the other parties in 50, but I know very well that it is only a beginning. We have to struggle and struggle just to keep pace with the growing population. The MQM administration does indeed have a good reputation among independent observers and journalists in the city, and its achievements are visible, above all in the construction of new roads and flyovers to alleviate the previously dreadful traffic jams, in improvements to sewage and drainage which have reduced the flooding which used to follow the heavy rains, and in the creation of parks, the mayor's particular pride. Some of these projects were started under the Jamit administration that ruled after the MQM boycotted the first elections, under Musharraf, but then, the Jamit in Karachi is also very much a Mohajir middle-class organization. Desperately needed metro rail systems are planned, but their scale is beyond the constitutional competence of the municipal government and, as in Lahore. They are therefore held up in endless political infighting, battles over patronage, and bureaucratic lethargy at the levels of the Sindh and national governments. After the meeting with the mayor, I drove along one of his new motorways, a 13-kilometer-long, signal-free corridor, with underpasses for pedestrians and cross-traffic, and a belt of trees and greenery down the middle, once again. Not a remarkable road by Western or East Asian standards, but a very remarkable road for Pakistan, and a vast improvement on what was there before. This road also led me back from the mayor's optimistic vision to the other side of Karachi, and of the MQM, the ethnic violence which constantly threatens to tear the city apart. An MQM party worker, Nasir Jamal took me to see some of the scenes of the violence between Mohajers and Patans which had cost several dozen lives in previous days, and which the MQM was accused of having orchestrated. The tragic element to this is that the MQM and the leading Patan party, the ANP, were coalition partners at the time in both the national and the Sindh governments, and were also ideological allies against the tail ban. In the 2008 elections, the ANP for the first time won two provincial assembly seats in Karachi. This is not many out of 130 seats in the assembly, and they won no national assembly seats at all, but it seems to have severely rattled the MQM, which had got used to a monopoly of the Karachi seats. It was after this that MQM denunciations of the supposed tailban infiltration of the Patan community in Karachi really took off. The MQM also genuinely disapproved of ANP-sponsored peace deals with the tailban, and in the preceding months had warned with increasing vehemence of the alleged growth of tailban influence among the Patans of Karachi, 
something which ANP leaders denounced as a mere plot to seize Patan property and businesses, as the ANP leader in Karachi, Sayed Shahi, told me. While Taliban terrorism could certainly make the ethnic situation in Karachi worse, the tension between Patans and Mohajers in the city has other roots, which Nasir Jamal sketched for me as we drove through the northern suburbs. On either side, great grayish-white apartment buildings rose like castles, and, like castles, they were topped with fluttering banners, red, green and white for the MQM, red for the ANP, green, red and black for the PPP, and the sinister red flag of the GS Sindh Nationalist Party, with in the center a black hand holding a black axe, party flags which are also the badges of ethnic allegiance and which marked most of the apartment blocks as now inhabited by a single ethnicity. In between the apartment blocks were patches of wasteland with the occasional fine tree left over from the days when it was countryside, some of it covered in roughly built shanty towns, vehicle parks or impoverished-looking markets. This, Jamal said, was evidence of the way in which the Patans were encroaching on municipal and state land in the city. His words were a litany of standard MQM and Mohajer complaints about the Patans. Those ANP flags on that Kachi Abadi, shanty town, are to show that Patans have seized the land and will never let it go. The ANP seek to support every Patan, even Tailban, demand in order to claim a share in the government of the city. You see those trucks and buses over there, half blocking the road? When our government tried to get them to move to a proper vehicle park that we had built, they refused, because then they would be registered and would have to pay taxes. As it is, they use drugs gangs and other criminals to take over more and more property by force, then use the ANP to demand that the municipal government give them services for their new colonies, but pay no taxes. We are not against Patans, but we have to be against these illegal occupations because they are a threat to everybody. You see those fine new housing complexes over there? They were built for Urdu speakers but now they are empty because our people were threatened by the Patans and had to leave. And there are more and more Patans all the time. Patans are barely educated, and none of their women can read or write at all so their birth rate is very high compared to our educated women. I suggested that since the MQM and ANP were coalition partners and allies against the tail ban, and since after all the Patans were a large reality in Karachi which could not be removed, a compromise really should be possible, a deal whereby the MQM would agree to allocate the ANP certain municipal lands and apartment buildings for the Patans and a guaranteed share of political influence, through a certain number of seats in the provincial and national assemblies. Jamal replied in words that had become depressingly familiar to me from interviews with much more senior MQM figures, over the previous weeks. No, that is completely unacceptable. It would mean Mohajers paying taxes to build houses for them, who pay no taxes at all not because they can't but because they won't. We are ready for compromise, but it has to be on the basis of accepted principles, not just giving them shares. They would only demand a share in every project in the city. As to parliamentary seats, we have free and fair elections here, and they can stand for them and win them if they can. At this, I had to cover a smile given what I had heard about election rigging by MQM activists, and heard from journalists and analysts who in other ways admired the MQM as a party. The real reason for the MQM's intransigence seems to be that they feel that time and demographics are against them, and that if they give even an inch to the steadily growing Patan population they will end up losing control of Karachi altogether. Jamal took me to Zarina Colony, a Mohajer settlement in the shadow of the low hills that fringe northern Karachi, which had seen several deaths in the latest fighting. 
Mohajer and Patan fighters have repeatedly battled to control these insignificant hills, like a slow motion, low level urban gang version of the Battle of Ypres, and as the sky darkened, the MQM guards became visibly uneasy. As we entered the colony, we moved from Karachi to rural South Asia. Decrepit one story mud houses haphazardly lined the roads, and the street was dotted with heaps of rubbish. Looking up at the summit of the closest hill, I could see ANP flags against the sunset, the hill having been occupied by the rangers, however, when they stepped in to end the fighting. The crowd that met us seemed to have been carefully put together to blame the ANP and present the MQM case over the latest fighting and, as far as I could judge, some of their stories were highly exaggerated. To Jamal's embarrassment, however, they departed from script by admitting that their colony was illegal. We will be registering it very soon, he cut in. Many of them, like Jamal himself, were Urdu speakers who had fled Bangladesh in the 1970s, 25 years after most of the Mohajers, which helps explain why they were still unhoused. They grew silent and looked uneasily at each other and at Jamal when I asked if they were satisfied with the city government. Well, the local Nazim has done something, Bilquis, a fat, formidable-looking local woman replied. At least we have a sewage line now, which according to my nose was not sufficient, and we have been promised a water pipe. In one way, however, Zarina Colony was still Karachi, and not the rest of Sindh, in the way that the women like Bilquis pushed forward past their men to shout their complaints at me. In previous days, I had visited Patan areas to get their side of the story. Before the latest fighting, I saw Syed Shahi, the ANP president, at his home. Shahi is a self-made businessman who made a fortune in various enterprises after coming to Karachi in the 1970s, and had become a community leader. His luxurious home is decorated in eye-wateringly bad taste even by Pakistani standards, with a huge illuminated photograph of a Canadian lake dominating the glaringly lit, Quasirococo drawing room. Next to the drawing room is a large hudra, or traditional Patan male gathering place, set out in traditional style with cushions along the walls, a sign that, whether from culture or astuteness, Mr. Shahi remained close to his community roots. Indeed, he looks that way, with a small mustache set in an enormous face, craggy and extremely tough looking. His English is poor, and his son, who is studying in England to be a doctor and says he probably will stay there, had to translate for him. Syed Shahi said that his aim is to defend Karachi as place where all different peoples can live. He claimed that of these people, for million are Patan, which most people say is a gross exaggeration, though none of them can agree on what the real figure is. He complained bitterly that the MQM says that other peoples can come here, but in fact, they try to stop them from getting jobs, businesses, or an education. He said the ANP is against the tail ban, but that the MQM's warnings of tail ban penetration of Karachi are just an excuse to seize Patan land and business. Asked about ANP mobilization of the community. Mr. Shahi said that two weeks earlier his party had set up a ladies' wing. They will go to homes and register females to vote. We have never done this before because Pashtun women don't want to leave their homes or are not allowed to buy their husbands. Asked about social work and urban renewal, he didn't seem to understand what I was talking about. We can only do something like this once we are in power here. Only then can we set up NGOs. At the moment we are focused on getting access to education and government jobs for our people. In any case, most of our people are workers. They have no money, so can't do anything like this for themselves. The contrast with the MQM leadership could hardly have been more marked. 
The longer established middle class Patans of Karachi do, however, have a rather different face. After the fighting, I visited the ANP president for Eastern Karachi, Yunus Buner, who owns a smallish construction business and whose family has been in Karachi for three generations. His home is an apartment in a small block, with a hudra furnished with armchairs rather than cushions, and decorated with artificial flowers. A small, clean-shaven man with glasses and an urbane manner, he introduced with great pride his two English-speaking teenage sons. About the MQM however he was not polite. We would have won several more seats from Karachi, but in mixed areas like this one the MQM seized the polling stations with heavily armed gunmen. When I went to cast my own vote, the polling staff said that my vote had already been cast. That happened to thousands of our people, and there was nothing we could do about it, we would have been killed. We don't have enough weapons to fight with them. Whatever the MQM says, we are not armed the way Pashtuns are on the frontier, and the MQM have the whole administration, police, army and intelligence agencies to back them up. The police refuse even to register FERS, first information reports, see Chapter 3, against their men, while eleven of our men have been arrested. I am on the peace committee with MQM, ANP and PPP members to try to keep the peace, but in fact there is no point talking to the MQM politicians here about this, because they just deny everything and anyway don't control the killers. The MQM's armed wing is controlled by Altaf Hussein in London. As a businessman here, I want to keep the peace. I don't want a war that would destroy this city, but we won't accept this forever. If our businesses go on being burned, we will have nothing to lose, and then there could be an Afghan situation here." He bitterly denounced the tail ban, saying that his own relatives in Buner district of the NWFP had been targeted by them and he was helping refugees from there in Karachi, but that there were very few Taliban sympathizers in Karachi. Just because you are Pashtun and have a beard does not mean you are Taliban. The MQM are just using this to attack the ANP and Pashtuns in general. Mr. Buner took me to the ANP office for East Karachi, a rather astonishing building. It stands entirely alone on the furthest eastern edge of Karachi, in a desolate suburb which is just beginning to be developed, and is painted inside and out in the ANP color, bright red. The whole scene reminded me of something, and then I realized that it was scenes of Hollywood gangster films set in the 1920s or 30s, with dreary roadhouses and brothels standing alone in similarly half-empty suburbs. The recollection was so clear that I half expected Al Pacino and Robert De Niro to turn up. Which in a way they had. Above the door was a neat line of bullet holes from two days earlier. I was told that this was the third time the building had been shot up by MQM gunmen, though nobody had been wounded. Elsewhere, however, 13 ANP party workers had been killed in East Karachi in the first four months of 2009. They want to kill us all, one of the ANP men said. The bullet holes, however, seemed to me to tell a different story, of a warning not a murder attempt. If the MQM gunmen are as competent as the rest of their party, they are probably pretty good shots, and anyway, given the resources at their disposal, they could have destroyed the building and everyone in it, the more so as the ANP men did not appear to be armed. Neither Mr. Shahi nor Mr. Buner had heavily protected residences, and the MQM headquarters in East Karachi was not especially well defended. If these leaders really expected to be attacked, such negligence would be suicidal. It seemed to me, therefore, that rather than a war to the death, what was happening in Karachi in the first half of 2009 was a war of maneuver, part of the Pakistani, negotiated state, in which violence is part of the negotiations, 
always in the background, and sometimes in the foreground, but in which usually it is only a few pawns who get killed. The greatest risk of tailband terrorism in Karachi is that it will provoke the MQM into counterattacks which will then trigger an all-out struggle, in which the tailband will replace the ANP as leaders of the local Patans, and the MQM will use this Talibanization as an excuse to reduce the Patans to a completely subordinate status. However, as an official of the Pakistani Intelligence Bureau, IB, told me. The mood among the Patans in Karachi is very different from the mid-1980s when all this started, and there were huge riots with dozens or hundreds dead. Then, they believed all the old Patan stuff about how they are the bravest and the toughest and Mohajar city dwellers are cowards who won't fight. But the MQM taught them different, and gave them a very bloody nose. Today, Patan gunmen may clash with MQM gunmen, and pick off local MQM activists, but our analysis is that they'll be very careful about joining the tail ban and starting a full-scale war with the Mohajers, because they think they'd lose. And if they don't start a war, then the MQM will also basically tolerate them, just push them back from certain places, teach them a lesson now and then. The MQM also don't want all-out war that would wreck their city. For a great strength of the MQM is that like the Jamat, but unlike any other Pakistani party including the ANP, they do have a dream that goes beyond patronage for themselves and their supporters. Their weakness is that this dream is almost certainly unattainable. The dream is of Karachi as a Muslim Singapore on the Arabian Sea, modern, clean, orderly and economically dynamic ruled by a form of relatively mild and benevolent totalitarianism. And if Karachi were an independent island, the MQM and the people they represent would probably be both ruthless and able enough to achieve this dream. But of course Karachi is not an independent island. It is part of mainland Pakistan, and inextricably linked to the problems, and the peoples, of the rest of Pakistan. The danger is that the effort to maintain the MQM's vision and rule in Karachi in the face of the Patans and Sindhis, will feed the ruthless and chauvinist sides of the organization until its positive sides are drowned in the resulting bloodshed. Interior Sindh The extent to which Karachi differs from its immediate hinterland in Sindh is absolutely staggering. Even in a region of stark social and ethnic contrasts like South Asia, just as, beyond the city limits, the mayor's great motorway becomes the misnamed superhighway, between Karachi and Hyderabad, which is mostly a potholed two-lane country road. The bridge between these two worlds is the Sindhi Wadaro landowning class, tied to Karachi by its urban upper-class lifestyle and by the parliament and government of Sindh which Wade Rose dominate, and which are situated in Karachi. I asked a Sindhi journalist to explain the difference between a Wadaro and a non-Wadaro landowner. The answer came down yet again to kinship and hereditary prestige. A Wadaro has to have a lot of land, but he has to have other things as well. He has to be the leader of a tribe, or from a peer family, and here in Sin the family has to be an old one if he wants real respect. He has to have gunmen and dacoits working for him, and to play a role in politics. Otherwise, no matter how much land he has, he's just a big farmer. I have met a considerable number of Waidros during various travels in Sindh. The Anarchons, tribal chiefs and politicians from northern Sindh, are not part of my acquaintance, though as the testimonies below indicate, I am sure they are perfectly splendid people. I did however meet a variety of their dependents during my travels in Sindh, and these meetings provided a frame for the world that the Unar Khans represent. Of these encounters, the last was in some ways the most striking because a statement of loyalty and respect that could have taken place 500 years ago was in fact delivered, 
in the modern surroundings of Karachi Airport, and by a man in a quintessentially modern service. The other places in the airport cafe being full, I asked if I could share the table of a middle-aged, balding man in the uniform of an official of Pakistan International Airlines. With typical hospitality, he offered me a share of his pudding, and asked about my travels in Pakistan. When I mentioned the Anars, his eyes lit up. The Anars are good people. They are a small tribe, but more powerful than all the other tribes put together because they are the bravest and help each other. If one of them is in trouble, all the others come together to help, with guns, people, money, whatever is necessary. Everyone knows that they are very generous, very loyal to their friends. They have done so much for my own family. My PIA interlocutor grinned slightly, but made no comment. When I mentioned my previous indirect encounter with the Anars, a few days earlier, I had gone to a police station in Clifton, Karachi, to meet an officer known as an encounter specialist. In other words, a policeman tasked with the extrajudicial execution of prisoners. A youngish man was sitting on the floor with his hands together to one side, closer examination revealing that they were in fact chained to the barred window frame. His face was lean and gloomy, but also composed and even dignified despite his position, and what must have been some well-based fears as to what was going to happen to him. The policeman told me that he was a member of a notorious dacoit gang from Larkana, picked up in Karachi on a tip-off, in return for a reward of 100,000 rupees. According to the police, he had been a bodyguard of the Anar Khans. The police, and journalists whom I asked about the Anars, also spoke of their courage, though they often added other words as well. Visiting Sin twenty years earlier, I had been told in admiring tones how Ghulam Ishak Khan Anar elected in 1988 for the PPP, had had three men from a rival family killed in revenge after his brother was shot down in a family feud in Larkana Bazaar, in 1986. A senior policeman in Sukkur told me on that occasion, Half the people here are protecting dacoits. So what do you do? You try to round them up, and if they are killed, fine and if you can keep them behind bars, also fine. And if a minister or politician turns up and tells you to release them, well, relax and enjoy, what else is there to do? This isn't England. You have to accept these things. A week or so before my meeting with the dacoit in Karachi, I had been outside the front gate of one of the Anar Khan's residences in the village of Bakrani on the road between Larkana and Mohenjo-Daro. The area was festooned with flags of the PML, Q, party, which the Anar Khan family was currently supporting, and a large concrete arch at the entrance to the estate commemorated the late patriarch of that family, a PML, Q, member of parliament who had died recently. His son, Altaf Hussein Khan Anar, had succeeded to his father's land and his political role. The PML, Q, was the King's Party set up by General Musharraf to bolster his administration, on the basis of defectors from Nawaz Sharif's Muslim League. It had no popular or traditional roots in Sindh at all, but, like other past parties of the same kind, did not initially need them because it could always attract to its ranks by a variety of promises landowner politicians like the Anar Khans. Of 18 people I spoke to in the village, all but four said that they had voted and would vote for the PML, Q, for a reason about which they were entirely candid, this is the village of Anar Sahib. His house is just over there. We vote how our Wadaro says, because we are his people. He gives us everything, so we follow him, as Nazar Sheikh, a carpenter, told me. As I sat in the cafe in the gleaming surroundings of Karachi Airport, I thought back to this scene, 
in a dusty village of mud houses which seemed little changed from those of Mohenjo-daro, two worlds apparently so utterly different, but linked by invisible but immensely strong links of kinship and patronage. Hunting boar and leading tribes the purpose of the first days of my journey to interior Sindh was not supposed to be politics, but then, in the world of Pakistani landowners, as in that of their English equivalents in the past, everything is in fact politics, including deaths, births and above all marriages, and hunting parties, which was what this particular trip was about. Sardar Mumtaz Ali Bhutto uncle of Benazir Bhutto and hereditary chief of the Bhutto tribe, had invited me to a hunt for wild boar, organized in a patch of jungle on the banks of the Indus by a landowning family called Koshk, Wadros of a village of that name. Mumtaz Ali Bhutto was providing most of the dogs, for the breeding of which he is famous, and the huntsmen. The Sardar's love of animals can take some curious forms. As our vehicle passed an emaciated, exhausted-looking horse pulling an overloaded cart, he told me how unhappy such sights make him, sometimes, if I see a man beating his horse and donkey, I will stop the car, get out and give him a beating instead. Since kindness to animals is not much of a South Asian tradition, this must be one of the more interesting combinations of British attitudes to animals and Sindhi feudal attitudes to people. Like fox hunting in Britain, wild boar hunting in Pakistan is a matter of pure sport, since in a Muslim country the animals cannot be eaten by the hunters. The carcasses are thrown to the dogs or given to one of the remaining groups of low caste, formerly tribal Hindus who live along the industry. I was offered one myself, but declined, because driving around interior sinned like a motorized obelix, with an enormous putrefying pig tied to the roof of my car, while it would undoubtedly have attracted attention, would probably not have contributed to my prestige. As was the case for millennia in Europe, hunting is an important means of maintaining connections and forging new bonds among the landowner politicians in Sindh. Hunting in Sindh twice played a part in the rise of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, once in 1955 when President Iskandar Mirza brought General Ayub Khan to Larkana to hunt and introduced Bhutto to him, once in January 1971 when a joint duck shooting trip with President Yahya Khan helped bring them together in the moves, which led to the horrible events surrounding Bangladeshi independence. I had wanted to go on a boar hunt ever since I had had to turn down an invitation in southern Punjab in 1989, despite the incentive added by my host that two local landowning families were covertly at odds and might use the occasion to shoot each other rather than the boar. No such possibility was present on this latter occasion, if only because it turned out that the boar were to be hunted not with guns, but with spears. At this news, my joy at being invited to this absolutely quintessential, futile, event was rapidly overtaken by the comical mental image of myself holding a spear, and the less comical one of my doing so while facing a large and understandably irritated boar. However, I needn't have worried. Only one huntsman carried a spear, to deliver the coup de grace after the boar had been brought down by the hounds. The rest of us were spectators, with a very slight chance of becoming participants if the boar charged us directly. As perhaps in hunting for sport everywhere, the quarry on this occasion seemed in part an excuse for getting up early in the morning to see the countryside at its best, and the countryside of Sindh in early summer is definitely at its best at dawn and not at midday. The sun popped up through the mist as a pale disk looking much more like the moon, and for a while it was blissfully impossible to imagine the dreadful heat of a few hours later. The dogs, so I was told, were a variety of lurcher, a cross between greyhounds and bull terriers, with ugly, formidable heads but graceful bodies. Each couple of hounds was held in leash by a huntsman, 
all three of the group looking with raised heads and fixed attention into the jungle, the huntsmen seeming to quiver with eagerness along with the dogs. The huntsmen, mostly young, looked intensely proud at being responsible for such splendid animals, and in the service of so splendid a lord as Sardar Mumtaz Ali Bhutto. They also looked markedly better fed than the ragged peasantry who provided the beaters. And indeed there was no pretense of egalitarianism about this hunt. As the guest of honor and provider of the dogs and huntsmen, Mumtaz Ali Bhutto sat directly facing the jungle. His younger son Ali and I sat some distance behind. Everyone else was firmly to one side. However, in the subcontinent hierarchical organization is always only a step or so away from anarchy, whether cheerful or malignant, and it was certainly no proof against the mass excitement when the boar broke cover. This was especially so when one enterprising beast plunged into the Indus, pursued to the bank, and nearly over it, by a mob of yelling huntsmen and spectators, stirring the powdery dust into a maelstrom. Halfway over, a fishing boat tried to head it off, and a fisherman, whether overcome by excitement or in hope of a reward, actually dived into the river, grasped the boar round its neck, and guided it back to shore, a sight to remember. On reaching land, it shook him off indifferently along with the water and disappeared into the jungle. For more boar succeeded in outrunning the dogs and knocking over or shaking off those that came close so that in the end the entire bag for some five hours of hunting was one medium-sized female, which shows that the boar had a sporting chance. The patches of jungle like the one in which we hunted are the remains of the great Chicago's noble hunting reserves, of the past. They consist of low scrub and tall grasses, fertilized annually by the water and silt brought down by the melting of the Himalayan snows, and by the monsoon. This is the original natural cover of the Indus Valley before human cultivation. In the past, and very likely in the future too, the ferocity of the floods and the frequently changing course of the river meant that the riverine areas themselves could not be cultivated, and so were never registered for ownership and taxation. Canals and dams have to a large extent reduced this threat and landowners in recent decades have illegally encroached on the riverine areas, greatly increasing their wealth in the process, but still paying no tax. However, some patches of jungle still remain, used as hunting reserves for boar and deer, and as the favorite hideouts of bandits, though whether with the knowledge and protection of the Wade Rose, as is universally believed, I cannot say. One feature of the boar hunt, however, which I hardly noticed at the time, because it is so much a feature of the life of the rural nobility that you forget about it, was the bodyguards with their Kalashnikovs, not because most of the time there is any expectation that they will be needed, but as an insurance policy, and also of course as a source of prestige. Not that Mumtaz Ali Bhutto apparently needed much to boost his prestige. The ancestral home in Mirpur Bhutto is one of the most magnificent that I have visited in rural Pakistan. More than 150 years old, it is also an example of how far local architecture has fallen since the days of the British, let alone the days of the Mughals. The old aristocratic architecture is not just beautiful, but efficient. The tall ceilings and ventilation windows make it habitable even during electricity cuts, when modern rooms become unendurable without fans or air conditioning. The drawing room contains a throne-like silver chair on which the Sardar's grandfather was inaugurated, and a family tree which shows only male members, thereby omitting Benazir Bhutto. Beside the front gate is the exquisite 18th-century mausoleum of a family saint. In front of the house, facing a garden with the inevitable lawn for political meetings, an open hall between columns provides a space where the Sardar holds court, with his two sons sitting on either side of him and his steward standing respectfully to one side. Before him, 
a variety of petitioners appear to touch his feet and wait with hands clasped, as if in prayer, to receive an order or a judgment. Having received it, most sit to one side for a longer or shorter period to show respect, and by their presence and numbers help boost their lord's prestige. The morning that I was a witness seemed fairly typical and was almost identical to an audience by Mumtaz Ali Bhutto on the same spot when I had visited him twenty years before. Sharecroppers and local in-charges received orders for planting crops. Participants in a land dispute were told to stop work on the land pending a decision, and two sheepish-looking peasants received a sharp response, tried to argue, and were sent packing by one of the gunmen. They are sharecroppers of a neighboring landowner, Amir Butto told me. He took away their land for various reasons and they have come to us for help getting it back. But this man is our political rival and they have always voted for him. So my father said, you never came to me in the past, you voted for my opponent. What can I do to help you? He is in another party and not in my influence, 168. When the circumstances are right, such discussions are often the prelude to a change of allegiance, or to new bargaining based on the threat of it. All over rural Sindh, and much of the rest of Pakistan as well, such scenes happen every day. The basic stuff of Pakistani politics, though rarely played out against such a magnificent background. Feudal domination. One very proud member of a Wadaro family, but a highly educated one with an M.A. from Cambridge, was scathing about his fellow feudals. The Sardars in Sindh are changing, but not as fast as they should. Many are not interested in education. They don't think it helps them to run their estates or manage politics. So even the children of the bigger landowners are often surprisingly uneducated, and that of course also means that they don't understand new agricultural techniques and have no idea or interest in any kind of wider development or improvement beyond traditional charity. And because they dominate politics and government, that means that sin society in general is also changing very slowly. Local journalists in the nearby town of Larkana recounted for me a litany of recent actions by feudals in their region. One, a local chieftain, had been using his gunmen and dacoits to seize packets of land from small farmers, people without links to feudals and from weak tribes. He was protected from police retaliation, I was told, because his brother was a provincial minister from the PPP. A much worse case involving local chieftains and PPP politicians will be recounted in the next chapter, on Balakistan. During the floods of 2010, landlord politicians in western Sindh were credibly accused of opening local barges so that the flood waters would spare their lands, and inundate those of rivals. I asked the Larkana journalists how Sindhi society and economy had changed over the past 20 years. There was a very long pause. Not much, one said. Another said that there was now more education. In the industrial sector, they mentioned a considerable growth of small rice processing units, with 200 to 300 of these in Larkana district alone. But then their remarks quickly turned to complaints about monopolization and price, rigging by the rice processors in league with the central bureaucracy in Islamabad. Of the state industrial plants set up by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto to benefit his home district and since privatized, the textile mill has collapsed and been sold off for scrap, because of corruption and bad management. The sugar mill, I was told, operate seasonally, but it looked quite derelict when I passed it. Local people blame non-PPP governments for lack of support, but private management has also failed. In other words, yet another tale of third-world estate-led industrial development which failed to take root. 
People in Larkana told me that the PPP-led government, which took power in 2008 had started a few road-building projects in Larkana, but that their main help to the town and district had been to create thousands of new jobs in the local bureaucracy, police, health and education systems and distribute them to their supporters. This pleased most of the people I talked to, because, Jobless people who were ignored by governments for the past 12 years have been given jobs. Some are from my village, as Ghulam Abbas, a farmer, told me. However, when asked if the newly appointed people were qualified for these jobs he did not even to pretend that this was the case. When a new government comes to power, these useless jobs will either be abolished, or, more likely, redistributed to their own followers, leaving the area with absolutely nothing in terms of real development. For there is nothing unique to the PPP about this. G. M. Morai, who runs a Sindhi television channel in Hyderabad, told me. Education is the only thing that can produce a bigger Sindhi middle class, but this is happening only very slowly. Sindhi education was put in the doldrums by Zia ul Haq, and since his time it has been the plaything of the Waitrose. Most of the teachers have been appointed by local Wateroo politicians from among their relatives and followers. Most have no training at all. Our whole education system is terribly backward. In 1999, I still did not know how to use a computer because there was nowhere in Hyderabad to learn. That has changed, but much more. Slowly than it should have. This also means that most of our politicians have no real education and no administrative or technocratic skills. All they can do is make speeches. The PPP has always been the biggest party in Sindh, but they reward loyalty and courage not ability. Of course, it's admirable to have gone to jail for five or ten years under Zia or Musharraf, but it doesn't make you a good minister. Certainly Larkana, which given the PPP's periods in government should be one of the most developed towns in interior Sindh, is not visibly different from the others. A mass of higgledy-piggledy brick and mud houses with barely paved roads and heaps of uncollected rubbish. In the center of one busy road was a frightful sight, what appeared to be a heap of rags was in fact a squatting beggar, inviting death and alms at the same time, with cars swerving to avoid him. Existential threats? On the whole, most Sindhis seem not unhappy with the existing social order, and that also seems true of the middle classes, such as they are. Like my Pakistan Airlines acquaintance, if they condemn Waitrose in general, they are very often attached to one Wateroo family in particular, or to a peer family which plays the same role. Outside some of the small radical nationalist groups, demands for land reform are extremely rare. The potentially disastrous element in all this, however, is that in two respects Sindh is not in fact static. The population is growing ever bigger, largely because of the lack of education for women, and the water is ever diminishing, largely because the people are too uneducated, apathetic, conservative, divided along tribal lines and distrustful of one another and of the authorities to improve their agriculture, or build their own local water infrastructure. If this goes on, and is not reversed by increased monsoon rains due to climate change, there is a real chance that Sindh one day will cease to exist as an area of large-scale human habitation. One should, however, think twice about advocating a revolution against the Waitros. In the first place, it is by no means certain that a ruling class made up of the wealthier peasants would be any more progressive economically or culturally. Certainly those more enterprising Waitrose whom I met complained constantly about the blind conservatism of their tenants and workers, very much in the fashion of Russian 19th-century landowners, though there is doubtless a self-serving element in their complaints. Secondly, 
the Waidros are by far the most important barrier against a Sindhi nationalism which, if given free reign, would not only destroy Pakistan, but plunge Sindh itself into ethnic conflict that would tear the province apart and wreck any hope of progress. The Waidros are not attached to Pakistan by affection, with the exception of the Buddhos. Even Wadaro members of the PML, N, whom I met, in other words, members of a Punjabi-led party, spent much of their time complaining about Punjabi domination and exploitation. Rather, the Waidros are attached to the Pakistani state by ties of patronage, circulated and recirculated through the feudal landowning elite by changes of government in Islamabad. In turn, as my experiences with the Anar Khans demonstrate, the Waidros then circulate this patronage and protection downwards through society, small shares, but enough to help them go on dominating that society. This charge of national treason for the sake of patronage is precisely the charge made against the Wadaro class by nationalist parties, like G.S. Sindh, but even G.S. Sindh's former leader, G.M. Sayed was persuaded by General Zia's administration to modify his hostility to Pakistan by the offer to his son of a pilot's job, with Pakistan Airlines. A movement against the Waidros would have to be a middle-class one, and its ideology would inevitably be Sindhi nationalist. My meetings with Sindhi intellectuals in Hyderabad were not encouraging as to the likely character of that nationalism. Like their East European equivalents in the past, their principal occupations appear to be folklore, nationalistically colored religion, in this case, Sindhi Sufism, and what might be described as folkloric historiography, an approach now extended from the glorious past of the Indus Valley civilization and the Talpers to the martyrs of the Buddha dynasty. These have a huge gallery devoted to them in the Folklore Museum of Hyderabad University where you pass from the exquisite traditional embroidery of Sin to Zulfikar Ali Budo's worshipfully preserved socks. With rare exceptions, repeated attempts on my part to discuss social, economic and ecological issues with Sindhi intellectuals led to a few platitudinous statements of concern, followed by a rapid reversion to the eternal topics of Mohajar and Punjabi exploitation of Sindh. The eventual collapse of Pakistan was taken as a given by most of them, but very few had thought seriously as to what would come next, beyond a wonderful independent Sindhi national existence in the most fertile part of Asia, as Sindh was repeatedly described to me. If all this was depressingly familiar from conversations in Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union before their collapse, even more depressing was the light-hearted way in which a number of people on all sides talked of forthcoming ethnic war. The landowner brother of a PPP member of parliament described Sin's prospects to me as follows. We are a peace-loving people, but if you look at our history, we are also the greatest fighting people in Pakistan, and we have the Patans and Baloch on our side. I tell you that if there is war with the Mohajers, Sindhis may receive the first blow, but then we will kill the Mohajers like rats. They will be like the Jews in World War II, hiding in cellars and being hunted down. And in any case, Karachi could not live a week without Sin's food and water. Hearing this, I remembered similarly vainglorious words the previous week from a Mohajer doctor in Karachi, if Pakistan breaks up the Mohajers would conquer the whole of Sindh in a week and take their water. These Waidros and their slaves will never fight. All this recalls an old German proverb, he who speaks like this, also shoots. At the moment, however, all this remains just ugly talk. The leaderships of the various parties, the Wadaro class in the interior, and the businessmen of Karachi all know how much they have to lose from the disintegration of Pakistan. The tragedy of interior Sindh therefore does resemble that of some of the former communist states. The revolution it so desperately needs would also spell its destruction. 
Thus I remember Sindhi nationalists declaring back in 1989 how there would soon be a war to the death against the Mohajers. A debauched and repulsive younger member of the Sumro clan told me, we have only one choice. Either we lose Sindh or we kick those bloody bastard Mohajers into the sea. But twenty years on, no war to the death has occurred. And he was the least impressive nephew of a couple of pretty formidable brothers whom I met, both of them proud Sindhis but also completely pragmatic individuals who continue to draw patronage from the Pakistani state, which in Sindh, as elsewhere, has somehow managed to stumble on. 9. Balakistan. Might was right in days gone by and the position of the party aggrieved was the principal factor in determining the price to be paid for blood, hence the compensation for a mullah, a said or a person belonging to a leading family was ordinarily double that for a tribesman. The ordinary rate of compensation, for a death, at present among the Jamalis, Gaulis and Kosas is a girl and two hundred rupees, Amranis, a girl and 200 rupees or 1,500 rupees if no girl is given. District Gazetteers of Balakistan, 1906 Quetta is a garrison town in an oasis, on a high desert frontier. Windblown dust is everywhere, covering the world with a fine, gritty film, and turning the coarse grass and dry shrubs to a uniform gray so that from the air it sometimes seems as if you are flying over the moon. Every now and again, whirlwinds stir the dust up into looming towers, which spread out and fall again in a stinging gray rain. At the end of the broad, straight streets of the cantonment, bare tawny mountains rise against the hard blue sky. In summer, the sun burns with a searingly dry heat. In winter, it is freezingly cold. The kepis of the Foreign Legion would not feel out of place here, and as for the solotopes of the British Raj, well, they built the place. Their dead rest in the bleak, windswept Christian cemetery on the outskirts of the cantonment. Many of them are from the Welch Regiment, which served in Quetta in what seemed to have been the especially unhealthy years of 1905 and 1906. By an odd chance, both the Welsh when they were conquered by the English and Indians when they converted to Christianity often took Christian names as their surnames. So Private William Hughes rests beneath the carved ostrich feathers of his regiment next to Martin Williams, a Punjabi Christian clerk. Pairs of old British cannon and mountain guns stand outside the gates of the Pakistani generals who have succeeded them and many of the challenges that those guns were dragged on to this high plateau to face continue to face those Pakistani generals, though in new forms. But Quetta, like Ugadugu or Fort Lamy, is today a garrison town with elephantiasis. For reasons that will appear, people in Balakistan are even vaguer about figures than in the rest of Pakistan. But the general assumption is that Quetta has between 2 million and 2.5 million people, almost a quarter of Balakistan's sparse population. It contains not just the government and the military headquarters, but the vast majority of Balakistan's institutions of higher education and almost the whole of whatever little the province has of manufacturing industry. Like so many colonial creations, Quetta sometimes seems like a ship moored to the land on which it sits, rather than growing from it. Its ethnic mixture, its economy and its official and commercial architecture all differ radically from those of Balakistan as a whole, and have always done. According to the census of 1901, there were more speakers of European languages, mostly British soldiers and their families, in Quetta than there were speakers of the local languages, Baloch, Brahwi, and Patan. The biggest number of inhabitants consisted of Punjabis, followed by Urdu speakers. The city used to be known to its educated inhabitants as Little Paris. This is about as staggering a statement as one could well imagine, and not one that I would like to make in Paris itself 
except perhaps to a Roman frontier official in Lutetia Parasorum 2,000 years ago, who might have seen some similarities. The notion of Quetta as Paris certainly brings home the distance between most of Quetta and the rest of Balakistan. Outside Quetta begins the world which Quetta was built to quell and hold at bay, the world of the tribes. Drive out along the Seriab Road, and, between the edge of the city and the ridges that fringe the Quetta Valley, you find yourself amid villages of yellow gray mud, which from the outside could be the first human towns of the Middle East 12,000 years ago. Regular driving on the Seriab Road is not, however, a good idea these days. This is the poor Baloch area of Quetta, where the patrols of the Frontier Corps clash nightly with Baloch nationalist militants, quite apart from the threat of common or garden banditry and kidnapping. The tribal frontier is now within the boundaries of the garrison city, just as the tribal leaders sit in the government buildings of the cantonment. On August 11, 2009, on which day the militants had vowed to hold their own Baloch Independence Day. I drove out on the Seriab Road with the Frontier Corps in a flag march, an old British tradition which is exactly what it says it is. The soldiers hoisted large Pakistani flags on their jeeps and armored cars and drove slowly up and down the road, and around the outskirts of the city. I asked an officer what all this was for to show everyone that we are still here, and no one is going to push us out," he replied. More specifically, the Frontier Corps was there to tear down any Baloch nationalist flags, which pro-independence parties had sworn to fly on that day. So beside the tribes, around them, and watching them from without and within sits another power in the land, the Pakistan Army. Flexible, pragmatic, restrained most of the time, but implacably determined that in the end, and in all essential matters, it will should prevail. However, since 2001, Balakistan has been menaced from another direction, the overspill of the war in Afghanistan, which has brought the Afghan tailban to the Patan areas of Balakistan, and Patans make up as much as 40% of Balakistan's population, and are a majority in Quetta itself. According to U.S. intelligence, much of the Taliban leadership itself, grouped in the so-called Quetta Shura, was still based in Balakistan in late 2009. So far, this hasn't been bad for Balakistan. On the contrary, the Afghan Taliban seem to have struck a deal with the Pakistani security forces, whereby they will not stir up militancy among the Patans of Balakistan, in return for being left alone. Given Pakistan's problems with Baloch militancy, Islamabad considers it especially important to keep the Patans of Balakistan loyal. This is an additional reason for the shelter that Pakistan gives to parts of the Afghan Taliban leadership in Balakistan. Until early 2007, local journalists told me. The presence of these leaders was so open that it was very easy for Pakistanis, not Westerners, to gain interviews with them. Since then, however, U.S. pressure has made Pakistan more careful, and the Quetta Shura has been moved out of Quetta to more discreet locations in the Patan areas in the north of the province. The Afghan Taliban's presence risks provoking the U.S. into launching the kind of cross border attacks that have been going on for years in Fatah to the north, and there is also the risk that U.S. and British military actions in southern Afghanistan will lead to a major influx of Taliban fighters into Pakistani Balakistan. This could well be disastrous for the province. If the Patans of the province are stirred up against the Pakistani state, their latent tensions with the Baloch would also be awakened above all concerning who should rule Quetta itself. Baloch nationalists who say that an independent Balakistan would be prepared to let the Patan areas break away to join a new Balakistan fall very silent when you ask them what then would happen to Quetta. With Patans against Pakistan and Baloch, and other Patans, 
and Baloch against Patans, Pakistan and Iran, and other Baloch, and Hazaras and others caught in the middle, that would have all the makings of a really unspeakable mess. Disputed History, Disputed Population Balakistan is closely linked to the Sindh of the previous chapter, indeed, as previous chapters made clear, many Sindhis and southern Punjabis are in fact from Baloch tribes, which retain their tribal loyalties and much of their tribal way of life. Like the Sindhis, the Baloch tribes worship saints and shrines, and most have so far been impervious to the appeals of modern radical Islamist thought. Neither the Islamist political parties nor the Taliban have made any serious inroads among the ethnic Baloch. There does however seem to be some Baloch support for the anti-Shia Saipa'i Sahaba movement, which has carried out savage terrorist attacks on the Shia Hazara community in Quetta. Balakistan is both much bigger and much smaller than Sindh, in fact it is both the biggest and smallest of Pakistan's provinces. With 134,000 square miles and some 43% of Pakistan's land area, it is by far the biggest in terms of territory. With only some 9 to 11 million people and around 7% of Pakistan's population, it is by far the smallest in terms of people. Until 2010, the Pakistani central state allocated its support to provincial budgets according to population resulting in a very small share for Balakistan. By the new National Finance Commission award of that year, however, the allocation was rebalanced to take account of poverty and revenue generation. This meant that Balakistan's share went up from 7% to 9.09%, around 50% above Balakistan's share of Pakistan's population. This was not nearly enough to satisfy more radical Baloch nationalists, but increased Pakistan's appeal to more moderate Baloch. The contrast between territory and population largely shapes Balakistan's particular situation and problems. Balakistan's huge territory is home to the greater part of Pakistan's mineral and energy resources, with the colossal exception of the Dhar coal fields of Sindh. Its tiny population means that it has little say in Pakistani national politics and little control over how its huge resources are developed. Up to now, Baloch grievances have centered on the gas fields, of which the biggest are around Sway in Bugdi tribal territory, which provide around a third of Pakistan's energy. Disputes over benefits from the field for the local tribal population sparked the latest Baloch insurgency. In future the giant copper mine under development at Reko Dik in western Balakistan may also be a fertile source of anger. Plans have long been under consideration for two great overland energy corridors taking Iranian, Turkmen and Persian Gulf oil and gas across Pakistan. The first would go to India to feed India's rapidly growing economy. Should a settlement between India and Pakistan ever permit this to be built, much of it would cross Balakistan. This would give Baloch militants great new opportunities for pressure on the Pakistani government, but, on the other hand, it would also give India a strong incentive to withdraw its support from those militants. Another energy pipeline is already being built by China from Iran through Pakistan and across the Himalayas, along the route of the famous Karakoram Highway. It is intended to help China to escape the threat of blockade of its seaborne energy routes by the U.S. or Indian navies. The great new port of Gwadar which China built at General Musharraf's request in southwestern Balakistan as part of what has been called China's string of pearls strategy in the Indian Ocean, near the entrance to the Persian Gulf, is intended as the starting point of that route. Gwadar could in future be of great benefit to the province in terms of Pakistani trade not only with China but with Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia and India. Together with the road from Karachi through Quetta to Afghanistan, 
Gwadar makes Balakistan of great strategic importance as a supply route to the Western forces fighting in Afghanistan. So far, however, the development of Gwadar has only led to bitter Baloch nationalist complaints that non-Baloch are being settled in Quetta, and that ethnic Baloch are not benefiting from the port. Pakistani officials retort that the local tribesmen in fact sold their land for a great profit, and are living off the proceeds. As so often in Pakistan, objective truth on this seems impossible to determine. The ethnic Baloch are certainly the least developed and least privileged of all Pakistan's ethnic groups, or, at least, they are when they stay in Balakistan. Elsewhere, as noted, Baloch tribes which moved hundreds of years ago to Sindh and southern Punjab have provided a range of leading Pakistani politicians, including two presidents, Sardar Farooq Khan Lagari and the present incumbent, as of 2010, Asif Ali Zardari. This, however, has done almost nothing to benefit Balakistan itself. Great dams, gobberbands, from previous eras attest to the presence of civilizations long ago, but since the last round of climate change, Balakistan's desert soil has not generated its own civilization. Instead, poverty has mixed with tribal tradition to keep the Baloch poorly educated and unable to participate fully in the economy, administration and development of their own province. This has been left to other ethnicities, who are then blamed by the Baloch for exploiting them. Radical Baloch nationalists see their nation almost as the Red Indians of the American West. In the middle decades of the 19th century, their territory dotted with mining camps and patches of alien settlement guarded by the forts of the U.S. cavalry, and in imminent danger of ethnic swamping and extinction. This is exaggerated, and for most of their problems the Baloch have their own culture and social structures to blame. It is true, however, that they have been dealt a rather poor hand by modern history, and that they have not generally been treated with vision or generosity by Pakistani governments. Baloch legends say that they originally moved into their present territories from the Middle East. Modern nationalism by contrast has sought to claim that they have lived where they are now for thousands of years. One very curious feature suggests that some of them at least may in fact have been around for that long. The fact that the Baloch are divided between two different languages, the main one being of Indo-European origin like those of all the surrounding peoples, but the smaller, Brahui, or Bruhi, being largely Dravidian, which is the language group of southern India, and, so it is presumed, of the Indus Valley civilization. The Baloch, since records began, have been divided into several dozen tribes. At various times either outside empires or local princes exercised a loose hegemony over some of these tribes. In the late 15th century, the leader of one such short-lived tribal confederation, Mir Chakar, chieftain of the Rhine tribe, 1487-1511 CE, briefly conquered parts of Punjab and Sindh, laying the basis for large-scale Baloch migration into those lands. However, the principality which Baloch nationalists regard as the historic Baloch national state was that of Kalat founded in 1638 around another oasis like that of Quetta, fed by two natural springs, now dry because of tube wells and the radical sinking of the water table. The British arrived in the region in the 1830s, and from 1839 to 1847 fought a fierce war with the Bugdi tribe, which in many ways prefigured the present Pakistani war with the Bugdi that began in 2005. In 1876, the British frontier official Sir Robert Sandman signed a treaty with the Khan bringing Kalat and its dependent territories, under British suzerainty. According to the Pakistan state, this placed Kalat in the same position as the other princely states of British India, which after 1947 were voluntarily or involuntarily annexed to India or Pakistan. 
Baloch nationalists, however, claim that the relationship with the British Empire was closer to that of the British Protectorate of Nepal, which after 1947 became an independent state. There seems a good deal of truth in this, but, so far, the Pakistani army has been in a position to rule on this question. The British put together the territories of what is now the Pakistani province of Balakistan for geographical, administrative and security reasons, but out of historically and ethnically disparate elements. In fact the province is almost as much of an artificial creation as Pakistan itself. Moreover, just as was the case with the Patans and Afghanistan to the north, the British drew a frontier with a neighboring state which cut the ethnic Baloch lands in two, dividing them between the British Empire of India and the Persian Empire to the west, with a small number in the deserts of Afghanistan to the north. Baloch nationalists today claim a large chunk of Iran as part of the Greater Balochistan that they hope to create thereby guaranteeing the undying hostility of the Iranian as well as the Pakistani state. The Jundala movement for the independence of Iranian Balochistan is active in the western parts of Pakistani Balochistan, on the Iranian border, in alliance with the Baloch tribal gangs who smuggle heroin from Afghanistan to Iran and the Gulf states through Pakistani territory. Pakistani and Iranian officials both firmly believe though with little real evidence, that the U.S. and British intelligence services are supporting Jandala so as to put pressure on Tehran over its nuclear program. In October 2009 Jandala killed several senior Iranian officers in a suicide bombing in Iranian Balochistan. The Iranian government accused U.S., British and Pakistani agents of being behind the attack. Pakistan hit back by arresting what it said were several Iranian intelligence agents operating in Balochistan. However, in a sign of the hellish complexity of this part of the world, Jundala and the Baloch smugglers are also responsible for smuggling weapons and recruits to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Thirteen suspected international Islamist volunteers, including three from Russia, apparently totters were intercepted by the Pakistani army during my stay in Balochistan. One was a doctor, seemingly on the way to boost the Taliban's primitive medical services. I do not know what happened to them. To the Kalat territories and those of the independent tribes, the British added Patan territories to the north. These were taken from the nominal sovereignty of Afghanistan and, like the tribes of Fata, the tribes of northern Balochistan were split in two by the Durand line drawn by the British to divide their sphere of influence from Afghanistan. They retain close tribal links to southern Afghanistan, and strong sympathies for the Afghan Taliban. Some of the leading Patan tribal families of northern Balochistan originated in what is now Afghanistan and fled to British territory to escape from the ruthless state-building of Amir Abdur Rahman towards the end of the 19th century. After 1977, Patan numbers in Balochistan were swelled greatly by a new wave of Patan Afghan refugees, this time from the wars which erupted after the communist takeover and the Soviet and Western occupations of Afghanistan. Balochistan's third major ethnicity, the Hazara, also fled from Afghanistan to escape from Abdur Rahman. They are Shia of Mongolian origin from the central highlands of Afghanistan, and between 200,000 and 300,000 of them now live in Quetta and a few other towns. The only moment when I thought that Quetta might be, if not Paris, then a transmogrified provincial town in southern France in a particularly hot summer was when I visited the Hazara Cemetery. Like the Mohajers of Sindh, their uprooting from their ancestral territory in Afghanistan has helped turn the Hazaras of Quetta into a remarkably well-educated and dynamic community, possibly also with the help of aid from Iran, though they deny this fervently. They have by far the best hospitals and schools outside the cantonment, 
and their cemetery breathes a sort of Victorian municipal pride in their community's heroes. They are especially proud of their prominence in the Pakistani military, and of the fact that a Hazara woman has become the first female fighter pilot in the Pakistani Air Force. Tragically, though, their cemetery also bears witness to the many Hazara killed in recent years in anti-Shia terrorist attacks, by the Sunni sectarian extremists described in previous chapters. Finally, there are the Punjabi and Mohajir settlers, as they are known by the Baloch, who moved to the region under British and Pakistani rule. Put all these other ethnicities together, and the ethnic Baloch, i.e. the Baloch and Brawi speakers, are at best a small majority in Balakistan. In Quetta itself, Baloch may be as little as a quarter of the population, with Patans the majority. But nobody really knows for sure. In 1901 British officials conducted a census which recorded down to the last child the population of all, but the most remote tribes in Balakistan. More than a century later, in 2009, the Commissioner Quetta Division could not tell me within half a million people the population even of Quetta itself. This, however, was not mostly his fault. Apart from the general weakness of the Pakistani bureaucracy when it comes to gathering information, the main parties among the Patans successfully urged their Patan followers to boycott the last census in 1998, in the hope that this would help the Patan Afghan refugees to merge with the local Patan population, become Pakistani citizens, and boost Patan political weight in Balakistan. This boycott meant that the official figure of 6.5 million people for that year, 4.9% of Pakistan's population, was almost certainly a serious underestimate. According to the 1998 census, ethnic Baloch formed 54.7% and Patans 29.6%, with the rest divided between Punjabis, Hazaras, and others. But the Patans claim to be 35 to 40 percent of the population, and they may well be right. Almost as many ethnic Baloch live outside Balakistan as within it, though the figures are very hard to determine because many no longer speak Baloch but, while retaining Baloch tribal customs, consider themselves Sindhi or Punjabi. Fear of ethnic swamping has been one factor in repeated Baloch revolts in both Iran and Pakistan, and the development of Gwadar has only increased these fears. In Pakistan, until the Islamist revolts after 2001, the Baloch were the most persistently troublesome of all the ethnic groups. There was armed resistance in 1948, 9, after Kalat's accession, under considerable duress, to Pakistan, unrest again in the late 1950s, after Balakistan was merged into the one unit of West Pakistan and the promises of full autonomy to Kalat state were broken, and a serious revolt between 1973 and 1977, after Zulfikar Ali Bhutto dismissed the moderate nationalist government of Balakistan as part of his moves to centralize power in his own hands and arrested its leading members. In all of these cases, however, most of the unrest was concentrated chiefly in one tribal group, and only parts of that group, in the late 1940s and 1950s, parts of the Mengal and other tribes of the old Kalat state and, in the 1970s, parts of the Mari tribe with certain allies. This allowed the Pakistani state to play on the deep traditional rivalries between the tribes and between sub-tribes of the same tribe, and eventually through a mixture of force and concessions to the sardars of the rebel tribes, to bring these revolts to an end. In all of these cases, it was also never entirely clear if the rebellions concerned were themselves really aiming at full independence at greater autonomy within Pakistan, or at benefits and redress of grievances for the particular tribes concerned. The Baloch Insurgency After 2000 Initially, 
This also seemed to be the case with the recent round of violent unrest which began after General Musharraf took power in 1999. Baloch fears were aroused by what may have been basically well-intentioned projects on the part of the Musharraf administration for the construction of the new deep water port at Gwadar in south-western Balakistan near the Iranian border, and for the construction of new military cantonments in the province. These were intended to increase ethnic Baloch recruitment into the armed forces and spread employment in their neighborhoods. Things were made worse by the high-handed way in which local land was bought for these projects and distributed to workers and officials from elsewhere in Pakistan. Lack of consultation and intelligence meant that the administration was unaware of the risk that many Baloch would see these projects as increasing Punjabi immigration into Balakistan and threatening them with new swamping. Islamabad seems to have been unsympathetic to Baloch demands that many of the jobs in these projects be reserved in advance for ethnic Baloch. The result was a growth in armed protest, which was initially limited to some of the Mari tribe, and was led by a younger member of its Sardari family, Balak Mari. He later based himself in Afghanistan, where he was killed in obscure circumstances, probably by Pakistani intelligence, possibly by a misdirected U.S. airstrike, or, a remoter possibility, by an accurately directed U.S. strike at Pakistan's request. The insurgency took on a more serious aspect when it spread to parts of the Bugdi tribe, led by their Sardar, Nawab Akbar Bugdi. Nawab Bugdi was not an inveterate enemy of Pakistan. On the contrary, he pursued throughout his life an opportunist course. After spending many years in jail under Ayub Khan, in 1973 he sided with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in dismissing the moderate nationalist government of Balakistan, thereby sparking the Baloch rebellion of that year, and was rewarded with the post of governor which he held for a year before falling out with Bhutto. In 1989, 90 he was chief minister. Bugti therefore demonstrates not implacable nationalist separatism, but rather the old tribal tradition of alternating between rebellion and participation in government, depending on circumstances. The old Italian principle that, he who draws sword against his king should throw away the scabbard, has never applied in Balakistan, at least as the tribe see things. Much of the Pakistani army, however, does not see rebellion simply as another form of legitimate political pressure, and this has led to what one might call fatal misunderstandings. They certainly proved fatal in the case of Nawab Bugdi. The details of Bugdi's rebellion after 2005 have been obscured by rival propaganda and myth-making, but the two main versions are as follows. According to Baloch nationalists, Bugdi launched increasingly strong protests against the Musharraf administration's policies, and in favor of a greatly increased share of revenues from Sway Gas for Balakistan. When these were rejected, he eventually took to the hills with his armed followers, where he was killed by the military in August 2006. Alternatively, according to officials of Sway Gas, officers of the Pakistan Army and rival Baloch politicians, Bugdi was interested only in increased money and favors for his immediate family, and opposed a new military cantonment in Sway because it would threaten his control of the Bugdi tribe. He ordered his men to start sabotaging the gas pipelines in order to blackmail the state, and when Musharraf failed to yield to this blackmail, Bugdi took to the hills, where he was killed by accident in the course of military operations, or even, depending on which military version you listen to, killed himself and the Pakistani military delegation sent to negotiate with him. The supposed reason for this was that he knew that he was, in any case, dying of disease. Senator Mushahid Hussein Syed, who led a parliamentary delegation which negotiated with Bugdi on behalf of the Musharraf administration, 
told me that the administration and high command were divided between those who wished to go on negotiating with Bugdi, and hardliners who had become exasperated with what they regarded as his blackmail, and who were determined to crush armed rebellion by force. In the senator's view, however, Bugdi was not out for personal gain, but to defend his honor and his leadership of his tribe which he regarded as threatened by the increasing military presence in his area, and to receive guaranteed jobs for Bugtis in the gas fields. Two incidents pushed matters from skirmishing between the Bugtis and the military into full-scale revolt. In January 2005 a woman doctor in the military base in Bugtis area was raped. The military immediately alleged that a Bugti tribesman was responsible. Bugdi took this as a personal insult and broke off talks with the government. As with Bugdi's death, the actual facts of the case have been completely obscured by misinformation on all sides. The second critical incident came in December 2005, when Musharraf visited Kolu in Balakistan, the first Pakistani leader to visit the region in many years, and rockets were fired at his helicopter. No one knows which Baloch group was responsible, but this attack in turn gave hardliners in the Pakistani military the chance to argue to Musharraf that no further concessions should be made to Bugdi. Fighting in the Bugdi areas escalated, and on August 26, 2006 Bugdi was killed, or died, along with three Pakistani officers when an explosion destroyed the cave where he had taken refuge. It is a mark of just how disastrous this was that every Pakistani officer, with whom I have spoken has sought to absolve the army of responsibility. However, since they have come up with several different and incompatible accounts of what actually happened, it is difficult to attach too much credence to what they say. What is certain is that senior Pakistani officials, including most probably Musharraf himself, had developed a deep personal contempt and loathing for Bugdi. This is in part a matter of class and culture, and of a very different set of attitudes to the authority of the state. Representing both the Pakistani state and what they see as modernity, Pakistani generals were infuriated by Bugdi's mixture of aristocratic contempt for them, democratic posing economic blackmail and authoritarian and retrograde rule over his own tribe. The result of Bugdi's death was a surge of support for his even more radical grandson, and, in the view of the Pakistani military, evil genius, Baram Dog Bugdi, who is now leading one wing of the Baloch insurgency from bases in Afghanistan. According to both Pakistani and Western intelligence sources, this is with the covert support of Indian intelligence. The resulting fighting in Balakistan has caused almost 1,000 deaths among militants, Pakistani soldiers and police, and local Punjabi and other settlers. Between 600 and 2,500 suspected militants were arrested and held without charge by the Pakistani intelligence services, the figures differ wildly depending on whom you listen to, and, while most were eventually released again, some have disappeared for good. Many of the militants supposedly killed in battles with the Frontier Corps have also undoubtedly been subjected to extrajudicial execution. When it comes to the Bugtis themselves, the Pakistani military has done a pretty effective job of divide and rule just as previously in the case of the Maris, who are also split into several sub-tribes most of which are siding with Pakistan against the insurgency. The Kalpur sub-tribe of the Bugtis is still in arms against Sardar Akbar Bugti's family for control of the benefits of sway gas, and in that family, apart from Baram Dog in Afghanistan, there are two other claimants to the leadership of the Bugtis. The eldest son of Akbar Bugdi's eldest son, Sardar Ali Bugdi, holds the family base in Dara Bugdi, though only under heavy military protection, and one of Bugdi's sons, Talal Bugdi, 
holds the family mansion in Quetta and the leadership of what is left of Bugdi's Jamhuri Watan party. Talal Bugdi spent most of his life in Karachi, and only returned to Balakistan after his father's death. When I attended a meeting of the party in Quetta, the not very resolute looking Sardar Talal Bugdi on the platform was rather cast into the shade by the fierce features and impressively bristling beard of his nephew Baram Dog, whose large picture was being held aloft by two fifteen year old children from, of all places, the elite St. Mary's School. And this illustrates the most worrying aspect of the insurgency as far as the Pakistani state is concerned that it seems to have spread from sections of the Mari and Bugdi tribes to parts of the new Baloch educated youth, who have emerged in recent years. As in so much of the developing world, there are not nearly enough state jobs to provide for these people, and their often worthless education certificates do not equip them for modern technical or managerial jobs in gas, mining or at water, which they believe that they should be given as representatives of the indigenous ethnicity. The more moderate elements try to use their sardars and the Pakistani political system to force the state to give them jobs, the more radical ones have turned to armed revolt. So far, this revolt has not been impressive in military terms, which also means that Indian help to the insurgents must so far be at a pretty low level. Attacks on the army, the frontier corps and even the wretched police, many of whom in Balakistan are still armed with Second World War era Lee Enfield bolt-action rifles, are still relatively infrequent. The great majority of the militants' targets are Isoft ones, the Punjabi and other settlers, who have moved to Balakistan over the past 150 years to work in a variety of technical occupations, for which the Baloch lack the education, like teachers, or which they consider beneath them, like barbers. What is happening is a sort of low-level ethnic cleansing, with more than 250 settlers, killed across Balakistan in the year before my visit in August 2009. The district of Kalat was typical. In the first seven months of 2009, the militants had killed three Kashmiri bakers, together with a Baloch customer three Punjabi tube well drillers, one Punjabi teacher and one Baloch policeman. The result naturally has been an exodus of non-Baloch teachers and technicians from villages and small towns in the ethnic Baloch areas, except where, as in the case of Sway Gas, the mining camps and the cantonments, settlements are under the direct protection of the army. The result has been to depress both Baloch educational levels and the Baloch economy still further, but, unlike the tailban in Fata, this less than heroic insurgency does not as yet pose a serious threat to the control of the Pakistani military. Baloch tribalism. Whether this remains the case will depend largely on how far Baloch tribal society is changing and generating the kind of frustrated new class which will identify with Baloch nationalism rather than their own tribe. From the point of view of government, Baloch tribalism, like Patan tribalism, was always an infernal nuisance, but it was also a containable nuisance susceptible to bribes. Among the Patan tribes, social change and disruption helped to bring about the tailban movement. It is not clear yet if social change among the Baloch is capable of creating a modern nationalist movement. In many respects, Baloch tribal culture is close to that of the Patans. Like the Pashtunwali, the traditional Baloch code requires tribesmen to avenge blood, to fight to the death for a person who has taken refuge with them, to be hospitable to refrain from killing a woman, a Hindu, a servant or a boy not yet in trousers, to cease fighting on the intervention of a woman, Sayyid or Mullah bearing the Quran on her or his head, not to kill a man who takes refuge in a shrine, to punish an adulterer with death. This last provision, 
extended to elicit sexual relations in general or the mere suspicion of them, has been responsible for the ghastly and continual stream of honor killings among the Baloch tribesmen, who have an obsession with the purity of their female kinsfolk which is extreme even by the pathological standards of their Patan neighbors. In one respect, however, Baloch tribalism is very different from that of the Patans, its leadership is hereditary, hierarchical and even monarchical, whereas the Patan tradition is meritocratic and even in a sense democratic. In the Baloch tradition, and that of the Patan tribes of northern Balakistan which are influenced by the Baloch, the position of Sardar, in principle at least, always passes from eldest son to eldest son. The ceremony of a turbaning, the new Sardar resembles a coronation. Beneath the Sardar, a hierarchy of subordinate chieftains called Waidros, the same word as for a feudal landowner in Sindh, illustrating the close links between the provinces and Mirs. Rule over subsections of the tribe. Sardars can be savagely tyrannical in a way that Patan chieftains are not yet in one way both are alike. Over them stands a greater tyrant, which is tribal custom. That said, the Baloch system in practice seems to have been more flexible than its formal appearance would suggest. Historical records suggest that, before the arrival of the British, tribes repeatedly either split into smaller tribes or grew by assimilating other tribes or bits of tribes. Leaders of sub-tribes revolted against their sardars and founded separate tribes of their own. This was partly the result of migration from place to place, which British rule prevented. The British Gazetteer of 1906 describes the situation among some of the tribes near the Afghan border. The local tribe is nominally subject to Sardar Rustam Khan of Jebri but he has no real influence over any Mamasani clan north of Karen. The Mamasani Tumander or headman who appears to exercise most power over these wild tribes is Shah Khan Gul, Sayahizai Mamasani, but even he has little influence except over his immediate followers. In fact, it has been suggested that the whole structure of single autocratic Sardars ruling over clearly marked tribes was in part at least a creation of the British, who found this convenient from the point of view of bribing and controlling the tribes. If this is so, then the process one can see today in Balakistan, and which is being encouraged by the army, of rival Sardars breaking up tribes into smaller feuding elements, is not really new, but a return to the pre-British norm. One central feature of Baloch tribalism, however, was certainly not created by the British, the blood feud. As the Gazetteer has it, a Baloch tribe is not a homogeneous group, but has attained its growth by the gradual assimilation of a number of alien elements, the process being admission to participation in common blood feuds, then admission to participation in the tribal land, and lastly admission to kinship with the tribe. In other words, Common blood feud is the underlying principle uniting a tribe, but the conception merges into that of common blood, i.e. connection by kinship. The tradition of the feud is alive and well in Balakistan today. The process of becoming Pakistani politicians and ministers does not seem to have reduced one bit the enthusiasm for this tradition among the Baloch Sardars whose penchant for murdering fellow politicians makes Baloch politics in some respects closer to those of the Sicilian Mafia, than the social democratic politics officially espoused by the political parties over which they rule. What is more, to tribal traditions of violence the Baloch Sardars seem to add a more aristocratic sense of touchy personal honor, which makes them even more trigger-happy, quite apart from their feudal, as opposed to tribal, sense of personal entitlement, including the right to kill anyone who offends them. Indeed, if I were to make a distinction within the terms of Baloch culture between a good Sardar and a bad one, 
it would be that a good Sardar doesn't kill anyone without what he thinks is a good reason. Thus the late Nawab Akbar Bugdi once declared, You must remember that I killed my first man when I was twelve. The man annoyed me. I've forgotten what it was about now, but I shot him dead. I've rather a hasty temper you know, but under tribal law of course it wasn't a capital offense and in any case as the eldest son of the chieftain I was perfectly entitled to do as I pleased in our own territory. We enjoy absolute sovereignty over our people and they accept this as part of their tradition. The Nawab in fact seems to have been exaggerating somewhat for the sake of the effect on his British interviewer. A Sardar who repeatedly shot his own followers without serious provocation would soon enough find himself without followers, or would be shot in the back himself. Nonetheless, as Paul Titus writes, the Bugtas remain entrenched in a world in which honor, expressed through the forceful and uncompromising response to challenges to oneself, remains a preeminent value. Specific acts of assertion and vengeance follow from and constitute Bugdi cultural logic and history. In recent decades, the Bugtis have been involved in several feuds, which have helped to define the politics of Balakistan as a whole. There is a long-standing feud between the Sardars and the Kalpur sub-tribe, whose lands cover much of the gas field. The Kalpers want to keep more of the benefits for themselves and out of the hands of the Bugtis. In the 1980s, Hamza Khan Kalper was killed during an election campaign, allegedly by the Bugtis. In the early 1990s, the Kalpers in revenge allegedly killed Akbar Bugti's youngest son Salah, which in 2003 led Akbar Bugti to kill the Kalper candidate in the elections of that year. One of the reasons for the chief minister, as of 2010, Nawab Muhammad Aslam Khan Raisani, to have stayed loyal to Pakistan and joined the government is that he also has a feud with the Bugtis, and accuses Akbar Bugti of having arranged the murder of his father by members of his party from the Rhine tribe. The Bugtis are also involved in a bloody feud with the family of the hereditary Sardar of the Mari tribe, Kerbaksh Mari a feud which has helped split the Baloch radical nationalists into different tribal camps, since Kher Baksh Mari is another radical nationalist who led the revolt against Pakistan in the 1970s. His family also has a feud with one of the Mari sub-tribes, the Bijranis, which has helped lead that tribe to join the present government and reject the insurgency. And so on, and on, and on. Chief Minister Nawab Muhammad Aslam Khan Raisani has a notoriously hot temper, and is accused of responsibility for at least half a dozen murders. The only living member of the provincial assembly not to hold a position in government cannot do so because he cannot set foot in Quetta, for Raisani has publicly sworn to kill him if he does. The aggressively bristling beards and upturned mustaches of the men of Sardari families would have a comically theatrical effect, were it not for the fact that they say something very real about the men who sport them. If you want to live in Balakistan, and indeed Pakistan as a whole, without going crazy, it is probably a good idea to try to cultivate an anthropologist's approach to the issue of Sardari feuding. As Sylvia Matheson did when researching her remarkable book The Tigers of Balakistan. After all, murder by mutual cultural consent is in a certain sense a kind of blood sport. Those Sardars who don't want to participate can always leave their traditional power and their traditional territories, and go to live in London or wherever, Karachi isn't far enough, as the minister for excise, Sardar Rustam Jamali discovered when he was gunned down there in August 2009. When it comes to Baloch tribal tradition, cultural broad-mindedness has however two limits, as far as I am concerned. The first is Baloch independence. It seems all too probable that Baloch tribalism would soon reduce this to a Somali-style nightmare, in which a range of tribal parties, 
all calling themselves a democratic and national, under rival warlords would fight for power and wealth. The task of the Pakistani Frontier Corps on the National Day, proclaimed by existing pro-independence parties was made easier by the fact that the nationalist parties could not even agree what flag to fly, let alone who should lead them. In these circumstances, independent Balakistan would revert to its pre-British condition of unrestrained tribal warfare, but this time the wars would be fought not with swords and single-shot muskets, but with AK-47s, machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, and whatever heavier weaponry could be acquired with the proceeds of the heroin trade. Claims on the territory of all Balakistan's neighbors would lead to economic blockade and make dependence on heroin and smuggling even more complete. Ethnic chauvinism would kill or chase out the ethnic minorities which provide whatever there is of a modern economy. Quetta would be wrecked in fighting with the Patans and Hazara. As in Somalia, Al-Qaeda and its allies would fish happily amid the ruins, a version of Somalia on the Persian Gulf. At the end of Sylvia Matheson's book, after recounting the killing of yet another lesser Bugdi chief by his enemies, she asks. And how and where can it end? Can these traditionally lawless tribes, so cussedly and illogically proud that they consider it more praiseworthy to steal cattle and grain than to demean themselves by working and earning money, can such men as these ever fit into the pattern of modern, democratic civilization as we know it, or must this dream be left for the coming generation? Her book was researched in the 1950s and published in 1967. Almost two generations have passed since then but there is still very little sign of this e-dream coming true among the Baloch tribes. The Treatment of Women The second area where anthropological tolerance should have its limits is in the treatment of women. This is not universally bad, and it may have been better in the past. According to Sylvia Matheson, In the early days of tribal society, women enjoyed a tremendous amount of liberty. The women folk of the leading cons of Kalat were noted for their activities in politics and warfare. Segregation of the sexes is in fact fairly recent, probably introduced since the gradual opening up of the country to strangers. I did indeed meet one formidable aristocratic lady politician from the Kalat royal family, Mrs. Rubina Irfan, a deputy from the formerly Promusharaf PML, Q, party. In a sign of the irrelevance of national party labels in Balakistan, her husband, Aga Irfan Karim, is a deputy from the PPP. Unusually, her development fund has been responsible for some successful projects in Kalat. Even more unusually, she is the leading force in promoting women's football in Pakistan. This has to be played by single-sex teams, indoors, and only in the presence of women and family members, still, a step forward. Mrs. Irfan also stressed that in really traditional Baloch tribal society women had more freedom than in partially modernized society, where male anxiety has been stirred up to pathological levels. Another very impressive lady, though a Mohajar, not an ethnic Baloch, Saria Aladin from the great Habibullah industrial family, described to me her charity's success in setting up two girls' schools in rural Balakistan, and how in one area this had led to the average age of girls at marriage going up from 12 to 15 in the course of 13 years. So give us another generation, and hopefully we will have helped bring the marriage age up to a civilized level. And as a result of this and education we will also help to bring down the birth rate, which is vital. All the same, much of the treatment of women in the Baloch tribal society of today is nothing short of appalling, even by Pakistani standards, and, what is more, some of the most atrocious actions against women in Sindh and southern Punjab are carried out by local tribes of Baloch origin. Quite apart from honor killings, as described in the first chapter of this book, 
the giving of minor girls in marriage as part of the settlement of feuds is still commonplace. I must confess that several times, during my visit to Balakistan I found myself muttering the famous words of General Sir Charles Napier, then Commander-in-Chief. In India, when informed that Sati, the burning of widows, was an ancient Rajput custom. You say that it is your custom to burn widows. Very well. We also have a custom, when men burn a woman alive, we tie a rope around their necks and we hang them. Build your funeral pyre, beside it, my carpenters will build a gallows. You may follow your custom. And then we will follow ours. Fortunately, or unfortunately, I do not have General Napier's power, or at least three Baloch politicians would find themselves dangling from lamp posts, if Quetta had lamp posts, which of course it doesn't outside the cantonment. No, make that four or five. These particular thoughts were inspired by a particularly ghastly case of honor killing, which occurred on July 13, 2008 in Babakot village, Nasirabad district, near the borders of Sindh. Three teenage student girls of the Umrani tribe were shot by order of a tribal jirga for trying to marry men of their own choice, rather than their families, and then buried while still alive. Two female relatives who tried to save them were killed as well. It is alleged that a chieftain of the tribe, Mir Abdul Sattar Amrani, chaired the jirga which ordered the killings. According to a police official with whom I spoke, his brother, Balakistan Minister of Communications Sadiq Amrani, put strong pressure on the police not to investigate. Amusingly, if your sense of humor runs that way, on August 13, 2009 a court in Sindh finally issued an arrest warrant for Sadiq Amrani and his brothers, not, however, for the case of the buried women, but for the alleged murder of five people of the Palal tribe of northern Sindh, including a woman and two children, in a dispute over land in 2008. Sardar Israrul Aziri, a PPP senator of Pakistan's upper house of parliament, defended the burial of the Amrani women, saying that, these are centuries-old traditions and I will continue to defend them. Only those who commit immoral acts should be afraid. The Zardari administration later made him minister of posts. The acting chairman of the Senate, another Baloch chieftain, Sardar Jan Muhammad Jamali, described the killings as having been blown out of proportion by the media. All of these politicians belong to the PPP, a party dedicated, according to its program, to women's rights, social progress and the rule of law. None has been expelled from the government or the party. Another Baloch minister, for sports and culture, from a Sardari family, Mir Shanawaz Khan Mari, told me. The burying of those girls alive was a conspiracy against Balakistan. There is no report on who killed them and why. The Supreme Court has not produced a report. It has not been proved yet that they were killed. These kinds of things are designed so as to create a scenario against Balakistan. The Afghans are here, they get millions of dollars to create subversion here, all different international agencies are working here. After this, the minister plunged into a rant lasting more than five minutes, during which a paranoid account of the conspiracies of the outside world against Balakistan somehow ended with the statement that, I don't believe in nationalism. The world has become a global village and we should all love each other. All of these politicians have claimed either that the girls were not killed at all, killed but not buried alive or that they had engaged in immoral acts and therefore deserved their punishment, or all of these together. None of this is true. I interviewed the police surgeon who dug up and examined the bodies of the three girls, Dr. Shamam Ghul. They had all been buried alive, and they were all virgins. Dr. Ghul, the only police surgeon for the whole of Balakistan, 
is the most remarkable person I met during my travels in Pakistan. Among other things she is very much more of a man than the vast majority of the men I encountered, if I may be forgiven a baloch sounding comment. This 58-year-old Patan grandmother, deaf as a post in one ear, our conversation was conducted in bellows on my side, spends her professional life traveling around Balakistan at night, because there are a great many people of course who do not exactly favor her investigations, digging up rotting corpses and examining them in makeshift morgues in temperatures which can reach 50 degrees Celsius. Sometimes the bodies fall to pieces and I have to put them back together again, she told me. Dr. Gould does her work without a police escort, for reasons that will come as no surprise to anyone who knows the police of Pakistan. And she goes on doing her duty despite the fact that of the 10 or 15 bodies of women murdered in honor killings which she examines each year, not one case has ever been successfully prosecuted, though a few people may have been embarrassed a bit and those she examines are in her estimate only around 5% of the total killed, because the vast majority are never reported. Dr. Gould retired in 2008 but then took up the job again in 2009 because no one else wanted it. For myself, if I had Napier's powers I would begin by making her the Inspector General, i.e. Provincial Chief, of Police in Balakistan, and then promote her upwards from there. She certainly deserves a senior job more than any other local politician or official whom I met. Visit to a Bugdi Nawabzada Jamil Bugdi, son of Nawab Akbar Bugdi by his second wife, took a rather more restrained, and coherent, line on the murder of the girls when I visited him on his estate outside Quetta. He also said that there was no proof that they had been buried alive but then immediately changed his line to say that, if indeed it had happened, it was contrary to Baloch tradition. If there is a case of adultery then in our tradition you have to kill the man as well as the woman involved, and if you do so without sufficient evidence then you have a blood feud on your hands. Salik Amrani is not even the real head of his tribe. He is neither partridge nor quail, that is why he didn't follow tribal tradition in this case. I remember a case that my father once deputed me to judge. A man had killed his wife and her lover and volunteered to walk through a fire to prove that they had been having an affair. The lover's family had denied it and demanded compensation, or they would have launched a blood feud. And the husband took his seven steps through the fire as if on rose petals. So the lover's family withdrew their demand and I closed the case. This was strange stuff to hear in an elegant modern living room lined with vaguely impressionist still-life paintings, and from a man with some at least of the manners and appearance of an English gentleman, but then, there was a good deal that was strange, and revealing, about our meeting. Nawabzada Bugdi's house is set in an artificial, tube well-fed oasis near the village of Mayangundi, a few miles outside Quetta. The area has been developed by various Baloch nobles as a commercial venture of orchards, with their mansions set in the middle of them. The contrast between his garden, with its green lawns and rose beds, and the arid, savage mountains behind added to the slightly surreal air of our conversation. The Nawabzada complained that the conservatism of Baloch farmers meant that they would not accept drip technology, even though almost the whole cost of installing it is covered by the Asian Development Bank, though I could not help noticing that his own garden was being watered by the old, horribly wasteful technique of flooding the whole lawn several inches deep. In one corner of the vast garden, a new swimming pool was under construction. Like his father and most of his family, Jamil Bugdi at 59 is a tall, handsome, aristocratic-looking man with aquiline features and a modified version of the bristling Baloch beard. He towered over his lawyer, a squat, 
rubber-faced and obsequious Punjabi who had driven out with us from Quetta as a partial safeguard against nationalist banditry. The sense of racial difference was even starker when it came to the Nawabzada's small, thin, dark-skinned servants. These are Mrattas, descendants of Marathas from central India, captured in war by the Mughal emperors and given to their Bugti troops as slaves in lieu of wages. Traditionally, their women have served as concubines to the Bugti. Their women were regarded as fair game for all Bugtis in Matheson's words, but there was no sign of Bugti blood in the faces of the Nawabzada's servants. The Mrattas were officially made equal citizens of Pakistan after 1947, and the Nawabzada insisted that they have merged completely with the Bugti and no one can tell the difference anymore given all the circumstances a real whopper. On the other hand, the British official and ethnographer R. Hughes Buller stated in 1901 that Many Baloch tribes consist chiefly of elements which have been affiliated to the Baloch and have afterwards set up for themselves. As time passes, their origin is forgotten and with it any social inferiority which may have originally existed. An instance of a group which has only lately asserted Baloch origin, is the Gaulis of Nasirabad. Though enumerated with the Baildis they are looked upon by other Baloch as occupying a low place in the social scale. Common report assigns them a slave origin, and as the word Gola means slave in Sindhi, it is quite possible that this belief has some foundation in fact. So just possibly something of the sort may indeed very gradually be happening in the case of the Mrattas, even if it obviously hasn't happened yet. Like most of the members of Sardari families whom I met, the Nawabzada talked a fiercely pro-independence and anti-Pakistani talk, accentuated by his deep booming voice and frequent use of English obscenities. His resentment of the Pakistani state seemed genuine enough when he spoke of his father's death at the hands of the Pakistan army, of how, at the age of nine, he had seen his father arrested for the first time, when he was released in 1969 I had already graduated, and of his fury at seeing pictures of Pakistani officers posing in his ancestral home at Dara Bugdi. He accused the Pakistani army of committing genocide, in Balakistan, and declared that I don't see how any honorable Baloch can celebrate Pakistani independence. For us it has been sixty years of slavery, barbarism, and torture. He expressed utter contempt for Pakistan-led development in Balakistan, declaring of Musharraf's new port at Gwadar. We don't want to develop Gwadar or other ports, we don't want another Dubai in Balakistan. What is Dubai? A bloody whorehouse like the Hiramandi, Diamond Market, or Red Light District, in Lahore. Why should we allow millions of outsiders to come here and take our land? At first hearing, then, this is an example of the Pakistani state's utter failure to retain or cultivate the loyalty of many of the Baloch tribal aristocracy. At the second hearing, however, certain questions began to arise. If he was so committed to independence, why had he not taken sides in the conflict over the leadership of the Bugdi tribe between his two nephews, Nawabzada Ali Bugdi, the officially turbaned head of the tribe sitting in Dara Bugdi under army protection, and Nawabzada Baramdag Bugdi, leading the pro-independence forces from exile in Afghanistan, whom he described as following my father's line and doing a pretty good job? And, above all, of course, why had he not been arrested by the Pakistani security forces, and why in fact was he still sitting in a paid position on the board of Pakistani Petroleum, to which he had been restored after a period of suspension? To these questions the Nawabzada's responses became rather less fluent. Concerning his non-arrest, he declared that, I suppose given all my medical problems, they do not want another dead Bugti on their hands, though I must say he looked in fine fettle to me. By the end of the interview, therefore, 
The Nawabzada seemed to me to represent not an unqualified failure on the part of the Pakistani state, but rather a sort of qualified success, a success, that is for the old twin imperial policies of divide and rule and co-optation of elites, something that every successful empire builder from Rome to Victorian Britain has understood perfectly. In the case of the British Empire on the Baloch frontier, this involved financial subsidies to the Sardars to keep their tribes quiet, subsidies which could then be withdrawn from those who stepped out of line. Military action was very much a last resort. Pakistan and Balakistan The Pakistani approach has generally been the same in essence but different in form. It is summed up in the remarkable fact that, as of 2009, out of 65 members of the Baloch Provincial Assembly, 62 were in the provincial government as ministers, ministers without portfolio or advisors with ministerial rank. Nor did the remaining three deputies constitute much of an opposition. Two had not occupied ministerial chairs by virtue of being dead, which is an obstacle to government service even in Balakistan. The third cannot visit Quetta because of the blood feud with the chief minister, mentioned above. This is the kind of thing which has led me to place the word democracy in this book in inverted commas, and perhaps I should do the same for development, because the point of this whole setup is that on top of their ministerial salary and staff, every member of the government gets a 50 million rupees, 385,000 pounds personal share of Balakistan's development budget, to spend on projects in his own district. Irrational? Not at all. From the point of view of serious development, yes of course completely crazy. As a new way of co-opting the tribal leadership, in an age when you can't just have political agents handing out bags of gold coins, eminently sensible, and effective. It is above all thanks to the Pakistani state's ability to hand out this kind of personal largesse, as well as some hard blows when necessary, that as of 2009 all but three of the 80-odd tribal sardars or claimants in Balakistan were ranged with the government, and had not joined the anti-Pakistan insurgency. For that matter, even members of Nawab Bugdi's own Jamhuri Watan party continued to sit in the provincial assembly. The priorities of Baloch ministers took on an almost comically obvious shape in the already mentioned interview I had with the Minister of Sports and Culture. Outside his office, his four staff sat around drinking tea, chatting, reading the papers and otherwise doing absolutely nothing, not that they could have done very much, since neither they nor the minister had a computer or even a typewriter. The minister complained bitterly that Balakistan has a quota of state jobs according to its small population, when instead, in his view, it should get the same proportion of jobs as it has of Pakistani territory, i.e. almost half of all jobs in the central bureaucracy, a thought which made me choke into my tea. For the population in general, he demanded that Islamabad create 60,000 junior administrative jobs in Balakistan, and distribute them to graduates. As of early 2010, this is being negotiated between the governments in Islamabad and Quetta, with 30,000 jobs a frequently mentioned compromise figure. Completely unprompted by me. The minister also complained three times in the course of the interview that ethnic Baloch should be given more Pakistani ambassadorships, which seemed to me a pretty clear indication of what was on his own mind as far as jobs were concerned. The idea that merit or qualifications should play any part in appointments to any of these jobs appeared nowhere in his remarks, nor does it, apparently, in the negotiations between Quetta and Islamabad. Rather than the old British strategy, this then is closer to the Roman approach of making smaller local tribal chieftains into local officials, and bigger ones into Roman senators. By making them responsible for tax collection, these local leaders were also given a 
share in state revenues. The Romans, though, had the advantage of representing not just overwhelming military force and an efficient state bureaucracy, but also a great state-building idea, summed up in the values of Romanitas. It would be quite a stretch to suggest that there exists a civilizing concept called Pakistanitas, if only because Pakistanis differ so radically over what it is or should be. However, sitting in Quetta and looking at the alternatives does bring home the fact that there is at least a certain kind of modernita a la Pakistanis. In Balakistan, this is to be found above all in three places, among the Hazara, in the gas fields and mines, and in the army. The last element in a way embraces the other two. The Hazara are both deeply attached to the armed forces and proud of their prominent role in them, and look to those armed forces for protection, and the gas fields and mines also depend wholly on the army for protection. Inevitably, therefore, and despite a determined effort on their part to pretend otherwise, the responsibilities of the Pakistani army in Balakistan go far beyond the purely military. This appeared strongly from my interview with the Pakistani general commanding in Balakistan, LT General Khalid Win. I am not qualified to judge his qualities as a general, but when it comes to relative modernity, I must confess that I was greatly prejudiced in his favor by his daughter, whom I have never met but who is studying for a Ph.D. in molecular biology in the U.S. The general admitted disarmingly that my wife and I wanted to arrange her marriage but she insisted on doing research instead, so we gave in, and sold some property to pay for her education. Then she won a top scholarship, which makes us very proud. My interview with General Wynne illustrated the way in which the Pakistani army is repeatedly drawn into managing wider areas of the state. This is not always because the generals want this, but because of an iron logic proceeding both from the fact that the armed forces constitute by far the most efficient and coherent institution of that state, and that in the NWFP and Balakistan economic development has a critical security dimension. It has to be protected from insurgency, and it can contribute to defeating insurgency. Thus our conversation began with the usual ritualistic declaration on the part of the general that the army has no interest in once again becoming involved in politics and government, and wishes to concentrate on its core tasks of defending the country against external aggression and defeating domestic insurgency. He said that while the army is ultimately responsible for internal security within Balakistan, it is not involved in operations against the present insurgency, which are the business of the frontier corps. The interview ended with the general describing how the army is closely involved in the management of the big coal mine being developed at Kamalang near Balakistan's border with Punjab and Sindh, which in 2007, nine produced around one million tons of coal. This is in a mixed Patan, Baloch area, where Mari tribesmen have traditional grazing rights, and a violent dispute broke out between them over access to benefits from the mine, which for many years held up its development. In 2006 the army was invited to settle this dispute, and to guarantee the resulting agreement. This involved recruiting and paying Mari tribesmen as local police, levies, and a development fund from the profits of the mine to be spent on schools, roads and health care to benefit both the Patans and the Maris. This is something that I am really proud of, that we are involved in nation-building, the general told me. All this also has a security dimension. In the general's view, the deal over Kamalang has contributed greatly to persuading Maris not to join the present insurgency. It will be very interesting to see if, as has been proposed, the army now starts taking a key part in running other mining projects in Balakistan and elsewhere, and distributing the benefits to the local population. 
The army will in any case have to be present at these sites in order to protect them from the insurgents. The question of just how much wealth lies underneath Balakistan is the subject of crazed nationalist myth-making, with stories abounding of Balakistan, having more oil than Kuwait, and so on. Having talked to geologists, the truth appears to me to be that Balakistan probably has very little oil, and few major new gas fields left to discover. What it does have, however, is very large amounts of copper, together with lesser amounts of gold. The Chinese corporation running the Sandak mine as of 2010 processes around 15,000 tons of ore a day. Informed, as opposed to mythical, estimates for the Rekodik field near the borders with Afghanistan and Iran range up to 16 million tons of pure copper, and 21 million ounces of gold which if developed would make Pakistan one of the world's largest producers of copper, though still far behind Chile, and a serious gold producer. A joint Canadian-Chilean consortium, Tethian Copper, plans to invest up to $3 billion in Reco Dick's development, leading to the inevitable paranoid headline on the PacAlert website, Reco Dick Mystery, Why Neocons and Zionists Are After Balakistan. Reco Dick could be of great benefit to Pakistan and Balakistan, or it could lead to explosive disputes between them, and among the Baloch themselves, as has been the case with both Sway Gas and Guadarport. The most obvious solution to distributing the benefits of mines like Reco Dick would be something like the Alaska Permanent Fund, which invests a proportion, in effect 11%, of the proceeds of Alaskan oil for the long-term benefit of the population of Alaska, above all in terms of investment in infrastructure, services, and water conservation. Especially water conservation. Although Balakistan's population is so small, it is still far too large for the province's water resources, unless the use of water is radically improved. At present, the Quetta Valley in particular is beginning to look like my grim prediction for Sindh and even Pakistan a few decades down the line, millions of people trying to survive in a desert. Over the past 50 years, water experts in Quetta told me, draining by tube wells has made the local water table sink from 40 feet to more than 800 feet below the ground. In a settler town, in the mid-1990s, the water table was at 200 feet. Now it is at 1,200 feet, and there is in any case less and less to bring up. Many of the local tube wells and manual wells are now dry, and much of the population has to buy its water from tankers. Settler Town contains approximately 200,000 people. It goes without saying that the state's water pipe system is now permanently dry. In the grim judgment of Andrew Arthur of the UNHCR, in another ten years or so, the water table in parts of the Quetta Valley will be below 2,000 feet and people will start to migrate out, as has already happened in Sibi, Chagi and Dalbandia, where the situation is even worse. The two natural springs which created an oasis in the Quetta Valley and were responsible for the creation of Quetta itself have both long since dried up. A new water pipeline is being built from the hills to supply drinking water to the city, but what will become of local agriculture if this goes on no one likes to think. Moreover, corruption and changes of government mean that this pipeline is already three years behind schedule. An urgent need is for more small earthen dams to trap rainwater since what little there is in Balakistan at present mostly goes to waste, and for the replacement of private tube wells with metered government windmill pumps that bring up a little at a time and cannot be used, for the dreadfully wasteful, flood irrigation. So there would be an immense amount of valuable work to be done by a long-term infrastructure fund, drawing on the profits of Balakistan's gas and mineral wealth. The problem is that, left to Baloch Sardari politicians to administer such a fund, 
there is no way that most would save anything for the future, or for the benefit of Balakistan as a whole. Everything would be spent on short-term gains for themselves and their followers. This would actually increase discontent both among educated Baloch and in the tribes in the immediate vicinity of the mines. If the army or some other Pakistani national institution were made responsible for distributing the benefits of extractive industries to the population, their task would therefore involve a huge and perhaps impossible degree of diplomacy. This is something at which the Pakistani army and state in Balakistan have a decidedly mixed record. In general they have not done too badly, aided by the fragmentary and feuding nature of Baloch tribal society. Sometimes, however, they have slipped up very badly indeed, as in the death of Sardar Akbar Bugdi. Like other senior officers, General Wynne now admits that the army seriously mishandled its treatment of Bugdi and Bugdi's death. Like them, he claims that the Pakistani army did not in fact kill Bugdi, which is highly doubtful, and, which has been confirmed to me by several different sources, that they were in fact negotiating with him to the very end. The general was open in his personal contempt for Bugdi, whom he described as interested only in his own family and followers and doing nothing to spread the benefits of sway gas among his tribesmen, let alone Balakistan as a whole. He said that when, as a young officer, he had asked Bugdi about his representatives stealing the workers' wages, Bugdi had just laughed at him dismissively. On the other hand, the general said, there is no good seeing things in Balakistan in terms of black and white. Everything here is shades of gray. Here you have to be street smart. Or to put it another way, you need to be a little bit of a rascal to understand this part of the world. You always have to be prepared to negotiate with your enemies, who knows, they may change sides and become your allies tomorrow. That is something the Americans still haven't understood in Afghanistan. That is why you can meet in Quetta many nationalist politicians who have declared themselves to be rebels against Pakistan, but who we deliberately haven't touched. When it comes to dealing with Akbar Bugdi, the overwhelming majority of Pakistani political, media and elite opinion, including liberal opinion, agrees with General Wynne that the state and army should have gone on negotiating with him even after he took up arms, and started killing Pakistani soldiers. Indeed, there have even been demands not just from Baloch nationalists but from liberal human rights lobbyists that Musharraf be tried, for his murder. Certainly everyone sensible agrees that it is necessary to negotiate with radical-sounding Baloch nationalists in an effort to wean them away from the real hardliners. Given that these Baloch rebels are not exactly progressive people, this makes an interesting contrast with the attitude of Pakistani liberals to the attempts of the state and army to negotiate with Islamist militants in the Pathan areas and elsewhere. These attempts have been denounced not just as foolish and hopeless but as evidence of sinister hidden sympathy and cooperation between the military and the Pakistani Taliban. The reality seems to me rather different, and will be explored in the following chapters. Certain sympathies and strategic calculations concerning the Taliban have existed, but the main underlying theme has been a different one characteristic of the Pakistani state. In many areas including Balakistan. This theme involves a chaotic but often in the end fairly effective mixture of continual negotiation and bargaining, with intermittent brutal force. As is obvious, this mixture failed in the end when dealing with the Pakistani Taliban, but as will be seen in the following chapters. The way in which it failed has also been crucial to Pakistan's success against the Taliban. 10. The Patans. The very name Pakhtun spells honor and glory. Lacking that honor what is the Afghan story? 
in the sword alone lies our deliverance. The sword wherein is our predominance, whereby in days long past we ruled in hind, but concord we know not, and we have sinned. Kushal Khan Kottak One way of looking at the Patans of Pakistan is as 18th century Scots. Without the alcohol.189 here we have a people with a proud history of independence, often bitterly resentful of their incorporation in a new state, and yet many of whom at the same time draw tremendous advantages from membership of that state, most of which is much richer than their own stony pastures. The already poor province has been impoverished still further in recent years, first by the war with the Pakistani Taliban then by the floods of 2010 which hit this region worst of all. A Pakistani Dr. Johnson could well say of his Patan compatriots that, the noblest prospect a Patan ever sees is the high road that leads him to Punjab. Not that many Patans would admit that, even the ones actually living in Punjab. Patan ethnic pride is notorious. Just as completely integrated Scots in the British establishment have often at heart remained proud and even resentful Scots, so I heard a senior Pakistani civil servant in Peshawar railing against the Punjabis whose industrialists, he said, were sucking the northwest frontier province dry and who had blocked his own advancement within the central civil service. And yet this man would as soon have wished for an independent Pakhtunkhwa linked to Afghanistan, as he would have wished for a union with Pluto. Nor indeed was his own family united on this, his daughter, employed in Islamabad, growled in response, and what have Pashtuns ever done for themselves? They just sit there asking Islamabad for subsidies. It should be noted that every single senior civil servant, serving or retired, whom I met in the province was himself an ethnic Patan, and an attempt has been made to ensure that the most senior military commanders in the province and Fata, are also usually ethnic Patans. This marks a major difference from Balakistan, and from this point of view at least the notion of the NWFP as a Punjabi colony is quite wrong. On the other hand, at a dinner party in Peshwar, I listened to two members of the Patan elites, a retired army colonel and a senior local journalist for a Pakistani TV channel, discussing the possibility of Pakistan breaking up into its ethnic regions. Neither of them wanted this outcome, and both would suffer from it very badly indeed, but they were prepared to discuss it with a cool detachment which you would never find among Punjabis of their rank and position. The complexity of Patan links to Pakistan is illustrated by an anecdote told me by a leading politician, for the nationalist Awami National Party, ANP, Bashir Bilaur. The Bilaurs are strong Patan nationalists, but have also sided at different times with all Pakistan's national parties, as part of factional fighting within the ANP. All the same, I was quite surprised to learn that his family has intermarried with that of the late Ghulam Ishak Khan, 1915-2006, veteran Pakistani bureaucrat, president from 1988 to 1993, and an ardent Pakistani patriot. Nonetheless, when in 1993 Ghulam Ishak appealed to Bilar to support him against Nawaz Sharif, he did so with the words, after all, we Pashtuns should stick together, not go with the Punjabis. Along similar lines, a retired Patan officer, Brigadier Saad, described to me how his uncle, an ANP veteran, over dinner one day had cursed the Afghans as savages. How can you say this, uncle? he asked. Haven't you been saying for years that they are our Pashtun brothers and we should unite with them? Oh, that wasn't serious. It's just a way of frightening those damned Punjabis so that they don't beat us up. In the Patan Highlands, an insurrection is raging against the national government, fed in part by Patan national sentiment. Yet as with the Scottish rebellions of 1715 and 1745, 
The motivation of this rebellion is not nationalism as such, but a mixture of ancient clan unrest against any government with religious differences, and the stated goal is not Patan independence, but a change of regime in Pakistan as a whole. Of course, the parallel is very far from exact. It does not include the crucial importance of developments in neighboring Afghanistan for the affairs of Pakistan's Patans. Equally importantly, the society of the Patan areas, and the tribal areas in particular, is rougher by far than that of 18th century Scotland, and this in turn produces a much rougher kind of religious radicalism. Alas, there is no great modern Enlightenment culture to produce a contemporary Patan Adam Smith or David Hume. A young, highly educated Patan woman of my acquaintance, from an elite background, described to me in 2008 how a girlfriend of hers from a similar background had recently called off her arranged marriage. At the last moment in order to marry instead a former suitor, there was a terrible scandal of course. But in the end the parents saw that there was nothing to be done, and agreed. I said that I found this an encouraging sign of progress, if only at the elite level. Yes, she replied, looking aside with an extremely bitter face, but if that had happened in my family there would have been half a dozen deaths by now between us and the other families involved, starting with the girl. The provincial office of the Pakistan People's Party at the time of writing Pakistan's ruling party, stands on University Road, Peshwar's High Street, lined with fairly modern-looking shops and offices. Just opposite, a side road leads to the Takal Quarter, and within a few feet turns into a rutted dusty track, unpaved and lined with filthy-looking shops, barrows with fly-blown fruit and vegetables, and concrete shacks roofed with corrugated iron. Every woman on this street when I visited it was wearing a black or blue burqa. You can tell the Afghan girls because they wear a more modern type of burqa than our local women, more fashionable and stylish. A Peshawari woman told me, something which one could find tragic, comic or even heroic, according to taste. Was this road ever paved? I asked. Once upon a time, was the answer. In other words, in trying to create a strict Sharia-based system in the Patan areas the Taliban are not trying to impose something completely new. They are trying to develop something partly new out of elements that are very old indeed. And the cruelty for which the Taliban are rightly reproached has to be seen in the context of what at the best of times can be a very hard society indeed, especially as far as women are concerned. Peshwar itself is a hard enough city, and looks it, a sprawl of dusty grey brick and concrete slums interspersed with the extravagant villas of the well-off, shrouded in dust and pollution, searingly hot in summer and grindingly cold in winter. When I think of the city, I often remember the sign for an angiography centre, heart clinic, at the entrance to the road where my usual guesthouse is situated in university town. In the West, such a sign would probably have featured a handsome elderly man, with some saccharine message about taking care of your heart for the sake of your grandchildren. The sign in Peshwar featured a huge color photograph of a human heart, streaked with blood and rimmed with glistening fat. One of the great charms of the Patans, acknowledged by all observers, is that they are nothing if not candid. After this, when I saw a sign for Brain School, Peshwar, I half expected it to be accompanied by a picture of a raw brain. Peshwar's only grace notes are the neat and elegant official military cantonment, the beautiful gardens of its schools and colleges, built by the British on Mughal patterns, and the occasional exquisitely shaped minaret, pointing towards a better world than that of Peshwar. Yet by the standards of the rest of the province, Peshwar is wealthy indeed, with banks, luxury stores, an international hotel, even a halal McDonald's. Now and then, if you look down a straight street, or over some low roofs, 
you see the outlines of an even poorer, harder world, which both hates and envies Peshwar, the tawny sentinels of the frontier mountains, graveyard of armies. The mountains and the plains. I thought of those mountains when I attended a service at St. John's Cathedral, the old British garrison church of Peshwar. My fellow congregants were not Patans, but descendants of low caste Hindus, converted under the British Raj. The memoirs of the Rev. T. L. Pennell attest to the extreme resistance of the Patans to any effort to convert them to Christianity. In fact, it says a great deal for the spirit of missionaries like Pennell that they made the attempt at all. So the noses of the congregation were much flatter than those of the rest of the city's population, the skins darker, and the bodies shorter. In fact, the whole service made a contrast to the dar face of Patan public life. After three weeks in the NWFP the sight of the unveiled women in their brightly colored shell were camises, and the occasional sari, though for the most part decorously seated apart from the men, was profoundly refreshing. Although traditionally an impoverished and despised community, and today an increasingly endangered one, the Christians in Pakistan have done comparatively well in recent years, thanks to strong community cooperation, help from international Christian groups and, perhaps most importantly, commitment to education. Many of the men had pens clipped to their front pockets as a sign that they were employed in some literate profession. The cheerful beat of the Anglican hymns, transformed almost out of recognition by India and accompanied by drums and cymbals, had a fine martial air, appropriate to a profoundly embattled and endangered community in an increasingly embattled city. A tiny girl with an enormous grin sat on the altar steps, clapping her hands in time to the music. Fans waved to and fro in a vain effort to reduce the sweltering heat, for it was August and we were in the middle of one of Peshwar's eternal power cuts, so the giant overhead fans were still. Outside, a dozen armed police stood guard against the terrorists who have attacked so many Christian churches, and Shia mosques in recent years. Reassuring, but, as we have seen again and again, alas, in the face of a really large-scale assault not enough to do much more than die bravely, which the poor devils have done often enough, usually unremarked by the Western media. It was strange to sit in such heat in a red-brick neo-Gothic church below a fine Victorian hammer-beam roof, listening to a fire and brimstone sermon in Urdu but much stranger to think of the faces that would have filled the church sixty years before, the white, or rather also brick-red, faces of the British garrison, administrators, and the tiny non-official British community. Outside the main entrance, one of the greatest of the British in India is commemorated by a tall cross and an inscription which still has the power to move, because it was erected not by a state or government but by a friend, and for no reason save friendship, to Field Marshal Auchinleck, in affection and admiration to the memory of this great gentleman, great soldier, and great man. From his devoted friend General Sher Ali Padoudi, 1984 foot. Auchinleck's comrades and predecessors, whose names adorn the walls of the cathedral, might well have been surprised by the congregation and the music, but I doubt that much else that is happening on the frontier today would have surprised them. The reason is summed up in their memorials, Major Henry MacDonald, Commandant of Fort McNee, cruelly murdered by Afri Dis, March 21, 1873, Lieutenant Colonel James Luffin Aubryan, commanding 31st Punjab Infantry, killed in action at the head of his regiment at Agron, Bajur. September 30, 1897, Leslie Duncan Best OBE MC IPS, political agent DIR, SWAT and Chitral, killed in action near Low Agra, April 11, 1935. Tablet after tablet of this kind stretch along the cathedral walls, 
commemorating a hundred years of British warfare with the Pathan tribes of the northwest frontier and Afghanistan. These ghosts testify that Pathans do not take kindly to an infidel military presence in their territories. Soviet monuments could have told the same story, if a Soviet Union had survived to commemorate its dead in Afghanistan. The surprising thing, therefore, about the present Taliban insurgency in the Pathan areas of Afghanistan and Pakistan is not that it is happening, but that it was not more widely predicted. Looking at the attractive, unveiled women in the church, my mind traveled back twenty years to another city under threat from tribal warriors fighting for Islam. Kabul in the summer of 1989, with the Mujahideen, then anti-communist, freedom fighters according to the Western media, but in their own presentation warriors for Islam. Beginning to tighten their grip after the Soviet military withdrawal. I visited the university there and, talking to the women students and professors, I remembered what a grizzled, middle-aged Mujahid from a ruined village in the hills had told me around a campfire in Nangrahar a few months earlier, when I asked him what he meant to do when the communists were defeated and the cities fell. I mean to capture an educated wife, he had said. I remembered the narrowed eyes and lean, hard faces of the Mujahideen as they stared into Ghazni from the hills around the town. I remembered them again three years later, when I was a journalist stationed in the Soviet Union during its fall, and read what had in fact happened to Afghanistan's cities and especially their women when the Mujahideen captured them. And when I returned to Afghanistan after September 11th and learned at first hand what the Mujahideen victory had meant for the people of Kabul. To be fair to the Taliban, it was precisely because they offered a version of peace and order after the horrors of Mujahideen anarchy, that their rule was welcomed by so many Afghan Pathans in the mid-1990s. Yet for the educated classes in the cities, and for many non pathans the cure was even worse than the disease. The Pathan tradition and Pathan nationalism the Taliban in both Afghanistan and Pakistan are as of 2010 first and foremost a Pathan phenomenon, with deep roots in Pathan history and culture. Whenever the tribes rose in the past, whether against the British or Afghan authorities, this was for their tribal freedoms but always in the name of Islam and usually under the inspiration of local religious figures. For most of Afghan history, the Afghan kings also called their people to war in the name of Islam, in between launching their own ferocious campaigns against dissident mullahs preaching rebellion against those same kings. The religious theme has therefore long flowed together with tribal yearning for freedom from authority, any authority, but above all of course alien and infidel domination. Or, as a Pathan saying has it, the Afghans of the frontier are never at peace except when they are at war. The Taliban therefore have a rich seam of instinctive public sympathy to mine in the Pathan areas. So far in both Afghanistan and Pakistan they have, however, drawn on Pathan ethnic sentiment without co-opting it completely and becoming a Pathan nationalist force. Indeed, they have not attempted to take this path. The reasons for this relate to Taliban ideology and ambitions, and also to the complicated geopolitical situation in which the Pathan ethnicity has found itself, over the past 150 years. For according to most standard models of modern nationalism the Pathans, like the Somalis, are a paradox or anomaly. They are an ethno-linguistic group with a very strong consciousness of common ethnic culture and identity, and with an ancient ethnic code of behavior, the Pashtunwali, to which most Pathans still subscribe, at least. Rhetorically. As in Somalia, all the elements would seem to be in place to create a modern ethno-linguistic nation-state. And yet the Pathans like the Somalis have never generated a modern state-building nationalism, 
and have indeed played a leading part in tearing to pieces whatever states have been created on their territory. There are thought to be somewhere between 35 and 40 million Patans in the world today, of whom considerably more than half live in Pakistan. This gives the Pakistani state a vital interest in what happens to the Patans of Afghanistan. As Pakistani officials and officers have argued to me, it also means that the Pakistani state simply cannot afford to take a line on Afghanistan, for example, actively helping the U.S. presence there, with which a majority of Patans strongly disagree. The vagueness of the figures on Patan numbers illustrates the fact that no reliable Afghan national census has ever taken place, precisely because the issue of ethnic percentages is so explosive. Thus most educated Afghan, and Pakistani, Patans with whom I have spoken have put the Patan proportion of the Afghan population at 60 to 70 percent. Non-Patan Afghans have put it at 30 to 40 percent. A Pakistani Patan army officer described this to me as statistical genocide on the part of the other Afghan nationalities, who say the same thing about Patan figures. Patans have always regarded Afghanistan as an essentially Patan state, and they have some reason. The dynasty which created the Afghan state was indisputably Patan, and Afghan is simply the Persian word for Patan. As to Juddin Khan, General Secretary of the ANP, put it, every Pakhtun is an Afghan, though not every Afghan is a Pakhtun. Throughout modern Afghan history, until the overthrow of the communists in 1992, the central state and army were almost always dominated by Patans, and the shock of the four years from 1992 to 6 when non-Patans dominated Kabul was indeed one factor in generating mass support for the tail ban among Patans. And yet the Patan claim to Afghanistan was always shot through with ambiguities, which have helped cripple Patan nationalism as a state-building force. The Patan ruling dynasty in fact spoke a dialect of Persian, Dari, as did the army and bureaucracy. Dari, not Pashto, or Pakto, was the lingua franca of Afghanistan both formally and informally. As far as the great majority of rural Patans, i.e. the great majority of Patans in general, were concerned. Loyalty to family, clan and tribe always took precedence over loyalty to the Afghan state. The tribes could be rallied for a time behind jihads against alien invaders of Afghanistan, or earlier, behind campaigns to conquer and plunder parts of India or Iran, but equally, Patan tribes repeatedly rose in revolt against Patan rulers of Afghanistan in the name of Islam and tribal freedom and those rulers in response carried out some of their most savage repressions in Patan areas. Above all, from the early 19th century on, the Afghan monarchy never came anywhere near making good its claim to rule over all or even most Patans. This was due first and foremost to the way in which first the Sikh rulers of Punjab in the first half of the 19th century, and then their British successors, had conquered extensive Patan territories, and especially the most fertile and heavily populated of them all, the Peshwar Valley. It is also because Afghanistan has always been much poorer either than British India or than Pakistan, and since the late 1970s has also been racked with incessant warfare. Or, as an ANP activist admitted to me after a few drinks, our old program of union with Afghanistan is dead and everyone knows it, because no one in their senses wants to become part of Afghanistan, today or for all the future that we can see. Pakistan is bad, but Afghanistan is a nightmare, and has been for a generation. Until the 19th century, the Patans had also never been united under one effective state, but had rather owed a vague and qualified allegiance to a variety of different dynasties, ruling from India, Kabul and sometimes Iran. Equally, however, they had never been divided between different effective states with real frontiers, 
let alone ruled by non-Muslim infidels. That began to change with the rise of Sikh power in Punjab in succession to the collapsing Mughal Empire, and the fall of Peshwar to the Sikhs in 1823. In the late 1830s the British appeared on the scene. In an effort to create an Afghan client state to resist Russian expansion in Central Asia, the government of British India sent a military expedition to overthrow the then Afghan ruler and replace him with a British puppet. This led to the memorable Afghan victory of 1842, when a British army attempting to retreat from Kabul to Jalalabad in midwinter was completely destroyed. The memory of Sir Alexander Burns a British official whose arrogance was held by both Afghans and British to have contributed to the disaster, and who paid for it with his life, is still commemorated in a Paton phrase used to someone who is getting above himself. Who do you think you are, Lottie, Lord, Barnes? After a second costly war in Afghanistan in 1878-80, the British gave up any ambition to establish a permanent military presence in Afghanistan. Instead, they chose to build up a former Afghan enemy from the Durrani clan, Abdurrahman Khan, as emir of Afghanistan and bulwark against Russia. A mixture of Abdurrahman's ruthless ability and British guns and money then consolidated a rudimentary modern Afghan state. Within the borders Afghanistan occupies today, borders imposed by and agreed between the British and Russian empires. Meanwhile, the British defeated the Sikhs and incorporated their territories into the Indian Empire, and then gradually pushed forward their military power into the Pathan. Territories lying between Afghanistan and British India. After a variety of experiments, some of them bloody failures, the British opted for a dual approach. The Peshwar Valley and certain other settled areas were incorporated into districts of British India. In 1901 the Pathan districts of Punjab were grouped in a chief commissioner's division, and in 1932 this was separated from the province of Punjab and turned into the new North West Frontier Province, NWFP. This province was placed under regular British Indian administration and law. Until 2010, when it was renamed Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, the province retained its British geographical name, much to the irritation of Pathan nationalists. Today, the NWFP covers 29,000 square miles and has a population of some 21 million some 13% of Pakistan's total population. Apart from the 3 million or so Hazara, who speak Hindko, a language more closely related to Punjabi, Hindi, and Urdu, the great majority are Pathan and Sunni. Peshwar city has ancient minorities of Shia and Hindko speakers, though these have been greatly reduced in terms of proportion over the past generation by the influx of Sunni refugees from Afghanistan. Ethnic divisions are in any case somewhat blurred compared to religious and tribal ones. Many Hindko speakers in Abbottabad are descendants of Patans who adopted the language after they migrated to the area, while in other parts tribes originally believed to be Hindko speaking adopted Pashto. Other Patans live in the territories which after Pakistani independence became the province of Balakistan, the northern parts of which are overwhelmingly Patan and which overall may be as much as 40% Patan in population. It is here that much of the leadership of the Afghan Taliban is thought to have based itself since 2001. Balakistan is Pakistan's poorest province, and the NWFP the second poorest with much lower rates of literacy and health care than in Punjab. As recorded in Chapter 8 on Sindh, a Pathan community thought to number between 1 and 3 million lives in Karachi, making that city the third largest Pathan city in the world. Smaller Pathan communities are scattered across Pakistan, with members often employed in some branch of the transport industry or as security guards. In addition, 
a number of important tribes of northwestern Punjab are Patans, though they now mostly speak Punjabi. The family of the famous cricketer-turned-politician Imran Khan comes from one of these tribes, the Niazis, settled around the Punjabi town of Mayanwali. He is an MP from Mayanwali, but his Patan origins and condemnation of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan gives him some popularity in the NWFP as well. As of 2010, however, this has not led to his party, the Tarakian Saf, Movement for Justice, being able to make any serious progress against the long-established parties of the province, because, as many ordinary people who admire him but will not vote for him have told me candidly, they do not think that he will ever have any favors to distribute. After partition in 1947 some Patans moved to Pakistan from territories in India, such as Rohilkhand, which their ancestors had conquered centuries before. These, however, though very proud of their Patan origins, speak Urdu at home and are mostly to be found in Punjab or Karachi. They include the famous Pakistani foreign minister under Zia and Benazir Bhutto, Sahabzada Yaqub Khan. In addition, there were the three Patan princely states of Chitral, Dir and Swat, whose princes owed allegiance to the British but otherwise ruled their territories independently, in accordance with a mixture of local custom and personal whim. These three states were incorporated into the NWFP in the late 1960s as provincially administered tribal areas. The judicial system in these territories has never been definitively settled, and the Pakistani system has never been fully accepted as legitimate by the population. This has helped provide fertile soil in recent decades for Islamist groups demanding the full implementation of the Sharia. In the case of Swat, the personality of the last ruler Myangal Jahanzeb was so impressive that the memory of his rule continues to undermine Pakistani rule to this day, and to boost support for the Taliban. The past remoteness of these areas is also worth remarking. The beautiful Swat Valley in the 1960s and 1970s was a famous hippie destination and since then developed as a holiday spot for the Pakistani elites, and yet the first European had set foot in Swat fewer than 80 years before. In 1858 and again in the 1890s, Swat and the adjoining areas were the sites of major tribal jihads against the approach of the British Raj to their borders. The federally administered tribal areas, Fata, Swat and Chitral apart, the focus of armed Islamist revolt in British days, as since 9-11, has always been in the tribal areas of the mountains along the border with Afghanistan. The tribes living between British India and Afghanistan were formally cut off from Afghanistan in the 1890s by the frontier drawn by Sir Mortimer Durand, and named after him. In the British conception, however, this was meant to be a good deal less than a regular international frontier with Afghanistan, and that is still how the tribes themselves see it. In the words of a British report on Waziristan of 1901, the Durand Line partitions the sphere of influence, my italics, of the two governments concerned, and is not intended to interfere in any way with the proprietary and grazing rights of the tribes on either side. The tribes of the frontier were considered by the British to be too heavily armed, too independent-minded, and too inaccessible in their steep and entangled mountains to be placed under regular administration. Instead, the British introduced a system of indirect rule, which was inherited by Pakistan and remains officially in force today in the seven federally administered tribal areas. Fata though in practice it has largely collapsed in the face of the Taliban insurgency. Limited administrative and judicial authority is still exercised by the local political agent and his subordinates. The PA is appointed by the government, and rules largely through local councils, jirgas, of tribal notables, maliks. 
This system was intended not to govern, but to manage the tribes, and contain both their internal feuds and any potential rebellion against the central government. The British usually responded to tribal rebellions and raids not with attempts at permanent conquest, but by a strategy cynically described by British officers as butcher and bolt, or burn and scuttle. Punitive expeditions would enter a given territory, burn down villages and the forts of Maliks and religious figures held to be responsible for the attacks, kill any tribesmen who resisted, distribute subsidies to allies, and then return again to their bases. Some British officials denounced this in favor of an intensified, forward policy, of extending direct British rule up to the Afghan border, but in general, the issue on which almost all administrators and soldiers agreed was that a permanent military presence inside tribal territory was not a feasible option. In 1947-8, the new state of Pakistan, believing that the Muslim tribes would not revolt against a Muslim state, withdrew regular troops from the tribal areas. Security there was left to the locally recruited Frontier Corps a system that remained generally in place until the launch of the campaign against the Afghan Taliban in Waziristan in 2004. The new Pakistani state felt that the tribes had demonstrated their loyalty by the enthusiasm with which many, and especially the Mossads of Waziristan, had joined in the Jihad in Kashmir in the autumn of 1947. The population of Fata is overwhelmingly Patan with a few Hindko speakers. Apart from the Turi tribe in the Kuram Agency, who are Shia, the whole population of Fata are Sunni Muslims. Fata covers 10,500 square miles, and has a population of some 3.5 million. Its development indices are far lower even than those of the NWFP with only 30% male literacy and 3% female. These miserable figures have been widely blamed on FATA's peculiar system of government, or non-government, which is doubtless true, but they can also be attributed to the inaccessible nature of the territory and the intense conservatism and xenophobia of its people. An ANP dissident, Juma Khan Sufi, summed up the problem for Fata and Patans more widely in words which are harsh but which are also a necessary antidote to the endless self-pity, self-praise and paranoid conspiracy theories that I heard during my time on the frontier. Puktuns are happy with their archaic tribal culture. A large part of our society is content living in its tribal particularism, which people cherish as freedom. The attitude of the ordinary Puktun does not at all tally with the modern world. Illiteracy and poverty are common. Most of us don't send our children to school. Female education is still disliked by a majority of Puktuns. The empowerment of women is anathema. They have no rights in their society. During elections, Village elders belonging to opposing parties try to reach a consensus on not allowing women folk to exercise their right to vote. We take pride in these things, which in reality should be a cause of shame. Hence the claim of most Puktuns, whatever good is found, is there because of U.S. and whatever bad is found in society is the creation of aliens. Or as Noman Wazer, CEO of Frontier Foundries, put it with deep bitterness, there is all this talk of helping bring Pashtuns into the 21st century, but this is nonsense. It's too much of a leap. What we need to do is bring them from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. Admittedly, he is a steel manufacturer. The political agent rules in Fata, or used to, through the Maliks a term usually translated as tribal chiefs but better understood as tribal notables. These are not chiefs in a traditional sense, but are chosen by the government, and are very numerous, some 35,000 in all throughout Fata. They include many local religious figures. 
The theory behind the system is that government would pick men of real moral and political authority in their tribe. But there are many stories of political agents appointing men who had bribed them, or even appointing their own servants. Political parties are banned from standing for election in FATA, and full adult suffrage in national elections was introduced only in the 1990s. Legally, the political agent governs on the basis of the Frontier Crimes Regulations, FCR, which are themselves drawn chiefly from the Pashtun Wali. These differ greatly from the British-derived State Code of Pakistan, especially in providing for collective punishment of clans and tribes for crimes committed by one of their members. This provision sounds and indeed is harsh, but is also a traditional and logical response to a situation in which ties of tribal solidarity mean that criminals can always be assured of refuge among fellow tribesmen. The demolition of the houses of enemies as a reprisal is an old Patan custom. It degrades the prestige of an enemy but because it does not involve killing it does not automatically lead to blood feuds. In the past, it was widely employed both by the British and by many of the leaders of Islamist revolts against the British. The FCR are often pointed to as a key obstacle to progress and development in the tribal areas, and doubtless this is true, but deciding what to replace them with is another matter. On one thing the great majority of inhabitants of Fata with whom I have spoken are united. They do not want to come under Pakistani state law in its existing form. Patan Political Culture The political culture of the Patan areas of Pakistan is related to that of other parts of the country but with particular local features which are in part bound up with the Pashtun Wali. The first, especially marked in Fata, is a much stronger tradition of revolt and war, not just against outside invasion, but against government in general. This is related to the greater role both of religion and of tribes and makes Patans, even to some degree in the settled areas very different from the much more docile populations of Punjab and Sindh. It was a Sindhi superintendent of police who told me that the police in the NWFP committed the fewest abuses against the population, and especially against women, of any of the Pakistani forces. Because up there, if you rape a woman she has relatives who will avenge her with a bullet through your head, not just brothers but even distant cousins. Whereas in Sindh and even more Punjab, people are far more beaten down, and much more accepting of whatever the police do, and kinship bonds are weaker. The key cultural importance of clan solidarity and collective revenge, Badal, in the Pashtun Wali is obviously of key importance here. The second, closely related feature is the greater egalitarianism and individualism of the Patans, once again, chiefly in the tribal areas, but to some extent throughout the province. As a friend in the Fata Secretariat told me, in Balakistan, people owe unconditional obedience to one hereditary Sardar. That has never been true among the Pashtuns. Here, there have always been lots of lesser chiefs within one tribe. Even in the settled areas and Swat, where the power of the Khans was traditionally much greater, people could and did often switch allegiance from one Khan to another. As for the tribal areas and especially Waziristan, there have been no long-standing political dynasties, and even the greatest Malik was always only a first among equals. The lesser importance of hereditary loyalty compared to Punjab and Sindh increases the importance of personal prestige, in Pashto, Nam, or literally a name, as in your reputation, or as we would say in English, having a name for something, which may initially be inherited, but which then has to be constantly renewed by the individual leader. This is where the tailband's targeting of Maliks in Fata and political leaders in the NWFP has been so frighteningly effective, as my Fata acquaintance put it. 
So many Maliks have been killed by the Taliban that they are scared, and with good reason. In public, they denounce military actions against the Taliban, while in private they beg us to continue them. The problem is that everyone knows they are scared, and if you are scared, you cannot be a Malik in anything but name. You know how this society values physical courage more than anything else. The same is true of the politicians in the NWFP, who have to keep running in national or local elections, and therefore to keep appearing at public rallies. If they have opposed the tail ban, then such appearances are standing invitations to suicide bombers, who have indeed claimed several political victims. The problem is that even if the politicians can afford bulletproof glass screens like the leading politicians in Pakistan and India, that makes them look scared. I was told that the Nam of Asfandiar Wali Khan, leader of the ANP, suffered a terrible blow when, after an assassination attempt against him in Charsada in October 2008 which killed one of his guards, he left town immediately in a helicopter and did not attend the guard's funeral. Finally, and related to the individualism of the Patans, is the even greater vociferousness of Patan politics, even within the same family. So universal is rivalry between cousins that it even has a formal name, Taberwali. In Swat, Frederick Barth studied how the rigid institutionalization of faction permeated local politics. In the past, and to some degree up to the present, this rivalry often spilled over into violence, which the Pashtun Wali acted to mediate and restrain, but never could and never was intended to prevent. The Pashtun Wali, in other words, is not a code of law but rather a set of guidelines for regulating what is known in anthropology as ordered anarchy. Feuds between families, or, rather, often rival bits of the same family, are not often as violent as in the past, but the possibility is always there. Above all, however, this tradition means that parties in the NWFP are even more likely to split and split again than is the case elsewhere in Pakistan. Several local leaders of the ANP and PPP whom I visited spent much of the interviews abusing not their party's opponents, but their own party colleagues. In Afghanistan in the 1990s, the Taliban succeeded in crushing local feuds with their own harsh and rigid version of the Sharia, though only after these feuds had assumed a really monstrous character in the wake of the collapse of the communist state and the triumph of the Mujahideen. If the Taliban in Pakistan can succeed in binding their tribal followers together through the discipline of their version of the Sharia, they will have gained a frightening advantage over their mainstream political opponents in the Pathan territories. The social and cultural difference between most of the tribal areas on the one hand, and the Peshwar Valley and Swat on the other, can be summed up in the nature of their hujras. This absolutely central Pakistani social, cultural and political institution is hard to translate, having elements of the feudal audience chamber, the men's club, the village hall, the debating society, the barracks for political workers, and the guest house. In a sexually segregated society where it is out of the question for any men but the closest relatives to attend mixed gatherings, within houses, the hudras are where the men of a given area meet to discuss everything under the sun. Occasionally they are collectively maintained, but usually they are owned by some local big man, and attendance at his hudra is to a greater or lesser extent a sign of allegiance or at least deference to him. In the tribal areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan that I have visited, hudras are generally part of the house itself, though firmly separate from it. As far as I can see from the very few family quarters I have been allowed to visit, the hudras generally do not differ in style from the family quarters, guests and host all sit on carpets on the ground, leaning on cushions arranged in a rectangle round the walls. Of course the quality of the carpets, 
the stove and the roof will differ according to the wealth and power of the host, and everyone there will know that wealth and power vary precisely. But cultural norms dictate an appearance both of equality and of common culture. It is quite otherwise with the hudras of the big political landlords and bosses in the Peshwar Valley and Swat. These tend to be clearly distanced from the main house, and clearly poorer, and they have broken chairs and sofas, not carpets and cushions. This marks the social, economic and to some extent cultural differentiation of the Patan elites in the settled areas and Swat, which the Taliban have used to increase their support among the poor. Anecdotal evidence suggests that big landlord politicians spend less and less time in their hudras, preferring to stay in the luxury of their family quarters. This somewhat resembles the process in England between the 16th and 18th centuries by which first the nobility, then the lesser gentry and finally the bigger farmers ceased to eat in halls or kitchens, together with their servants and followers, and ate instead in their own dining rooms. However, in those days the English gentry did not need to appeal to their followers for votes, and were not faced with a popular revolt against their rule. The Awami National Party ANP. Hereditary members of the landowning elites dominate the Awami National Party ANP, the moderate Patan Nationalist Party of the region, and class hostility to their dominance has fueled support for the tailban in SWAT and elsewhere and may in the long run help to destroy the ANP. The party has alternated in government and opposition since independence and in 2008 for the first time formed the NWFP government on its own, though with PPP support, after winning the provincial elections of that year. The ANP's political ancestors came together on the basis of resistance to British rule. It has been led from its beginnings by yet another South Asian political dynasty, the Wali Khans, a landowning family from the Peshwar Valley. Neither the ANP nor the Islamist JUI can be said to dominate NWFP politics, because no party has been able to do this. The main national parties, the PPP and Muslim League, also have a strong presence in the province, and with help and patronage from Islamabad have often been able to lead coalition governments. To judge by my interviews with ordinary people in the NWFP in 2008-9, it is possible that the Muslim League, with its greater Islamic identity and dislike of the U.S., may improve its vote in the Patan areas, despite its close identification with the province of Punjab. In part this is because it retains a distance from the Pakistani army, on which the ANP now depends for protection. All the parties have, however, been plagued by one of the perennial curses of Pakistani politics, an endless tendency to split when particular leaders do not receive enough patronage to reward their kinsmen and supporters, or when they clash with other leaders over issues of status and prestige. Thus the politician who was the mainstay of the Musharraf administration in the province, National Interior Minister Aftab Khan Sherpao was leader of what had been a famous local PPP political landowning dynasty in the province, and had been chief minister of a PPP-led government in the early 1990s. Sherpao split from the PPP and founded his own PPP, Sherpao, either because he was not rewarded sufficiently by the party during its periods of government in the 1990s, or because he had lost faith in Benazir Bhutto's leadership, or both. The ANP has also repeatedly split along lines of family allegiance and advantage. Compared to the PPP and Muslim League, however, the ANP's Patan nationalism, ostensibly left-wing, populist ideology and deep roots in local society should make the ANP a principal obstacle to the spread of the tail ban among Pakistani Patans. Indeed, its victory over the Islamist parties in the February 2008 elections was portrayed by most Western observers, in precisely this light. Perhaps, 
after Western forces leave Afghanistan, the ANP will indeed be able to play this role. So far they have been crippled in this regard by a range of factors. Firstly, the ANP has always been dominated by landowning Khans from the Peshwar Valley. Of course, this allows them to rely on support from the traditional followers of those Khans, but it also puts them at a disadvantage when faced with the egalitarian and even socially revolutionary message of the Taliban. Moreover, while the Taliban can at least appeal to Pathan nationalist feeling in the struggle against the hated American presence in Afghanistan, the ANP's Pathan nationalism has become an increasingly threadbare rhetorical fiction. Above all, the ANP were long hindered in confronting the Taliban by the views of the vast majority of their own supporters and activists, who, to judge by my interviews with many of them, regard the U.S. presence in Afghanistan as illegitimate and who see ANP support for a military crackdown on the Taliban as essentially launching a Pathan civil war on the orders of the United States. As Fakhreddin Khan, the son of the ANP general secretary, said to me, one main reason for sympathy for the Taliban is that every Pashtun has been taught from the cradle that to resist foreign domination is part of what it is to do Pashto, in other words, to follow the Pathan way. Part of the ANP's problem in fighting the Taliban is that to be seen to help even indirectly the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan goes against its own deepest instincts, both Pathan nationalist and anti-colonialist. The party's founder, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, 1890-1988, whose grandson leads the party today, was ostensibly a Gandhian pacifist, but his poetry is more reminiscent of the warlike Kottak. If I die, and lie not bathed in martyr's blood. None should this, Pashtun, tongue pollute, offering prayers for me. O oh mother, why should you mourn for me? If I am not torn to pieces by British guns? The history of the origins of the ANP under British rule illustrates both the power of Pathan nationalism, and its weakness in the face of appeals which mix nationalism with religion. Thus, remarkably, Abdul Ghaffar Khan was able to found a Pathan mass nationalist movement, the Kudai Kidmatgars, or Servants of God, popularly known as the Red Shirts, from their uniforms, dedicated to alliance with the overwhelmingly Hindu Indian National Congress and, in principle at least, committed to Gandhian principles of non-violence. No more unlikely product of Patan culture can easily be imagined. The explanation is, however, obvious. So deeply did most Patans loathe British rule that they were prepared to ally with the main Indian force struggling against that rule the Congress. They opposed Muhammad Ali Jinnah's Muslim League, which, though made up of fellow Muslims, was regarded quite rightly as much more interested in doing deals with the British in order to safeguard Muslim interests, than in seeking to expel the hated alien rulers. This sentiment allowed the Red Shirts and their political allies to dominate NWFP politics in the last 15 years of British rule, and Gaffer Khan's brother, Dr. Khan Sahib, became chief minister of the province. When in 1946-7 it became apparent that the British really were preparing to quit, the position of the Khan brothers and their followers quickly collapsed in the face of the religious-based propaganda of the Muslim League in favor of an independent Muslim state of Pakistan. The idea of living in a Hindu-dominated India proved absolutely unacceptable to most Patans, and the Congress leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, was almost lynched by a Patan mob on a visit to the province. Undermined by both the Muslim League and the departing British, a last-ditch attempt at an independent Pakhtunkhwa linked to Afghanistan also failed. Thereafter, the relations of Abdul Ghaffar Khan and his movement with the Pakistani state were naturally deeply troubled, since that state and army had good reason to doubt their loyalty. 
He and his leading followers spent many years in Pakistani jails, with their party banned, under both military and civilian governments, including that of the PPP in the 1970s. In part because of the rigging of elections against them, they never succeeded before 2008 in forming the provincial government of the NWFP, though they several times took a share in government. The links of the ANP and its predecessor parties to Afghanistan, though dictated by their Pawtan nationalism, have also over the years proved a disastrous liability. Afghanistan proved enough of a threat to Pakistan to terrify the Pakistani security establishment and deepen their opposition to enhanced Pawtan autonomy within Pakistan but not remotely enough of an attractive force to win over large numbers of Pakistani Pathans to union with Afghanistan, and from the late 1970s the ANP also became in part hostage to the dreadfully radical and violent swings of the Afghan domestic spectrum. First, in the 1950s, Gaffer Khan and his followers became associated with the campaign of the Afghan Prime Minister, and later President. Sardar Dud Khan to mobilize Pawtan nationalism so as to bring about the union of the NWFP and FATA with Afghanistan, a campaign which included providing funds and armed support for tribal rebels against Pakistan. Then, after 1979, Abdul Ghaffar Khan became closely tied to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and its Afghan communist allies. He lived in Afghanistan under Soviet occupation and is buried in the Afghan city of Jalalabad. Because of the ANP's anti-British legacy, and because the Pakistani state and military had generally been allied with the United States, ANP ideology took on an anti-American caste. Today, this mutual hostility between the ANP and Washington has of necessity greatly diminished. And the U.S. of course greatly welcomes ANP ties to the Afghan administration of Hamid Karzai. The problem is that, to judge by my own interviews with Pakistani Pathans, Karzai is despised by most of the ANP's own activists and voters as a U.S. colonial stooge, and the association with him does nothing for ANP prestige among Pakistani Pathans, and weakens the party vis a vis the Taliban. The ANP shares certain features with its main political rival within the province, the Islamist Jamiat e Ulamai Islam JUI. Both are ostensibly radical anti-establishment parties which nonetheless have involvements in electoral politics stretching back decades, and have often formed part of coalition governments. Both are deeply integrated into Pakistan's system of political patronage and corruption. Yet both only formed their own governments in the NWFP very recently. The JUI as part of the Mudahida Majlisi Amal, United Action Council, Islamist coalition which won the elections of 2002 in the frontier. The ANP as a result of the crushing defeat of the MMA in the elections of 2008. In both cases, the victories were hailed as crucial political turning points, for good or evil. In neither case does this appear to have been true. To judge by my own interviews with ordinary voters in the NWFP, the truth was closer to what Sikandar Khan Sherpao, a member of the Provincial Assembly and son of the aforementioned Aftab Sherpao, told me in August 2008. The people who say that the religious parties have been smashed for good and the moderate parties have triumphed are wrong. If you look at the issues on which the MMA got their votes in 2002 and the ANP this year, the most important ones are the same. This year, people voted for the ANP because they were against Musharraf, and too much of the MMA was seen as pro-Musharraf. And they voted for the ANP because, like the MMA before, they are hostile to the American presence in Afghanistan and promised peace with the militants and a bigger role for the Sharia. Apart from the issue of Afghanistan and the Taliban, 
The changes in government in 2002 and 2008 were also part of the rather melancholy cycle of Pakistani political life, in which incumbent governments are voted out because of their failure to fulfill their promises, to be replaced by their opponents, who then also fail. Both the ANP and JUI are deeply divided internally, partly along purely factional and family lines, but also over ideology and strategy. This constant, time and energy consuming infighting helps swallow up any potential for reform and good governance that may originally have existed. Businessmen with whom I talked in the NWFP said that there had been absolutely no difference between the last three governments. PML, Q, MMA, and ANP, in terms of corruption. The level of bribe taking had remained the same, in other words, extremely high. Indeed, a Western businessman in the security construction field said that even in the Middle East he had never seen anything quite like the level of corruption that he had experienced in Peshawar. Under both the MMA and ANP, everyone wants a bribe. And the worst of it is, the government is so chaotic and faction-ridden that even when you pay half a dozen people you can't be sure of getting a result, or that some new guy won't pop up asking for his share. The voters have little real expectation of radical improvement, but hope that things will get a bit better, and above all that their neighborhoods or families may draw some specific benefit. As far as the JUI is concerned, taking over the government proved as much of a curse as a blessing. As a result, many ordinary Patans have come to see the party and its allies as just as corrupt and incompetent as the Pakistani national parties, and no sort of radical alternative to them. A common answer on the streets of every NWFP town I visited, when I asked people how they had voted in the last elections, was either that they had not voted at all, because, the parties are all the same, none of them keep their promises, as Sayyid Munawar Shah, a shopkeeper in Peshawar, told me, or, if they had voted for a given party, it was because, my father and grandfather voted for them, or, we are followers of such and such Khan, and so we vote for him. Any kind of convinced support for any of the parties was extremely hard to find. This was true even outside the front door of the ANP's headquarters on Peshagi Road in Peshwar, where the shopkeepers told me that they had not voted in the last elections. Why should we? They are thieves, all of them. They promise and promise, and then do nothing, as one told me. The doing nothing was rather obvious. The street was deeply potholed, without street lamps, and littered with stinking rubbish. The idea that enlightened self-interest and party propaganda alone might have dictated an attempt to improve the neighborhood, did not seem to have occurred to any of the party activists lounging listlessly inside their cavernous headquarters, and the same was true of the other party headquarters I visited. With the exception of the Jamat Islami and the MQM, this is not how Pakistani parties think. Looking at the condition of Peshwar, I asked several ANP leaders if they had ever thought of trying to initiate some kind of urban renewal scheme like the Orangi pilot project in Karachi. No one even seemed to understand what I was talking about. However, in this they are only reflecting their own society, for, after all, the shopkeepers on Peshagi Road might have organized themselves to clean up the rubbish from their front doors, and it hadn't occurred to them either. As of 2009, the same fate that befell the MMA seems to threaten the ANP. The party stood for election in February 2008 on a platform of negotiating peace deals with the Islamist militants, gaining increased autonomy for the NWFP changing the name of the province to Pakhtunkhwa, in line with the other four provinces, which all have a name related to that of the chief local ethnicity, and restoring the judges sacked by Musharraf. All of these demands, including talks with the Taliban, 
were extremely popular with the ANP supporters and activists with whom I have spoken. However, the ANP set out no detailed or coherent economic policy or plan for social reform, though to be fair that is difficult for any provincial government when the powers of the provinces are so limited. As of 2010, its hopes of extracting more powers from the center had, as so often in the past, been frustrated by stonewalling in Islamabad. As a result, the party's program has in practice been limited to attempts at peace with the Taliban and to the demand that the NWFP be officially renamed Pakhtunkhwa. The PPP-led government in Islamabad agreed to this, in the form of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in April 2010 a decision which immediately sparked riotous protests by the Hindko-speaking Hazara minority in the NWFP, which left seven people dead in the town of Abbottabad. The protesters were demanding a new Hindko-speaking province of their own, another example of the way in which separatism in Pakistan is held in check by local ethnic opposition. In one respect, however, the position of the ANP altered radically in the course of 2008. 9. For the first time in its history, the party was forced by the Taliban revolt not just to make a covert deal with the Pakistani army, but to ally with them publicly and explicitly, and, since the ANP leadership is now completely dependent on the army for protection against assassination by the Taliban, this relationship is likely to remain. It represents a complete reversal of the party's previous Patan nationalist and anti-military positions, and a key political question among Pakistani Patans for the next generation will be whether ANP activists and voters stick with the party regardless, or whether they move away to found other parties, or even are drawn by Patan nationalism to join the Taliban, as the last Patan nationalist force left standing. Jamiat Ulama Islam, G. Council of Islamic Clerics. The contrast between public rhetoric and actual addiction to deal making is, if anything, even more true of the other mainstream Pakistani party based in the Patan areas, the Islamist JUI. In its origins, this party was not Patan, but rather a continuation of the tradition of Islamist groups from elsewhere finding fertile soil for growth on the frontier. The party grew out of the pro-Pakistan wing of the jamiat e ulamai hind the leading Islamist group in India under British rule. The JUH stemmed from the revivalist religious tradition established by the Deobund Madrasa, in what is now the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, and known as Deobundi. For several decades the different branches of the JUI have become more and more overwhelmingly Patan. Unlike the other leading Islamist political party in Pakistan, the Jamat Islami, which has a much more all-Pakistani character. The JUI also differs from the Jamat in being far less intellectual and in having a far looser organization and leadership structure. In fact, Rather than a modern Islamist party it resembles the ANP in being an alliance of local notables, though in the case of the JUI the notables are religious figures rather than local khans, and there is no hereditary dynasty to hold it together. Instead, there has been a succession of charismatic leaders, which has led to the party splitting into two wings, the JUI, F, led by Maulana Fazl Ur Rahman, and another branch led by Maulana Samuel Hack. As Joshua White writes, Key decisions by the JUIF are routinely made by Fazler Raymond and a traveling coterie of personal advisors, and the party has only recently invested in a well-equipped headquarters. The combination of charismatic leadership and decentralized party structure has led to nearly constant dissension within the JUIF most of which is dealt with informally in Pashtun-style shuras and quiet deals. The JUI's Islamism, like the ANP's nationalism, has, or had, a socialistic tinge, 
and the party remains strongly committed in principle to spreading development among the poor. In 1972, the JUI formed a brief government of the NWFP in coalition with the ANP, or NAP as it was then known, with a program of economic populism and of strengthening the rules of the Sharia. Alcohol and gambling were banned in the province, and the JUI attempted unsuccessfully to pass laws forcing women to wear veils in public. At the same time, the JUI often cooperated with the ostentatiously secular Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, leading to a subsequent history of intermittent alliances with the PPP, and charges of hypocrisy, opportunism and treachery from other Islamist parties, and now from the tail ban. The full Pashtunization of the JUI was above all the product of the 1980s and the jihad against the Soviet forces in Afghanistan and their Afghan communist allies. Support for the Islamist groups among the Afghan Mujahideen, both from the Pakistani state and from Saudi Arabia and private donors in the Gulf led to a huge influx of money to madrasas in the frontier where many of the Afghan Mujahideen were educated and shaped ideologically, and to an enormous growth in the number of those madrasas. Both the JUI and the Jamit became heavily involved in various forms of support for the Afghan Jihad, and profited greatly as a result. In one way the ANP and JUI resemble each other. They both began as irrevolutionary parties in a Pakistani context, the ANP for the abolition of Pakistan itself, or at least its transformation into a very loose democratic federation, the JUI for a revolutionary transformation of the Pakistani state and society along Islamist lines. Both, however, have in practice long since become mainstream political players forming coalitions for political and above all patronage advantage. Both in consequence are at risk of being outflanked ideologically and politically by the tail ban. Thus, despite its deep ideological opposition, in theory, to the U.S. presence in Afghanistan and to Pakistani help to the U.S., the JUI functioned as a de facto supporter of Musharraf's administration, and at the time of writing is a partner in government of President Zardari's PPP, a government whose program it says it detests for a whole set of reasons, including most of all its alliance with the U.S. In July 2009 I asked the JUI spokesman Jalil Jan why in view of his party's bitter opposition to Zardari's policies, they did not leave the government. He replied, our ministers stand in parliament and criticize the government of which they are part. Don't you think that is brave of U.S.? It is not kafir, disbelief, or disobedience to God, that people voted for us in order to get jobs for them. So it isn't bad that we are in power at the center and in Balakistan, and are able to give jobs to our people. Of course, like everyone else I always knew this about the JUI, but it is nice to have it confirmed from the horse's mouth. Money doesn't smell, a Peshawari journalist quoted cynically when I asked about this. The JUI's problem is that American money does increasingly smell in Patan nostrils, in fact it stinks to high heaven. The victory of the Mudahida Majlisi Amal, MMA Islamist coalition in the 2002 elections in the NWFP and the Patan areas of Balakistan, was due in part to favoritism by the Musharraf administration in order to defeat the PPP and PML, N, and in part to the fact that the PPP and ANP simply could not agree to cooperate either against Musharraf or against the Islamists. To judge by my own observations and public opinion polls, however, by far the most important factor in their victory was mass Patan anger at the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan and overthrow of the Taliban there. In the succeeding years, the MMA's de facto support for Musharraf, even as he forged a closer and closer alliance with the U.S. and abandoned the jihad in Kashmir, did not go unnoticed among Patan voters. 
Repeatedly on the streets of Peshawar people told me that they had voted MMA in 2002 but not 2008, because the JUI support Musharraf and Musharraf helps the Americans. In addition, leading the government from 2002 to 2008 meant that the JUI, like the ANP after 2008, was exposed to the standard accusations against all Pakistani governments of not having fulfilled their campaign promises of better government and more development, of engaging in corruption, and of not giving my brother-slash-cousin-slash-uncle-slash-nephew a job, contract, or whatever. The JUI, a bit like communists in the past, also suffered from their own inflated promises. They had promised to introduce true Sharia rule in the frontier, and thereby to transform society. Since by definition the Sharia, being the word of God, cannot suffer from inherent flaws as far as conservative Patans are concerned, the explanation of the MMA's failure in this regard could only be attributed by voters to the failings of the MMA, and its leaders. The MMA had its very origins in Pakistani Islamist outrage at the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, and took shape in 2001, too, as the Pakistan Afghan Defense Council. Its six parties included the two wings of the JUI, the JI, three smaller Sunni parties and one Shia party. The inclusion of the Shia and a party belonging to the Barelvi theological tradition, old rivals of the Deobundis, marked the broad church nature of the alliance and also drew a line between the J.I. and J.U.I. on the one side and extreme anti-Shia Sunni radical groups, like the Saipa e Sahaba on the other. The record of the MMA in government between 2002 and 2008 reflected a number of features which say a good deal about the mainstream Islamists in Pakistan, about the balance of power between the center and the provinces, and about Pakistani politics in general. The first was confusion. The government took a long time to put a legislative program together and, even when it did, no one was quite sure what was and was not a law. Secondly, the only really radical Islamist laws that the MMA government passed, for example, extending the writ of the Sharia in the state legal system were in any case blocked by the Supreme Court and the government in Islamabad, something that has happened to every provincial government that has attempted serious change. Lastly, there is the actual content of the MMA's legislation and governance, which in some respects was very different from the standard view of Islamist politics in the West, and showed an interesting mixture of what in the West would be called progressive and irreactionary elements. The more progressive sides of the MMA government mark the alliance off very clearly from the Taliban, in both its Afghan and Pakistani manifestations. Thus, while on the one hand the MMA tried to bring in a range of measures enforcing public standards of dress for women, and its activists launched vigilante attacks on video stores and other sources of immorality. On the other hand its government did more than most previous administrations to increase education for girls. This was due not to the JUI, but to the presence in the MMA coalition of the Jamaat Islami and a Shia political party. When I visited the MMA's Minister for Local Development, Asif Iqbal Dadzai, in May 2007, he was at pains to emphasize his government's progressive agenda. This included community participation in developing local infrastructure projects, 50 million rupees for improvements in sanitation in Peshawar, and a great increase in primary education, including for girls. While this was doubtless mostly for Western consumption, it did not seem wholly so. He and other government officials laid special stress on their moves to end the negative features of the Pashtunwali as far as women are concerned, and in particular what he described as the hateful practice of giving girls in compensation as part of the resolution of disputes. The problem was and is that, as with both previous and later governments, 
resources are so limited. This was rubbed home by the minister's own office, which I approached up a flight of broken stairs with hardly a lamp working, barking my shins in the process, to sit on a broken chair in a bleak office with cracked windows and peeling walls. This was in its way impressive, since it indicated that if there was corruption in this ministry the officials had not spent it on their own offices, but it also illustrated the deep poverty of the province and its government. However, the reputation of the MMA alliance both in the West and with officials in Pakistan was deeply tarnished by its murky relations, with the radicals who later went on to found the Pakistani Taliban and by its ambiguous attitude to jihad within Pakistan. In 2007 the alliance split over this issue, with the JUI condemning the radicals who took over the Red Mosque complex in Islamabad, while the Jamaat Islami supported them. See next chapter. However, the JUI retained close private links to some of the Taliban who supposedly helped Fazl U. R. Rayman in the February 2008 election campaign, even as other Taliban rejected the electoral process altogether. On the other hand, the JUI was tainted in the eyes of more radical Muslims, and indeed of much of the population in general, by its continued association with Musharraf, thereby ending up with the worst of all worlds. In August 2008, after they had been defeated in the elections, the information secretary of the JUI, Abdul Jalil Jan, came to drink tea with me in my guest house in University Town, Peshwar. Echoing the words of many people in the NWFP, including voters for the ANP and PPP, he asked me, Why have Baitullah Mossad and Fazlullah declared war on the Pakistani government and army? Wouldn't you do so if someone invaded your territory and killed your women and children? It doesn't matter if it is the US or Pakistan who have done the killing. They have been attacked. So we support talks aimed at peace. The previous peace negotiations were a success, but then they were violated, and by whom? By the government and army on the orders of America. If there is to be peace, then the government must stick to the terms of peace and not launch new attacks. As to Afghanistan, that is the Afghans' own business. But naturally people here have strong feelings about what is happening and what the U.S. is doing there. After all, like many people here, I am an Afghan Pashtun myself by origin, my ancestors came here long ago from Kunar. Within the NWFP, both the JUI and JI thus opposed any strong action against the radicals who gained an increasing grip on SWAT during the MMA period in government. Indeed, many of the SWAT radicals had previously been Jamit cadres and retained close links to the party. The MMA parties did not favor the more brutal and retrograde actions of these forces, including attacks on police vigilante executions and floggings, and the burning down of girls' schools, but seem to have found it impossible publicly to take action against groups claiming to act in the name of the Sharia and the Afghan Jihad. This inaction on the part of the MMA, and the failure of the JUI and MMA government to consolidate their support, helped open the way for the rise of the Taliban among the Patans of the frontier. Meanwhile, JUI links to hated governments in Islamabad were also losing at local support. In 2008 I heard this about the party in the context of its support for Musharraf. Even a few days before Musharraf's resignation, both the Fazl U.R. Rayman and Samuel Hack wings of the party were still very hesitant about supporting his impeachment, as Samuel Hack himself told me in August 2008 using as his excuse that if Musharraf should be impeached, then so should many of the other politicians. All have committed crimes. By 2009, ordinary people in Peshwar were cursing the party's membership of the government of the hated Zardari. It is highly questionable, therefore, 
whether the patronage extracted by the party really compensates any more for this growth in unpopularity. The JUI's alliance with Pakistani national parties and aspirations to share power in Islamabad, either for patronage or to change the Pakistani system, also mean that there are clear limits on how far it can exploit Pathan nationalism. As Abdul Jalil told me, we support greater autonomy for the NWFP and other provinces, but on one condition, that this demand must not be based on hatred and must not encourage conflicts with Punjabis, Baloch or other ethnic groups in Pakistan. If this plan is based on good relations and agreements with our ethnic neighbors, then we will support it. But ANP ideas create a real danger of ethnic conflict. That is especially true of all this talk of a greater Pashtunistan taking in huge bits of Balakistan and Punjab. Of course other nationalities will oppose this. For many years, the thoroughly pragmatic Islamism of the JUI and the equally pragmatic nationalism of the ANP have helped ensure that the great majority of Patans have lived peacefully and not too unhappily within Pakistan. However, with both these parties now seriously discredited by their association with President Zardari and his alliance with the USA, the future of electoral politics in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is now an open question.